Welcome to BISC CPA Review, comprehensive review materials for the CPA exam to let you customize your own review programs to meet your individual learning style and ensure your success. Worried about finding the time to study? Our customizable learning system allows you to study anytime, anywhere, 24-7 to fit your busy lifestyle and ensure your success on the exam. Looking for a particular way to prepare? From structured professor-led online reviews to independent self-study programs on CD-ROM, video, audio, and text, our interrelated products are designed to meet your individual learning style. Wondering how you are going to master the exam content? Our unique learning management system ensures that you will master the material. And features such as exam preparation tips, streaming video lectures, and a computerized personal trainer actually reduce your study time. Concerned about the computer-based exam format? The online, classic, and software versions of BISC CPA Review accurately mirror the real-life experience of a computer-based exam, including multiple choice, simulation, and written communication questions. It's all about passing. Each of our products has been specifically designed to ensure your success on the CPA exam. With BISC CPA Review, you will have the confidence and knowledge to pass it, guaranteed. This is Bankruptcy Law, and I'm Jack Norman. As you'll recall from some of your prior reading, all 50 states have bankruptcy laws of their own. There is also a federal bankruptcy statute. Now, since the CPA exam tests primarily federal bankruptcy law, that will be the focus of our discussion. The United States Bankruptcy Code has two primary purposes. One is the rehabilitation of the debtor, and the second is the equitable distribution of the debtor's property among the various classes of creditors. To that end, the Bankruptcy Code contains a number of chapters. We're going to focus primarily on three of them. The first is Chapter 7, entitled Liquidations. This chapter may be used by either individuals or by business entities. Second is Chapter 11, the Reorganization Provisions. And while it's primarily used for corporations, individuals in certain circumstances may also take advantage of Chapter 11. Chapter 13 applies only to individuals, as its name applies. The chapter is entitled Adjustments of Debts of an Individual with Regular Income. There are two more chapters which we will not be covering in today's discussion. Chapter 9 is the Adjustments of Debts of a Municipality. As many of you will recall, in 2013, Detroit, Michigan became the largest city ever to file for an adjustment under Chapter 9 of the Bankruptcy Code. And Chapter 12 deals with the adjustments of debts of family farmers and people engaged in the fishing industry. As I said, since these are rarely tested on the exam, we will omit a discussion of them during today's program. Now, what is the immediate effect of filing for bankruptcy? There are two. First, the filing of bankruptcy immediately stops any judicial proceedings. Foreclosure actions, seizure of assets of the debtor, all of these are prohibited immediately upon the filing of a petition in bankruptcy by a debtor. Secondly, the debtor must list his or her or the business's assets and debts, both before and after the filing dates, 
those two items happen immediately upon the filing of the bankruptcy petition. Now, when filing for bankruptcy, there are certain considerations that the debtor needs to make before filing that petition. Since property that is owned by the debtor go into the bankruptcy estate, there may be planning opportunities. You may wish to defer for a period of time assets that may be receivable down the road so that they will be excluded from the bankruptcy estate. We'll talk about some property that may be acquired immediately after filing bankruptcy that can be brought into the estate. But there's planning that can be done around the taking in of assets. In addition, there may be some reasons to consider the different debts that are due when they become obligations. And for many debtors, there are tax filing deadlines and it's very appropriate to consider whether tax returns should be filed or not filed prior to the filing of bankruptcy to make sure that certain obligations can be discharged in bankruptcy and which ones cannot be. The filing for bankruptcy can happen under two different approaches. There is the voluntary bankruptcy in which the debtor places himself or his organization straight into the hands of the bankruptcy court. It's taken at the volition of the bankrupt individual. Secondly, there is involuntary bankruptcy when the creditors force the business or the individual into bankruptcy court. So let's focus first on voluntary bankruptcy. An individual may file bankruptcy at any time so long as he or she has at least one debt the individual does not have to be insolvent. In other words, the liabilities do not have to exceed the assets for that individual to file a voluntary bankruptcy. A married couple may file bankruptcy together, but it can only be done if both parties consent. So there may be a joint bankruptcy filing. Although in many cases, as part of your planning process, you may wish to decide whether only one individual should go through the bankruptcy proceeding, leaving the other one outside of the bankruptcy ambit. Now, taking this individual, let's focus first on Chapter 7. There's a concept in the federal bankruptcy law called means testing. An individual's filing under Chapter 7 must fail a means test. In other words, this test that I'm going to describe to you, the individual who wishes to file under Chapter 7 must fail the test. The individuals must have net monthly income, and that's income minus allowable living expenses. Take that net monthly income, multiply it by 60, in other words, five years, and that number must be less than approximately $12,000. That is, in effect, the first means calculation, and that is the upper limit. If the taxpayer, if the debtor, excuse me, has income, net income, in excess of that $20,000, $12,000 number, they may not file under Chapter 7. However, they can file under Chapter 13. Now, if the debtor's adjusted income under that formula is less than $7,500, roughly, they may file under Chapter 7. So low enough, you may file under Chapter 7. If you're above the $12,000 limit, you may not file under Chapter 7. What happens in that intervening span? If the debtor's adjusted income is more than the $7,000 number, but less than the $12,000, he or she may use Chapter 7 only if the net income is less than 25% of the unsecured debt. Now, this sounds like a lot of complicated rules. Let's distill it. You may, you may file under Chapter 7. At least the answer is yes if your adjusted income is less than $7,000. You may not file under Chapter 7 if your adjusted income 
is over $12,000. That's the, the red light or the stoplight. The intervening arena, let's call it a yellow light on the traffic signal, is between 7000 and 12000 You may use Chapter 7 only if the net income is less than 25% of unsecured debt. Now, individuals filing for bankruptcy must have credit counseling within 180 days of filing the bankruptcy petition. You have to go and meet with a nonprofit credit counseling organization at the time you are filing your bankruptcy uh, petition. There are certain exceptions, for instance, military deployed abroad and so forth, but the general rule is credit counseling within 180 days of filing the bankruptcy petition. In the involuntary bankruptcy situation, as I mentioned before, the creditors place the individual into the bankruptcy court. Now, there's specific requirements for the number of creditors and the amount of debt that permit those creditors to push the debtor into the involuntary filing. If there are more than 12 creditors, then any three can move for the involuntary bankruptcy. If there are less than 12 creditors, any one can push the individual into involuntary bankruptcy filing. Should the individual object to being placed in bankruptcy involuntarily, that individual may file an objection with the bankruptcy court. The creditors must show simply that the debtor meets the equitable definition of insolvency. And that's not that debts exceed assets. Rather, it is the inability of the debtor to pay the debts as they become due. That's the definition of insolvency. It's not the bankruptcy definition. <coughs> Excuse me. A debtor who is placed in involuntary bankruptcy may attempt to recover his or her property. So if you're placed in involuntary bankruptcy, and let's say you want to retain your uh, truck that you're using for your business. You can post a bond with the bankruptcy court in an attempt to recover that specific property. The bankruptcy court may also require the creditors to post a bond. Now, if the court finds that the creditors acted in bad faith or wrongfully in placing the debtor in bankruptcy, it may award the debtor punitive damages against the creditors. This doesn't very happen very often, but it is certainly a remedy for the debtor who feels aggrieved about being placed into bankruptcy involuntarily. Let's turn our attention for a moment to reorganizations, which I described as Chapter 11. This may be either voluntary or involuntary. In this case, a trustee is not appointed by the court. The court does, however, have to appoint a committee of unsecured creditors. And in a Chapter 11 bankruptcy, all administrative costs must be paid before the bankrupt entity or individual can be discharged. Now let's talk about the debtor's estate for a moment. Most property is turned over to the trustee for the benefit of the creditors. Now, I mentioned at the beginning of our discussion that there are both federal and state bankruptcy laws. Certain property of the debtor is exempt under either the federal or the state law. And depending on how the state law is worded, a bankrupt individual may or may be able to claim these exemptions under either the federal or the state law. And we will talk about some of these exemptions a little bit later. In a bankruptcy filing, the debts of the individual are discharged. 
Now, the debtor gets to keep property. Uh, this is property that's acquired after the bankruptcy filing. The debtor is allowed to keep property that comes into his possession after the filing of the bankruptcy petition unless, and this is the big exception, unless the property is acquired by divorce, inheritance, or insurance within 180 days after the bankruptcy filing. So as you recall, when we began this discussion, I mentioned about planning around the filing deadlines. If you were to expect an inheritance on the closing of an estate or an insurance distribution that you'll receive 60 days after you plan to file bankruptcy, then you want to postpone your bankruptcy filing because those assets will be given or turned over to the trustee. If you make it past the 180 days, those assets will remain with the debtor. All debts incurred by the debtor after filing the petition in bankruptcy will continue to be owed by the debtor after bankruptcy is concluded. In other words, those debts are not discharged in bankruptcy. Let's turn to the question of leases for a moment. The trustee in bankruptcy has the ability, he has the authority to either accept or reject any leases that the debtor has signed. If the trustee takes no action within 60 days of the filing of bankruptcy, the leases are deemed to be rejected. We need to discuss briefly exemptions. For, as I mentioned earlier, when a, an individual, a debtor, files for bankruptcy, all of their assets are brought in to the bankrupt estate to be administered and usually sold off to the benefit of creditors. Well, while, you, while I said all property, there are certain exemptions. So the, tax, the debtor may be able to keep certain either amounts or types of goods up to particular dollar limits. What the debtor must consider is there are some exemptions under federal bankruptcy law and there are different exemptions under state, under the various state bankruptcy laws. Usually the debtor has the choice of using the federal or the state exemptions. And in many cases, the state exemptions may be more liberal than the federal. So as part of the planning for bankruptcy filing, the debtor and his counsel needs to look at what the exemptions would be available under federal or state law. I'm going to review some of the examples from the United States Bankruptcy Code. And many of these, as I said before, have dollar limitations. Those dollar amounts are set forth in the text. But let's talk about some of the broad categories. For example, a debtor will be able to keep some amount for a principal residence and the personal property associated with the principal residence. Under the federal law, the entire residence is not automatically exempt from the bankruptcy estate. There are some states, however, which give a homestead exemption for the full value of the residence. So here's one example where state law may be better than federal law. Usually a bankrupt will be able to keep a motor vehicle up to a certain dollar value. This probably does not mean that they can keep their Land Rover or Escalade, Cadillac Escalade SUV. The thresholds are much lower than that, but a motor vehicle is generally considered to be necessary to an individual today, and so there is an exemption for some amount of motor vehicle uh, in the law. There is a dollar amount of basic household goods these are things like furniture in the house, kitchen goods, those type of things which are necessary for the household. Again, there's a dollar limit. It's not terribly high. There is an exemption for business tools, books, publications, carpenter's tools, depending on the work that is being done by the bankrupt individual. Life insurance policies may be kept in some circumstances, and you have to look at the individual policies, the terms and conditions, and the dollar amounts of the life insurance policies. A bankrupt 
debtor may be able to keep Social Security, disability, and certain veterans' benefits. And the debtor is able to keep certain, and not all, but certain retirement accounts. These are pension, profit sharing, and IRA accounts up to specified dollar limits. And for some people, prepaid tuition or education and health care plans may garner an exemption, again, up to dollar limitations. So in planning for the bankruptcy, you need to review both federal law and state law, go through the list of assets that the debtor has, and make the decision as to what elections you will make to the items that will come under the exemption category. Which of the following statements is correct with respect to the reorganization provisions of Chapter 11 of the Federal Bankruptcy Code? A. A trustee must always be appointed. B. The debtor must be insolvent if the bankruptcy petition was filed voluntarily. C. A reorganization plan may be filed by a creditor any time after the petition date. D. The commencement of a bankruptcy case may be voluntary or involuntary? Let's look at each of the individual answers. Answer A is incorrect. A trustee is not required in a Chapter 11 proceeding. A trustee may be appointed, but it is not necessary. That answer is incorrect. Answer B is also wrong. The debtor does not have to be insolvent if the filing is voluntary. In this particular case, the debtor need only have one debt in order to make a voluntary filing. B is wrong. Answer C is incorrect. A reorganization plan may be filed by a creditor any time after the petition date? No. The debtor is the only one who can file a reorganization plan within the first 120 days after the petition filing. After that time period, then the creditors may suggest a reorganization plan. But the debtor has priority in the first 120 days. So C is incorrect, leaving us with the correct answer, item D. The commencement of a bankruptcy case may be either voluntary or involuntary. Our next question is actually two, and it's based upon the Strong Corporation. Strong Corp filed a voluntary petition in bankruptcy under Chapter 11 of the Code. A reorganization plan was filed and agreed to by all the necessary parties. The court confirmed the plan and a final decree was entered. So now the first question, which of the following parties ordinarily must confirm the plan? Half of the secured creditors, two-thirds of the shareholders are our two columns. And our answers can be A, yes for the creditors, yes for the shareholders. Answer B is yes for the creditors, no for the shareholders. Answer C, no for the creditors and yes for the shareholders. Or item D, a no for the creditors and a no for the shareholders. In this case, the correct answer is D. Neither the creditors nor the shareholders must confirm the plan. The plan is confirmed by the court. There has to be approval of two-thirds of the creditors and half of each class of shareholders, but there is no requirement of the creditors or the shareholders to confirm the plan. That is the responsibility of the court after, they have, after the creditors have given their approval. So here the answer is clearly D, no in both columns. Be very careful of the wording of these questions as you're taking the exam. Because you notice here, it's not approve. The word they used in the question was confirm. That's an important distinction. Our other question related to the Strong Corporation is as follows. Which of the following statements best describes the effect of the entry of the court's final decree? So remember, this is the bankruptcy court issuing the final order and decree terminating the bankruptcy proceedings. A. Strong Corporation will be discharged from all its debts and liabilities. B. 
B, strong corporation will be discharged only from the debts owed creditors who agreed to the reorganization plan. C, strong corporation will be discharged from all its debts and liabilities that arose before the date of confirmation of the plan. Or D, <clears throat> strong will be discharged from all its debts and liabilities that arose before the confirmation of the plan, except as otherwise provided in the plan, the order of confirmation, or the bankruptcy code. Now let me give you a little hint in reading these four answers. You probably ought to focus on D with all the extra words in there, including the accept clause. That happens to be the correct answer here, and let's see why the others are incorrect. Strong will be discharged from all its debts and liabilities. That's answer A. And the answer there is that's incorrect because strong will only be discharged from certain debts. There are some that are non-dischargeable in bankruptcy, as we'll see from listings uh, later in our discussion. Uh, and debts can be actually confirmed or reconfirmed by strong corporations saying they don't want them discharged. Uh, taxes will not be discharged in bankruptcy. So A is wrong. Strong corporation will be discharged only from the debts owed creditors who agreed to the reorganization plan. That is clearly wrong. One of the benefits of bankruptcy is to force creditors who do not agree to the plan to accept the discharge of their debts. It's sort of a cram down, uh, a forcing on those creditors. If the majority that we talked about approve the plan, the dissenting creditors are simply forced to accept it, and it's crammed down their throats. So B is incorrect. Answer C is also wrong. Strong corporation will be discharged from its debts and liabilities that arose before the date of confirmation. No, it will be discharged from certain of its debts that arose before the beginning of the filing for bankruptcy, not before the date of confirmation. So take a look at D. You see it says, from all of its debts that rose before the confirmation, except as otherwise provided by the order of confirmation or the code. So D is the correct answer here. Our next problem asks, which of the following statements is correct concerning the voluntary, voluntary filing of a petition in bankruptcy. If the debtor has 12 or more creditors, the unsecured claims must total at least $15,325. The debtor must be insolvent is answer B. Answer C, if the debtor has less than 12 creditors, the unsecured creditors must total at least, the unsecured claims must total at least $15,325. Or D, the petition may be filed jointly by spouses. This is again one of those wording questions, and the key here is in the question itself. This is a voluntary filing of a petition. So in this particular case, B is clearly wrong. Since it's voluntary, the debtor may be solvent as long as they have a debt. Answer D is correct. The petition may be filed jointly by the spouses. Now, that could be either voluntary or involuntary, but it is a correct statement. And in the case of A and C, here we're talking about an involuntary placing of a debtor into bankruptcy. So A and C are both incorrect also, since the question asked about a voluntary filing. Under the liquidation provisions of Chapter 7 of the Bankruptcy Code, certain property acquired by the debtor after the filing of the petition becomes part of the bankruptcy estate. An example of such property is A. Inheritances received by the debtor within 180 days after filing the petition. B. Child support payments received by the debtor within one year after filing the petition. Social Security payments received by the debtor within 180 days after the filing of the petition, or wages earned by the debtor within one year after filing the petition. Well, let's look at 
particularly items B, C, and D. Child support payments are not included in the bankruptcy estate. Notice this is after the filing of the petition. It doesn't make any difference. Child support payments are not going to be subject to inclusion in the estate. Social security payments received by the debtor, also not subject to the bankruptcy court. And wages earned by the debtor might have been if they were earned prior to the filing of the petition because it'd be cash in hand. But in this particular case, since they were earned after the filing of the petition, those remain the property of the debtor. It is only the inheritances received by the debtor within 180 days after filing of the petition. Answer A is the correct one. I might point out here that in addition, insurance proceeds received within that 180 days or uh, settlements with a spouse might be included in the bankrupt estate. Our next question asks, under the Federal Bankruptcy Code, which of the following rights or powers does a trustee in bankruptcy not have? And here I have to stress, remember to read the questions quite clearly because here they're asking about a power the trustee does not have. A, the power to prevail against a creditor with an unperfected security interest. B, the power to require persons holding the debtor's property at the time of the bankruptcy petition is filed to deliver the property to the trustee. C, the right to use any grounds available to the debtor to obtain the return of the debtor's property. Or D, the right to avoid any statutory liens against the debtor's property that were effective before the bankruptcy petition was filed. Well, let me preface my answer by saying generally, the trustee has a pretty wide-ranging scope of powers. And if, could, if a creditor or a debtor could test the trustee's power, the bankruptcy court will normally back up the trustee pretty fully in the range of, issue, the range of actions he or she as a trustee can take. That trustee does have the power to prevail under A, does have the power to require under B, does have the right to use under C. The only power that's enumerated here that the trustee does not have, so it's the correct answer, is the right to avoid a statutory lien against the debtor's property which were effective before the bankruptcy petition was filed. So a properly filed lien that is secured, the statutory lien, the trustee cannot void. Circle answer D when you get this question on the exam. Robin Corp. incurred substantial operating losses for the past three years. Unable to meet its current obligations, Robin filed a petition for reorganization under Chapter 11 of the Federal Bankruptcy Code. Which of the following statements is correct? A. The Creditors Committee must select a trustee to manage Robin's affairs. B. The reorganization plan may only be filed by Robin. C. A Creditors Committee if appointed, will consist of unsecured creditors. Or D, Robin may continue in business only with the approval of a trustee. Well, let's look at each one of these answers in turn. The creditors committee must select a trustee is incorrect. The trustee is appointed by the bankruptcy court. The trustee will ultimately pull together a creditors committee uh, if he so desires. So A is incorrect. B, the reorganization plan may only be filed by Robin. Also incorrect. Robin is the only one who can file a reorganization plan within the first 120 days after the bankruptcy is initiated. Thereafter, however, the creditors may propose a reorganization plan. So B is wrong. C, a creditors committee, if appointed, will consist of unsecured creditors. That's correct. That is the trustee's option, but if there is a creditor's committee, it will consist of unsecured creditors. C is the correct answer. And finally, answer D is wrong. Robin may continue in business only with the approval of the trustee. Not correct. Robin continues in business under Chapter 11. 
Now, ultimately, the trustee, in consultation with Robin, may say we can't put together a reorganization plan and we need to move this to a liquidation stage. That's happened with corporations in the past, but answer D is not the correct one. Our next question states, Flax, a sole proprietor, has been petitioned involuntarily into bankruptcy under Chapter 7, the liquidation provisions. Simon & Co., a CPA firm, has been appointed trustee of the bankruptcy estate. If Simon also wishes to act as the tax return preparer for the estate, which of the following statements is correct? A. Simon is prohibited from serving as both trustee and preparer under any circumstances because serving in that dual capacity would be a conflict of interest. B. Although Simon may serve as both trustee and preparer, it is entitled to receive a fee only for the services rendered as the tax preparer. C. Simon may employ itself to prepare the tax returns if authorized by the court and may receive a separate fee for services rendered in each capacity. D. Although Simon may serve as both trustee and preparer, its fee for services rendered in each capacity will be determined solely by the size of the estate. All right, let's consider these in an interesting order. Let's begin with A. Simon is not prohibited from serving as both trustee and preparer. Uh, it is certainly possible, but my personal opinion is from an ethical point of view, I would not recommend that this approach be taken. But answer A is wrong. They are not prohibited. Although answer B, although Simon may serve, it is the title to receive the fee only for the services preparer. That is incorrect. If Simon serves, it may be paid for its role as trustee and may be paid for its services as the tax preparer. So B is wrong. D, again, this acknowledges Simon may serve as both trustee and preparer, but to base its fee for services on the size of the estate is absolutely incorrect. It, that fee will be based on the determination by the court. Uh, the, the court will, the trustee, uh, Simon in this particular case, uh, the trustee will suggest what the fees are for the trustee and for the payment of the taxes, but that must be authorized and approved by the court. So the answer is C, although in my personal opinion, the CPA firm should probably not undertake this dual role. It's time to turn our attention to preferential transfers. A trustee may void preferential transfers and recover the property for the benefit of all the creditors. There are six elements that must be met for a transfer to meet what is defined as a preference. This is an area that is very frequently tested on the exam, and I'm going to give you a mnemonic to try and remember the six elements for preferential transfers. That mnemonic is BAN-TIM, B-A-N-T-I-M. And let's talk about each of those components. The B means it's a transfer of property benefiting a creditor. So a transfer of property with a benefit to a creditor. The A stands for antecedent debt. In other words, a debt that was existing before the filing of the bankruptcy. The N in BAN means that the transfer occurred within 90 days prior to the filing of the bankruptcy petition. Now here I have a little footnote for you. That the general rule is 90 days, but in the case of an insider, for example, a corporate official in a business entity type of transfer, that threshold, that window period increases from 90 days to one year. So BAN, transfers of property benefiting a creditor for antecedent debt 90 days prior to filing. The TIM portion of this mnemonic, T is the threshold. So the amount must meet a threshold of $6,225. The I stands for insolvency. 
and here the bankrupt must be insolvent. And here there is a presumption, although it is a rebuttable presumption, that having filed the bankruptcy proceeding, that debtor is insolvent. And M means more. That is, the creditor who has received this preferential transfer would then have recovered more than they would have received in a normal bankruptcy distribution. So if a trustee looking at transfers in this 90-day period, or perhaps even the one-year period for an insider, sees a transfer to a creditor for an antecedent debt, they'll examine all six factors to see whether it is indeed a preferential transfer. If so, the trustee has the power to void the transfer and bring those assets back into the estate for the benefit of the creditors. Ban Tim. Now, why do we have this preferential transfer rule in here? Because it's considered as a fraudulent conveyance. And the conveyance is an attempt to defraud some of the creditors uh, and may be perceived as a fraud on the court. Now, if it rises to the true level of a fraudulent conveyance, trying to hide the transfer, now we have a one-year window. And let me illustrate the difference between a preferential transfer and a fraudulent conveyance. Assume that I'm thinking about filing bankruptcy and I have a second home that I don't want to be taken by the bankruptcy court and sold for the benefit of my creditors. So six months, seven months before I'm planning on filing for bankruptcy, I transfer title to that property to my brother who lives in California, not on the East Coast where the residence is. That would be considered a fraudulent conveyance because I don't list it on my bankruptcy filing. I don't tell anybody about it. I'm trying to hide it from the creditors. That, within one year of the bankruptcy filing, would be considered a fraudulent conveyance. That's different from a preferential conveyance, which is the ban Tim criteria. Look for both of those potentials on the exam. Now, another area where I'm going to offer you a mnemonic deals with the priority of debts. This determines the order and the amounts to be received by the creditors on the distribution of a bankrupt party's assets. This mnemonic is not quite as easy as ban Tim. It is scam, wed, tug. Think about it as three different words, scam, wed, tug. Let's go through these in order. The first priority for the payment of the debts goes to secured creditors. That's your S, secured creditors, somebody who has a mortgage secured by, for instance, a building. The mortgage uh, is paid out of the proceeds of selling that building. That would be a secured creditor. Occasionally, creditors will take a security interest in inventory, for example. Again, they will have priority. So that stands as the number one priority for debts. Number two, child support and alimony claims. This is a decision that the Congress made that these are priorities. The C for child support becomes the C in scam. So child support, alimony claims, number two priority. Number three are the administrative claims. These are the fees of the trustees, the people the lawyers, the investigators, the accountants who may be working for the trustees. So that's the A, third priority, administrative claims. Number four is an area that's a little bit unusual. It's called middlemen or gap creditors. And this is intended to pay those people who are rendering services to the business after the filing of the bankruptcy to keep them ongoing. It could be, for instance, the utility company that's keeping the lights on uh, and the uh, inventory providers, the uh, 
uh, suppliers to a business while they're going through the bankruptcy reorganization. These people are called middlemen. They have a uh, preference in getting their advance of funds to keep the business going. Uh, they are the M in SCAM, standing for middlemen or gap creditors. So that's the SCAM, the first four priorities. Secured creditors, child support and alimony, administrative claims, and middlemen or gap creditors. The second word I gave you was WED, and they apply to wages to employees up to certain dollar limits. That's priority number five. Priority number six, the E in WED, is for employee benefits that are unpaid. Again, there's a dollar figure in your materials for the amount of employee benefits that could be paid. And item number seven are deposits on consumer goods made by customers of the bankrupt. That's the D in WED. One more time, there is dollar limitations set forth in the materials. So those three priorities, five, six, and seven, make up WED. Wages unpaid, employee benefits unpaid, and deposits on consumer goods. Priority number eight is taxes unpaid. This could be IRS, this could be state taxes. Uh, some taxes, at, if they're old enough, may be dischargeable, but in general, taxes are going to be a priority claim uh, in the bankruptcy proceeding. They're priority number eight and constitute the T of TUG. Number nine, these are claims under the influence liability. And what this means is if the debtor has debts that arise from injuries that he caused or she caused under the influence of drugs or alcohol, and they could be claims for medical uh, damages, pain and suffering, uh, whatever those damage claims are, they are a priority number nine in the payment of debts. They become the U for tug. And then finally, general unsecured creditors. These are the people that share in what remains on a pro rata basis. That G for general unsecured creditors becomes the 10th priority and the G of tug. The priority of debts, scam, wed, tug. Try and remember the mnemonics. You will have some questions on priorities of debt on the exam. The next six questions are based on the following scenario. Dart Inc., a closely held corporation, was petitioned involuntarily into bankruptcy under the liquidation provisions of Chapter 7 of the Federal Bankruptcy Code. Dart contested the petition. Dart has not been paying its business debts as they became due, has defaulted on its mortgage loan payments, and owes back taxes to the IRS. The total cash value of Dart's bankruptcy estate after the sale of all assets and payment of administration expenses is $100,000. Dart has the following creditors. Franken Bank is on $75,000 principal and accrued interest on a mortgage loan secured by Dart's real property. The property was valued at and sold in bankruptcy for $70,000. The IRS has a $12,000 recorded judgment for unpaid corporate income tax. JOG Office Supplies has an unsecured claim of $3,000 that was timely filed. Nanstar Electric Company has an unsecured claim of $1,200 that was not timely filed. And Decoy Publications has a claim of $19,000 of which $2,000 is secured by Dart's inventory that was valued and sold in bankruptcy for $2,000. That claim was timely filed. So which of the following creditors must join in the filing of the involuntary petition? Is that all three of them? Answer A, 1, 2, and 3, which is Jog, Danstar, and Decoy. Is it only two and three, which would be answer B. Answer C is one and two, and answer D is three only. The answer here is three only. Only decoy publications 
must file because there are less than 12 creditors, only one is required, and decoy meets the threshold filing requirement. Our next question is, which of the following statements would correctly describe the result of DART opposing the petition? DART will win because the petition should have been filed under Chapter 11. DART will win because there are not more than 12 creditors. DART will lose because it is not paying its debts as they become due, or DART will lose because of its debt to the IRS. The answer here is C. DART will lose because it's not paying its debts as they become due. The fact that it has debts to the IRS neither means it will win or lose. That's an irrelevant question. It's just one of the debts. DART will win because there are not more than 12 creditors. The number of creditors is irrelevant except in determining the amount required to force the involuntary filing. Here, there were less than 12 creditors, but one was sufficient to do so. And answer A is incorrect. It's not required to file under Chapter 11. Chapter 11 is the reorganization provisions, and creditors can force a company into the liquidation chapter, Chapter 7. Answer C is the correct answer. Turning to the next question, which of the following events will follow the filing of a Chapter 7 involuntary petition? Your first column, a trustee will be appointed. In the second column, a stay against creditor collection proceedings will go into effect. Is the answer A, yes and yes, B, yes and no, C, no and yes, or D, no and no? This is easy. The answer is A, yes, a trustee will be appointed in a Chapter 7 proceeding. That's required. A Chapter 11 does not require a trustee, but a Chapter 7 does. And a stay against creditor proceedings will go into effect. That's a yes answer. That happens whether you file it as Chapter 7 or 11 or 13. So the correct answer is A, yes and yes. Now, for the next three items, assume that the bankruptcy estate was distributed to the creditors. And the question is, what dollar amount would Danstar Electric receive? Zero, answer A. $800, answer B. C, $1,000, answer C. Or $1,200, answer D, which was the amount that they were owed. The answer is, because Nanstar filed an untimely claim, they will drop into a separate basket category of unsecured creditors. You will have the category of timely filed claims for unsecured creditors. They get paid as a class first, and then the basket of untimely filed claims as unsecured creditors. That's where Nanstar sits. So on this distribution, nothing would be available for a NANSTAR. The answer is A. Now, our next question, what total amount would Francon Bank receive on its secured and unsecured claims? Remember that they had a claim of $75,000, and that was secured by the property, which was sold during the bankruptcy proceedings and raised $70,000. Francon, as a secured creditor, would get the $70,000 to start with. Then the remaining $5,000 goes into the unsecured claim bucket. And since that bucket consists of several other creditors, they all have to be aggregated to see how they will share. Now, we know that the bankrupt estate had $100,000. $70,000 was paid out to Francon on its secured claim. Another $2,000 was paid out to decoy on its secured claim. So that payout leaves $28,000. Of the remaining creditors, the IRS with their tax claim stands next in line before the unsecured creditors. They have what's called a priority claim. They get their $12,000. That brings us down to a total of $16,000 left in the bankrupt estate. Let's 
that's available for distribution to the unsecured creditors who file timely claims. And we have three of them. We have $5,000 debt, we have a $3,000 debt, and we have the remaining uh, amount left from Franken. That's the five. Of that, that totals to $25,000 total claims for unsecured creditors who filed timely. We divide the $16,000 that's available by 25,000, that means it's 64% is the payout ratio. And for our friends at Franken Bank, they will get their share of $3,200, which will bring them up to a total of $70,000 from the security secured amount, $3,200, which is 64% of their $5,000, total of $73,000. $200. Answer C is the correct answer for the amount that Franken Bank would receive. Remember, they first got their secured piece, then they got their share of the unsecured claim. Our other question here is what dollar amount would the IRS re receive? I gave it away to you in my discussion of the last question. They will receive $12,000 since they stand as a priority creditor after the secured creditors but before their unsecured creditor pot is paid out. So they get the full $12,000. That is answer D. Answer A of zero, B of 8,000, and C of 10,000 are all incorrect. Now, let's talk very briefly about limitations on discharge. An order to discharge releases the debtor from all of its dischargeable debts. However, the debtor is not discharged if they're not an individual. A business is not discharged of their debts. The, the debtor has a previous discharge within six years or if they've got a discharge under Chapter 7, it was within the past eight years. If there are bankruptcy offenses, for instance, hidden assets, hindering, delaying the trustees, failing to meet with creditors, uh, hiding assets, all of these type things, bankruptcy offenses considered uh, items that will not allow the bankruptcy court to discharge the debts. And there are eight types of debt which are not dischargeable in bankruptcy. Number one, head of the list, alimony and child support. So even though they stand for a claim, high up on the claims for uh, being paid the assets as the bankrupt assets are distributed to creditors, if there are insufficient assets even to pay all the alimony and child support, those debts are not discharged through the bankruptcy proceeding. Any debts that have been incurred through fraudulent actions, non-dischargeable. Any debts that the debtor has not listed with the court, they're called unscheduled debts, and may not be discharged because the court has no knowledge of them. A debt will not be discharged if it is the result of willful and malicious injury to a creditor another individual who becomes a creditor of the debtor in effect. One that has been recently elevated in public discussions, education loans are non-dischargeable in bankruptcy. And as anyone watching this program is aware, many people have large education loans. They are non-dischargeable in bankruptcy. Taxes are also not dischargeable in bankruptcy. Those are the primary six, but there are two more that may not be discharged. One is there is a presumption that consumer debts to a single creditor of more than $650 for luxury goods or services incurred within 90 days before the order of relief are not dischargeable. And there is a presumption that cash advances aggregating $925 within 70 days before the order of relief are non-dischargeable. I have yet to see these last two presumptive non-dischargeable debts on an exam. 
They are there, however. I would focus on the alimony and child support, the unscheduled debts, education, loans, and taxes as the primary non-dischargeable debts that you'll see on the exam. Under the liquidation provisions of Chapter 7 of the Bankruptcy Code, a debtor will be denied a discharge in bankruptcy if the debtor A. fails to list a creditor, B. owes alimony and support payments, C. cannot pay administrative expenses, or D. refuses to satisfactorily explain a loss of assets. This is something now, remember the debtor is in bankruptcy and the court is going to deny discharge to that bankrupt debtor. The court will deny it only in the instance of D, if that debtor refuses to explain a loss in assets or hides assets that's considered a fraud on the court, and the court will not exonerate the debtor and give him the relief requested. The other three answers, if the debtor fails to list a creditor, that simply means that that debt is not discharged uh, when the bankruptcy is ended. If the debtor owes alimony and child support payments, those payments are not dischargeable in, in bankruptcy, so whether they're listed or not, they will not be dischargeable. If the debtor cannot pay the administrative expenses, well, he can still get discharged. It will be uh, something that will just have to fall by the wayside. Uh, you should note, however, administration expenses are a high priority in payment of whatever assets the debtor has. Normally, they will be uh, able to be covered, but if they're not, the debtor will still receive his discharge in bankruptcy. The next question asks, which of the following claims will not be discharged in bankruptcy? A, a claim that arises from alimony or maintenance. B, a claim that arises out of a debtor's breach of contract. C, a claim brought by a secured creditor that remains unsatisfied after the sale of the collateral. And a claim brought by a judgment creditor whose judgment resulted from the debtor's negligent operation of a motor vehicle. <coughs> Excuse me. Let's look at item B first because in just, just a moment ago, I told you that alimony and child support or maintenance are never discharged in bankruptcy. So A is the correct answer here. Let's look at the three that are incorrect. B, if the debtor breach, breaches contract, that claim is one that is reachable by the bankruptcy court and may be discharged. Uh, item C, and a secured creditor that remain, has a claim that after the collateral is sold and they get proceeds from the collateral, there's still a balance due on it. That simply becomes an unsecured claim, and if they're insufficient assets, it will be discharged in the bankruptcy. A claim brought by a judgment creditor, that, and that claim is a result of a negligent operation of a motor vehicle, it has a priority, but if it's unable to be satisfied, that too can be discharged by the bankruptcy court in wrapping up the bankruptcy. Next. By signing a reaffirmation agreement on April 15th, year one, a debtor agreed to pay certain debts that otherwise would be discharged in bankruptcy. On June 20th, year one, the debtor's attorney filed the reaffirmation agreement and an affidavit with the court indicating the debtor understood the consequences of the reaffirmation. The debtor obtained a discharge on August 25th, year one. The reaffirmation agreement would be enforceable only if it were made after the discharge, that's answer A, answer B, approved by the bankruptcy court, answer C, not for a household purpose debt, or answer D, not rescinded before the discharge. The answer here is D. If it is not rescinded before the discharge, the reaffirmation remains in effect and is valid whether it's made after the discharge, approved by the bankruptcy court, or not for a household purpose, 
answers A, B, and C are all incorrect, it is enforceable only if it is not rescinded before the discharge. The next question reads, which of the following acts by a debtor could result in a bankruptcy court refusing the debtor's discharge? One, failure to list one creditor, or two, failure to answer correctly material questions on the bankruptcy petition. Is it one only, two only, both one and two, or neither one and two? Failure to list one creditor simply means that that creditor's debts will not be discharged in bankruptcy. So item A, C, and D are all incorrect. The only correct answer here is item two. If the debtor fails to answer questions that are material questions on the bankruptcy petition, then that debtor has perpetrated a fraud on the court. Uh, the bankruptcy court will refuse to discharge the debtor. Answer two is the correct answer here. Next question, which of the following transfers by a debtor within 90 days of filing for a bankruptcy could be set aside as a preferential payment? A, making a gift to charity. B, paying a business utility bill. C, borrowing money from a bank secured by giving a mortgage on business property. Or D, prepaying an installment loan on inventory. All right, a gift to charity, not considered a preferential payment. Remember the uh, criteria for preferential payments? We talked about ban Tim. This is not a pre an antecedent debt. It's not for the benefit of a creditor. A is the incorrect answer. Paying a business utility bill. Again, it's a payment to a middleman for a utility bill. It's not an antecedent debt. It's for contemporaneous services. It's an exception to the preferential rules. B is incorrect. C, borrowing money from a bank secured by giving a mortgage on the property. Now here we have a simultaneous exchange for value. This is not a preferential transfer. C is incorrect. Well, you would think that D is the correct answer, and indeed you're right. Prepaying an installment note on inventory does give a preference to a creditor on an installment loan, and it pro even though it was an installment loan on inventory, it would be a preferential transfer. They would get more than they would get because of this payment uh, than they would be entitled to under the bankruptcy rules. It meets the six criteria of Ban Tim, and answer D is the correct answer. On June 5th, Gold rented an apartment, a, I'm sorry, not an apartment, equipment under a four-year lease. On March 8th of year nine, so we're not quite a year later, Gold was petitioned involuntarily into bankruptcy under the federal bankruptcy liquidation provisions. A trustee was appointed. The fair market value of the equipment exceeds the balance of the lease payments due. The trustee has four options here that you need to select from. May not reject the equipment lease because the fair market value of the equipment exceeds the balance of the lease payments due. Or B, may elect not to assume the equipment lease. C, must assume the equipment lease because its term exceeds one year. Or D, must assume and subsequently assign the equipment lease. Remember that the trustee has extraordinary powers, and with respect to leases, uh, whether it's on equipment or real estate, the trustee has the power to either accept or reject the equipment lease. If the trustee does not uh, make the election to assume the lease, it is deemed rejected. Uh, after a, a certain time period. In this particular case, the only correct answer is the B answer. 
the trustee may elect not to assume the equipment lease. Now, under the liquidation provisions of Chapter 7, certain property acquired by the debtor after the filing of the petition becomes part of the bankruptcy estate. So we're looking for items that are part of the bankruptcy estate. An example of such property is municipal bond interest received by the debtor within 180 days after filing the petition, alimony received by the debtor within one year after filing the petition, social security payments received by the debtor within 180 days after filing the petition, or gifts received by the debtor within one year after filing the petition. Well, the alimony and the Social Security payments are not going to be property of the trustee. They will not go into the bankruptcy estate. Gifts received by the debtor within one year are not included in the bankrupt estate. Now, remember that inheritances received within 180 days or six months would be included in the estate, but not gifts, only inheritances. So items B, C, and D are excluded. Item A, municipal bond interest, received by the debtor within 180 days, will be included in the bankrupt estate. Our next question asks, on April 1, Roe borrowed $100,000 from Jet to pay Roe's business expenses. On June 15, Roe gave Jet a signed security agreement and financing statement covering Roe's inventory. Jet immediately filed the financing statement. On July 1, Roe filed for bankruptcy. Under the Federal Bankruptcy Code, can Roe's trustee in bankruptcy set aside Jet's security interest in Rose inventory. Your four possible choices are A, yes, because the security agreement may only cover goods actually purchased with the borrowed funds. Answer B, yes, because Roe giving the security interest to Jet created avoidable preference. C, no, because the security interest was perfected before Roe filed for bankruptcy and D, no, because the loan proceeds were used for Roe's business. In some questions on the CPA exam, there may be two answers that are clearly wrong and two you have a little concern about. This is one of those questions. Let's take the two easy ones. First, you want to throw out answers A and D. Answer A is wrong because a security agreement may cover goods purchased with the borrowed funds or goods purchased with other funds. There is no tying together on the security agreement uh, specifically. So answer A is out. Answer D should also be rejected. Just because the loan proceeds were used in Rose Business doesn't have any effect on this. Of course, that's probably where they're going to be used. So answer D is wrong. But now you begin to puzzle between B and C. C says that the trustee cannot set aside the security interest because the security interest was perfected before Roe filed for bankruptcy. That might be true, but for the preferential rules. So C is wrong and B is correct because go back and think about our six criteria of the preferential rules. And here you had avoidable preference under the ban Tim rules. The preference was given during that very short window before filing bankruptcy, it is avoidable preference and the trustee may set aside the security agreement. You will circle B on the exam. Our next two items are based on the following scenario. On May 1, year 5, Two months after becoming insolvent, Quick Corporation, an appliance wholesaler, filed a voluntary petition for bankruptcy under Chapter 7. On October 15, Year 4, Quick's Board of Directors had authorized and paid early 
$50,000 to repay Early's April 1 year four loan to the corporation. So notice that the loan transaction occurs in year four. The bankruptcy filing is in year five. On March 15th, year five, Quick paid Cray $100,000 for inventory delivered that day. Which of the following is not relevant in determining whether the repayment of Early's loan is avoidable preferential transfer? Check the question out again. Which of the following is not relevant? A. Early is an insider. B. Quick's payment to Early was made on account of an antecedent debt. C. Quick solvency when the loan was made by Early. D. Quick's payment to Early was made within one year of the filing of the bankruptcy petition. In this particular case, we're again looking for voidable preferences under the Ban Tim rules, and Early was an insider. So what are relevant are A, Early is an insider. B, Quick's payment to Early was made on account of an antecedent debt. And D, Quick's payment to Early was made within one year of the filing of the bankruptcy. Again, remember the one-year rule because of the insider relationship of Early to Quick. Answer C is the correct answer. The only thing that is irrelevant or not relevant in this case is quick solvency when the loan was made. Quick solvency at the time the loan was repaid, maybe, but not when the loan was made by early. At that point, quick was still solvent. Circle C. Now, our next question says, quick's payment to Cray would A, not be voidable because it was a contemporaneous exchange, B, not be voidable unless Cray knew about Quick's insolvency, C, be voidable because it was made within 90 days of the bankruptcy filing, or D, be voidable because it enabled Cray to receive more than it otherwise would receive from the bankruptcy estate. This is another one of those questions that goes to the preferential transfers. And in this case, the answer is A. It is not voidable because it was a contemporaneous exchange. Let's do a brief bankruptcy recap. There's been a lot of material covered here. I want to highlight about nine or ten points where I think you ought to put your emphasis for the exam. First, chapter seven. Remember that it requires the debtor to fail a means test. And here you need to look at three points. If the debtor has and meets the income test of below $7,000, they may file under chapter seven. If the means test number is above 12,000, roughly, and check the numbers in the text, that means they will not be able to file under Chapter 7 and must file under Chapter 13. For the individual whose income falls in between the seven and $12,000 thresholds, there's a caution, and you need to check then for the 25% of debt test. If that is failed, then Chapter 7 is available. If it is met, then it is not, then they are outside of chapter seven. Under voluntary filings, all the debtor has to have is a single debt. They do not have to be insolvent. Under involuntary bankruptcy, however, that is where creditors place the debtor into bankruptcy. And depending upon the number of creditors, either three or one creditor is required and there is a dollar threshold that must be met prior to being able to place the debtor into the bankruptcy court. A trustee in bankruptcy has the authority to either accept or reject leases. If the trustee does not accept the lease within 60 days, then they are deemed rejected. Now, in studying up for the exam, I gave you two mnemonics 
for areas where there are frequently questions from the CPA uh, exam committee. This is in preferential transfers and in Chapter 7 priorities. Under preferential transfers, we had ban TIM. This means that the transfers can be set aside by the trustee. The B stands for a transfer of property benefiting a creditor. The A is for antecedent debt. The N, 90 days prior to filing a bankruptcy. And my little footnote here, it's one year in the case of an insider. In the TIM portion of the mnemonic, T stands for the threshold of $6,225. I is insolvency, and there is a presumption of insolvency. And M is that the creditor would receive more than they would have recovered in the bankruptcy distribution. Now, please remember that this is banned TIM preferences. There can also be fraudulent transfers, which are automatically set aside because they're deemed a fraud on the court. And if there is a contemporaneous transfer uh, for a payment, for instance, a supplier sending inventory to the corporation while it's in uh, bankruptcy reorganization and receiving payment of that, it is not a ban TIM preference. It is a contemporaneous exchange. Now, our, mnemon our mnemonic for the Chapter 7 priorities is called SCAM WED TUG. Debts are paid in the following priority order. First, to secure creditors then payments for child support and alimony claims. The A is for administrative claims, and the M is middlemen or gap creditors. These are people who provide goods or services during the bankruptcy period. That's the scam part. WED for wages unpaid, employee benefits unpaid, and deposits on consumer goods. Although their dollar limits I doubt that the exam is going to hold you to the dollar limits. They're updated periodically in the text materials. So wages, employee benefits, and deposits. The tug portion of this mnemonic is for taxes unpaid, liabilities that were arising by virtue of acts committed by the debtor under the influence of either alcohol or drugs. It's called the influence liability. And the final category in tug is the general unsecured creditors. So review those two sets of mnemonics as you're boning up for the exam. The last two items I would remind you, there is a list of non-dischargeable debts that you should be aware of, the primary ones being uh, taxes, education loans, and alimony that you'll probably see on the exam. And let me close by talking about something called the laughing air. H-E-I-R. This is the heir to an estate. Suppose a young man living his fancy free ways has incurred large debts and has a grandfather with a substantial estate who is in ill health. Now the heir files for bankruptcy trying to discharge all that credit card debt, of course knowing that his education debts can't be forgiven, but a lot of the credit card debt could conceivably be discharged in bankruptcy. Soon his grandfather dies, and the heir is going to come into a large fortune to continue his lavish lifestyle. But he has to be very careful about making sure that the executor of his grandfather's lavish estate does not make a distribution to him within 180 days of the bankruptcy filing. Why? Because otherwise, all of that funds, all of that potential lifestyle will become part of the bankrupt estate and used to pay off the credit card creditors. Instead, laughing all the way to the bank, the grandson convinces the executor to hold off about a year until after his grandfather's passing, the estate tax return is filed, and the bankruptcy has been concluded. He laughs all the way to the bank, and I hope I hear you laughing that you have successfully passed the CPA exam. I'm Jack Norman, and this is a discussion of suretyship law. Now, a suretyship contract 
is an agreement whereby a person secures the debt of another by assuring performance upon the debtor's default. There are three parties to the surety agreement, the debtor, the creditor, and the sureties. Now, since a surety ship is a promise to pay the debts of another party, it must be in writing, and this is a requirement of the statute of frauds. If the surety ship is contemporaneous with the original debt, then no additional consideration is required to bring the contract into force. However, if the surety is subsequently entered into, in other words, after the original contract, then additional consideration is required for the surety ship to be valid. Let's talk briefly about the definition of a guarantee. A guarantee contract is generally created separately from the primary contract. It's considered an agreement separate and distinct from the main or underlying agreement. The guarantor's liability is secondary or conditional, and it arises only upon the default of the debtor. Well, suppose the debtor does default. What happens? The creditor, who is expected, expecting to be paid, can go after any collateral that might be available under the contract. The creditor can also sue the debtor. The third option, the creditor can demand payment from the surety, who has an obligation to pay the outstanding debt. These acts can be done in any order, so the creditor can go after the collateral, demand from the surety, then sue the debtor, or take any combination of actions that they want. There is one caveat, however. If the surety is a guarantor, the creditor must exhaust all his or her possible remedies against the debtor before pursuing the guarantor. Now, once demand has been made on the surety for payment because the debtor has defaulted, there are certain defenses that the surety may raise so that they will not be liable for payment. The first and foremost one was the contract was not in writing. This would be a violation of the statute of frauds and would be an absolute defense for the surety. There could be a defense of no consideration. As I mentioned a moment ago, if it, the surety ship arises with the original contract, consideration is not required. But if it's executed subsequently, there must be consideration. And if there's a failure of consideration, that again is a defense of the surety. Another surety defense would be fraud perpetrated by the creditor on the surety. Another defense would be if there has been tender of performance by the debtor. In other words, the creditor cannot go after the surety if the debtor has tendered performance of the underlying contract. Another defense of the surety is if there have been material changes or changes in the material terms of the contract. For instance, delivery dates by a material, uh, because it's a material factor in the contract, or in the quantity, or in price terms. So a change in the material terms of the contract will be a defense for the surety. It should be noted, however, that any personal defenses of the debtor cannot be used by the surety as a defense of his own. This would include such things as the incapacity or bankruptcy of the debtor. Let's talk about surety or guarantor remedies. And here, because the CPA exam frequently asks questions along these lines, we have some mnemonics to remember. It's called ICES, I-C-E-S. The I stands for indemnification or reimbursement. So, for instance, if the surety is required to make payment because the debtor has defaulted, then that guarantor, that surety, has a right to be indemnified or reimbursed by the debtor at some later point. In contrast, there is the C for contribution. This would be the case where one co-surety pays the debt and there were several co-sureties that were involved in the particular contract. So the paying surety is entitled to a contribution from his or her co-sureties. Then there is exoneration. 
This is the E in ISIS. And exoneration comes when the surety is released by the debtor. Finally, the S from ISIS stands for subrogation. This is where the surety steps into the creditor's shoes and can go ahead and sue, seize collateral, or take any other rights against the debtor that the creditor would have had. Now, let's give a little example about a surety arrangement and a guarantor arrangement. Take, for instance, my son, who has his own small business. He is the sole owner of it. His corporation wishes to purchase property from another party, and the purchase is going to be made by his corporation. So the original contract for the purchase, let's say, of the land is between his corporation and the seller of that real estate. That's the debtor-creditor relationship. At the time of the purchase, my son, as the owner of the corporation, is asked to be a guarantor of that contract payment. So if the corporation defaults completely, he will have to step in and make sure the payment is made. That's typical of an owner and their small business in dealing with a party for acquiring large assets like that. In contrast, there may be the case where his corporation wishes to purchase goods or services from an outside vendor. That vendor may have questions about the ability of his company to make payment. And so they may ask a surety to come in and guarantee the payment. That will be a separate contract between the outside party, not my son as the owner, but somebody else, who may be guaranteeing the payments in case the corporation defaults. So remember, your surety contracts sometimes are entered into at the time of the original contract, sometimes subsequently. They must be in writing because they are the promise to pay the debt of another party. In other words, they must meet the statute of frauds requirement. And as we've gone through these different steps, what can happen to a surety if the debtor defaults? The creditor can go after any collateral that may be available, can sue the debtor, can demand payment from the surety, and these acts can be done in any order. Do remember, however, that if it's a guarantor, the creditor must exhaust all remedies against the debtor before pursuing the guarantor. And please do not forget, we're going to talk in a recap about ISIS. That stands for surety and guarantor remedies, indemnification, contribution, exoneration, and subrogation. Which of the following events will release a non-compensated surety from liability to the creditor? A. The principal debtor was involuntarily petitioned into bankruptcy. B. The creditor failed to notify the surety of a partial surrender of the principal debtor's collateral. C. The creditor was adjudicated incompetent after the debt arose. Or D. The principal debtor exerted duress to obtain the surety agreement. All right, let's take the first two answers the first two underlying bases together. And that's A, the principal debtor was involuntarily petitioned into bankruptcy, or the principal debtor exerted duress to obtain the surety agreement. These are both incorrect answers. Please remember that the surety cannot use the debtor's personal defenses, for instance, bankruptcy, that would be A, as a defense. And the principal debtor, again, exerting duress to obtain the surety agreement, that is not a valid defense from the surety because he entered into the contract. C, the creditor was adjudicated incompetent after the debt arose. This is clearly a bad answer also because it does not make any difference what the creditor's status is. The agreement was that the surety would pay if the debtor did not pay. So the creditor's status is irrelevant. The only correct answer here is B. The creditor failed to notify the surety of a partial release or a partial surrender of the principal's debtor's collateral. 
any release of the collateral will be a defense for the surety because the surety has the right to look to that collateral as protection before he has to make payment. So you should be circling B as the correct answer on the exam. Our next question asks, when a principal debtor defaults and a surety pays the creditor the entire obligation, which of the following remedies gives the surety the best method of collecting from the debtor? So note the question, it says the best method of collecting from the debtor. First of all, the answer is A, exoneration, B, contribution, C, subrogation, or D, attachment. Well, exoneration simply means that the debtor uh, releases the surety. So that's not going to do any good where the surety pays the entire obligation. A is wrong. Contribution means the surety is collecting from co-sureties. And that's not the case here either. B is incorrect. Let's move down to D because C is the correct answer. Let's see why D is wrong. Attachment, attaching the goods or services, it, or the goods rather, is basically a secured transaction uh, term. It is not used here in the subrogation. It's incorrect. The correct answer is subrogation, which means that the surety steps into the shoes of the creditor and has all of the rights of the creditor against the debtor. That will give maximum protection and offers the best method for the surety to collect from the debtor. C is the answer you want. Our next question reads, which of the following rights does one co-surety generally have against another co-surety? Again, our answers are A, exoneration, B, subrogation, C, reimbursement, or D, contribution. And as you remember from just our previous problem, exoneration, that's when the debtor is releasing the surety. That does nothing when one co-surety is going against another. Subrogation, the surety standing in the rights to go against the debtor. Again, irrelevant in this particular question. Reimbursement, generally that is between the debtor and the surety, but here even reimbursement doesn't really apply. You could ask for reimbursement from another co-surety, but that's not really a right under the suretyship law. What you want is contribution. It is contributions from one surety to a co-surety for their proportionate amount of the liability that was settled. Select D. This question deals with Ingot Corporation. It lent Flange $50,000. At Ingot's request, Flange entered into an agreement with Quill and West for them to act as compensated co-sureties on the loan in the amount of $100,000. Ingot released West without Quill or Flange's consent, and Flange later defaulted on the loan. Which of the following statements is correct? Quill will be liable for 50% of the loan balance. Answer A. Quill, Quill will be liable for the entire loan balance. Answer B. C. Ingot's release of West will have no effect on Flange's and Quill's liability to Ingot. Or D. Flange will be released for 50% of the loan balance. Well, in this case, Quill agreed to be liable for 50% of the amount of the loan. Uh, each co-surety was in for $100,000. Quill agreed to act as a co-surety. The debt was $50,000. Quill is liable for 50% of the loan balance. That was the deal that they signed up for. So the correct answer is A. Quill is not liable for the only loan balance, even though he signed up for $100,000 because it was a 50% commitment. Ingot's release of West and Flange's release are both incorrect answers. C and D are wrong. B was wrong. Quill is liable for 50% of the loan balance. Teller, Kerr, and Ace are co-sureties on a $120,000 loan with maximum liabilities of 20, 
forty and sixty thousand dollars respectively. The debtor defaulted on the loan when the loan balance was sixty thousand dollars. Ace paid the lender forty eight thousand in full settlement of all claims against Teller, Kerr, and Ace, who were the three sureties. What amount may Ace collect from Kerr? The answers are zero for A, sixteen thousand for B, twenty thousand C, and twenty eight thousand D. The correct answer here is B, and the way this is computed is all three of the sh sureties, their total exposure added up to 120,000. Kerr had 40,000 of the 120, or one-third. Ace paid $48,000, so Kerr's one-third contribution of 48,000 would be $16,000. This is an illustration of the right of contribution from co-sureties. Our next problem says, which of the following rights does a surety have? The left column, the right to compel the creditor to collect from the principal debtor. And the right column, the right to compel the creditor to proceed against the principal debtor's collateral. Answer A is yes and yes. B, yes and no. C, no and yes, and D, no and no. The correct answer, and here we're talking about a surety, he does not have the right to compel the creditor to collect from the principal debtor. If the debtor defaults, the creditor can immediately go to the surety and demand payment. So you want a no answer for that one. How about does the surety have a right to compel the creditor to proceed against the debtor's collateral? Welcome to CPA Ready, comprehensive review materials for the computer-based CPA exam that lets you customize your own review program to meet your individual learning style and ensure your success. Thank you for selecting this hotspot video, which contains a targeted, intensive review of the specified topic area. We hope you find this video to be an effective tool in your CPA exam preparation. BISC Education. Welcome to CPA Review Hotspot Commercial Paper and Documents of Title. I'm Jack Norman. Today we're going to review a particular area of the law. And I know all of you are thinking, I'm an accountant. I'm studying for the CPA exam. Why do I have to know so much about the law? I don't intend to become a lawyer. The answer, quite simple. You want to do the best job you possibly can for your client. And as a CPA, we admit you're not practicing law but you will have the insights to be able to help your client, to steer them in the right direction, and when necessary, to get legal counsel. That's the reason for the law part of the CPA exam. Now let's begin with commercial paper. Commercial paper is a unique item. It is a negotiable instrument. Now, the transferee, the one who takes, who receives a negotiable instrument, may actually get better title in that document than the person who transfers it if, and only if, the person who's receiving it becomes a qualified holder in due course or takes the property from someone who was a holder in due course. Now, over the course of this program, we're going to explore the issues of negotiable instrument, holders in due course, remedies, and liabilities. As we begin the program, you need to remember that commercial paper is governed by Article II of the Uniform Commercial Code. All right, I talked about commercial paper. 
What is commercial paper? And there are a number of different items. Let's begin with the simplest one, and you may well have executed a promissory note. Now, in a promissory note, there are two parties, the maker and the payee. Just to refresh your memory, I'm going to make a note and sign it to you. Perhaps we just uh, finished a nice friendly game of poker in the, in the dorm or in the apartment uh, over the weekend, and I lost to you. I don't have all the cash I need to pay you, so I'm going to sign a promissory note. I, the maker, promise to pay you, the payee, the sum of $50 two weeks from now when I get paid. That is a promissory note. Remember, there are two parties, I, the maker, you, the payee, who will receive the money from me. Another type of commercial paper is the draft, D-R-A-F-T. Here, there are three parties, the drawer, the drawee, and the payee. In effect, the drawer is like the maker of the promissory note. This is the person who promises to pay. And just as in the promissory note, there is a payee, the person who will be receiving the money. But notice there is that third party, the drawee. This is the one on whom the funds are drawn, in effect, to make the payment from the drawer to the payee. Now, you're thinking to yourself, I'm sure, drafts. Have I ever seen a draft before? And of course you have. You have written checks probably for years. A check is a type of draft. Now, the unusual part of this is it is payable on demand. You take that check to the bank. Who is the bank? The bank is the drawee. You, who have written the check, is the drawer, and the person who is cashing it or making the deposit in their bank is the payee. So we now know the difference. The note has two parties. The draft has three parties. Continuing the types of commercial paper. How about a certificate of deposit? And you may well have a couple of these in your possession. This is where you have deposited money with the bank. The bank has acknowledged receipt of that property and promises to repay with interest. A prime example I use is I have a rental condominium. And when a new tenant comes in, I, of course, ask for one month's rent in advance. They write that check to me and I fully intend and will refund that deposit, if you will, to them when they move out of the unit, unless they have damaged the unit beyond repair, and then I'll take that deposit for the, to pay for the repairs. But let's assume I've got good tenants, they've been there a year, at the end of the year, school is over, they leave, they terminate the lease, and I have to give them back their deposit. What I have done when I received the deposit I took it down to my bank, put that $1,000 in the bank, and said, make it for one year, pay me interest on it. So at the end of the year, when my tenants leave, I go back to the bank, cash it in, and receive back the $1,000 plus 6% interest, which I turn over to my departing tenants. They've been good to me. I'm trying to be good to them. So remember, certificate of deposit, the bank acknowledges receipt of the money, and promises to repay with interest. Another type of commercial paper is the time draft or trade acceptance. Now this is specifically confined to a draft between a buyer and a seller of goods. The seller is the drawer and the payee. The buyer accepts the draft by signing for it. So in effect the seller is saying, buyer here are the goods you will pay me when you receive the goods, a time draft or trade acceptance. Now, as we continue with the program, I want you to remember investment securities and documents of title, and we'll discuss documents of title a little later in this program, both investment securities and document titles are not commercial paper. Remember, not commercial paper, but follow the same general rules. Now I'm going to introduce you to the elements of negotiability. And remember we began this discussion of per 
commercial paper by saying we want a negotiable instrument. That makes it a valuable instrument. We can transfer it from one party to another. So what are the elements of negotiability? I want you to prepare for the exam by putting firmly, clearly in your mind, this little mnemonic, SUMBOD, S-U-M-B-O-D. SUMBOD are the elements of negotiability. We're going to go through each of these individually, but let's just begin with an overview of these six elements. Signed is the S. The document must be signed. The U, unconditional. The instrument must contain an unconditional promise to pay. That's the U. The M in SUMBOD stands for money. The document must be payable in money. Not services, but money. The next two items, the instrument must be payable to a B, bearer, or to order. And if you remember when you look at a check, it always says there at the beginning, pay to the order of. So as we discuss these, we'll talk about bearers and we'll talk about order, the B and the O in SUMBOD. And finally, the instrument must be payable on demand or at a definite point in time. All right, let's begin with those separate elements. The signature requirement. The document must be signed by the maker or the drawer. Remember that it's the maker in the case of a note, the drawer in the case of a draft. Now, this signature can be typed, can be printed, stamped, hand-signed. I suspect most of you, when you're signing checks, just put your... John Hancock or Jane Hancock at the bottom in the signature block. But it can be typed, it could be pre-printed. Some uh, instruments require dual signatures. It can be signed in the trade name or an assumed name, for instance, a corporation. It can be signed as an agent, by an agent, who is a representative of that principal. But here's an important point. If the individual who is signing is acting as the agent, they need to put that representative capacity. In other words, I'm signing for the firm of Dewey, Cheatham, and Howe by Jack Norman agent. That defines that I am acting as an agent for that particular firm. Obviously, however, I'm not going to act as an agent for the firm of Dewey, Cheatham, and Howe. There's one further particular point to be kept in mind about the agent. If the agent does not indicate that he is signing as a representative, he's going to be treated as the principal. So you must make clear that that agency relationship uh, does exist. In filling out the document, there may be ambiguities. Now, an ambiguity does not, and I'm going to repeat that, does not automatically mean that the instrument is non-negotiable. We can resolve the ambiguities. Suppose, for instance, I mean to write a check for $1,000. I put $1,000 in the number block off on the side, but in writing the words, I don't get the 1,000 in. I put 10,000, which is right. Is it the 10,000 words that I wrote or the $1,000 I put over in the block on the side of the check? Words take priority over figures. So even though I only intended a $1,000 check, when I misspoke and wrote the words 10000 those take priority in the ambiguity. That takes care of our S in SUMBOD. And we're going to work some examples uh, a little later in the program so that you can get real comfortable with how the signature must be made and the requirements. But let's talk about the remaining five elements before we get to those problems. The U, unconditional. The promise made in the note or in the draft must be an unconditional promise or order to pay the money. Now, what do we mean by unconditional? It means that that re 
payment requirement cannot be a subject to. In other words, if I say, I will pay you this money after I sell my house, that's a condition that destroys the negotiability aspect because that requirement that my house must be sold first does limit my obligation to pay the money. Suppose I make a representation on the note, however, that I will pay you $200,000 after I sell my house. Again, that's a condition. But suppose I word it this way. I will pay you $200,000 from the proceeds of selling my house. From the proceeds, conditional or not conditional? That's still a condition because I have to sell the house in order to have those proceeds. I will pay you $200,000 by May 1st. I intend to use the monies from the sale of my house. Now we don't have a condition. I have promised that I'm going to pay you by May 1st. I hope that I'm going to sell my house and have the funds to make the payment to you. Some people believe that if a check or note is either post or antedated, that is a conditional promise. That's not true. You can post date or antedate a check or note that will not be a condition. The reference to collateral. This note is secured by my inventory. Not a condition. It's simply a reference to the collateral. So how about an acceleration clause? Suppose I say, I will pay you by November 1st, but in the event that I am able to sell my house before then, I will pay it upon the sale. Now that's okay because we have a date in here and it's not conditioned on selling my house. I'm going to digress to put two rules that I want you to remember as we go through this negotiability criteria. Once an instrument is negotiable on its face, it is always negotiable. So we look to the face of the instrument to see whether it has these six elements of negotiability. If it is non-negotiable on its face, in other words, it is not unconditional or it's not signed, then it is always non-negotiable and we can't change the nature of the instrument. So remember that. Once negotiable on its face, always negotiable. Once non-negotiable on its face, always non-negotiable. All right, we've talked about the first two of my elements. It must be signed. The instrument must be unconditional. The third element said it had to be payable in money, the M of somebody. The instrument must say to pay a sum certain in money. Now, I cannot say I will pay you $1,000 or provide five hours of my legal services at $200 an hour. Even though I could translate that into money, that's services. I have to have a sum certain in money. This is probably the easiest of the six elements to remember. What about foreign currency? Does it have to be in U.S. dollars? No. The instrument could be payable in euros, Canadian dollars, cruceros, bol bolivars, whatever is a recognized currency of a government is their medium of exchange will be acceptable under this requirement for negotiability. So don't be misled if a foreign currency appears on the exam. The next two letters come together, the B and the O. The commercial paper must be payable to bearer or to order. Now, a few years ago, the Uniform Commercial Code, Article 2, was amended to take this requirement out for checks, but I still see this as 
a uh, criteria that's usually appearing on the exam. And I think you should bear in mind that drafts and notes must be payable to bearer or to order. It just makes everything simple. These are magic words without which the instrument becomes non-negotiable. What's the difference between these two? Order paper is payable to a specific person. And in order to transfer that property to another person, it requires a signature. Let me give you an example. I'm going to write a check to one of the people that I work with on this program, and I'm going to give a check to Wendy Urka. So I have to sign that check, if I want it this way, pay to the order of Wendy Urka. She is a specific person who now can cash that check. If Wendy wishes to transfer it on to someone else, she must sign that document. So it is payable only to her. I can also make it payable to an organization. I could make it payable to the, let's just say, BISC CPA Review Corporation. That is who now must have a signature on the paper for it to be further transferable. In contrast, bearer simply says, pay to the bearer. Does not require a signature. All that person has to have is the document in order to be able to cash it. Now you're probably asking yourself, how often does somebody write a check to bearer? Who is John Bearer? Actually, what you see most often, and you, I am sure, have done this, you've written a check to cash. Cash is bearer paper. So once that has been signed that way, nobody else needs to sign that check. All they have to do is take a check made payable to cash to the bank, and the bank has to give them cash. Now, the bank may very well ask them to sign it, so that they have evidence of who is cashing the bearer paper, but it's not required in order to make the document negotiable. Anyone in possession of bearer paper can collect with one exception, unless, and I want you to remember this, he or she has knowledge that something is wrong. Classic example. I have made a mistake. I've written a check to cash I was sitting at the bar and I asked them to go ahead and take my check for cash to pay, pay my bar tab and give me a little bit of money so I can catch the cab. The bartender does so, takes that check, puts it in the cash register, and a little bit later knows, finds out that somebody else in the bar has taken that check. That person has knowledge that something is wrong, it's a stolen check, and cannot collect since they have knowledge of that. Now the question is when it gets to the bank, will they know about that stolen transaction? And I will have to have reported it for them to know that it's been stolen or the, the bar will have to have reported it. But the general rule is order paper requires a signature and the paper must be delivered to that person who it's being transferred to. Bearer paper does not require a signature, only delivery of the document. That's the B and the O in some bod. Let's now come back to that last item, the D, and I've mentioned a couple of aspects of this before. The paper must be payable on demand or at a definite time. In other words, the person who's holding that paper must be able to figure out when it becomes due and collectible. Rule number one, if there's no due date on the instrument, it is payable on demand. So if I don't date the instrument, it's just payable immediately. As I mentioned in my little example uh, earlier on the unconditional, acceleration clauses do not destroy negotiability. So again, if I said, I will pay you by May 1st, but if I come into a windfall prior to that time, I will pay you as soon as I have that windfall money, I win the lottery or whatever it is, that's fine because you know that not later than May 1st, that exact date, you have a definite time. 
Now, also remember my earlier admonition that if an instrument is non-negotiable, uh, I'm sorry, if it is non-negotiable on its face, it never becomes negotiable. And furthermore, if it is negotiable, it always stays negotiable. Well, if an instrument is non-negotiable, it is still a promissory note or a draft. It just is not a negotiable promissory note or draft, and it is a little less valuable in terms of transferability and ease. With those reviews of the elements of negotiability and the types of commercial paper, I'd like you to turn to problems 1 through 10. After you've had a chance to work these, we'll come back, go through each of the problems, and explain the right answer, which I'm sure you've gotten, and why the other answers are incorrect. Question number one. Which of the following instruments is subject to the provisions of the Negotiable Instruments Article of the UCC? As you recall, I mentioned the Negotiable Instruments was Article 2. Of these four items, only a certificate of deposit is a type of negotiable instrument under Article 2. A bill of lading and a warehouse receipt are documents of title which are governed by Article 7, and an investment security is covered by Article 8 of the UCC. As we mentioned, the documents of title and the investment securities do follow the same rules, but they are under different articles of the UCC, so only answer C is correct for the first question. Which of the following negotiable instruments is subject to the UCC instruments article? Same type of question, but a different set of answers to look at. A corporate bearer bond with a maturity date of January 1, 2015. Well, a bearer bond is an investment security. So as we know, that is back under Article 8 of the UCC. Answer A is incorrect. As we discussed in the previous question, warehouse receipts and a bill of lading payable to order are again documents of title covered by Article 7. So C and D are incorrect. The correct answer is item B, an installment note payable on the first day of the month, item B. The third and fourth questions are based on a document. I promise to pay to the order of A.B. Shark $1,000 numerically and $1,100 written out with instrument with interest thereon at the rate of 12% per annum. So what type of document is this? Is this a note or a draft? First of all, it is a note. There are two parties, I promise to pay shark. So we, we know we're dealing with a note here. There is, this document is signed TT title and then says guarantee, personally guaranteed by T title, N.A. Abner. So Abner is guaranteeing the payment of title to A.B. Shark. Question number three. This instrument is a promissory demand note, a site draft, a check, or a trade acceptance. Promissory demand note, A. Do we have a note here? Yes, we have two parties. Title is saying that he will pay Shark. When? It is payable on demand. So A is looking pretty good. Let's check the other ones out. Is it a site draft? No, this is not a site draft. That would be a three-party document. So we know that since even though there's a guarantee, that's not a third-party document of a drawee, drawer, and payee. So B is incorrect. Could it be a check? No, we also know that a check is a draft which is payable on demand. So C is incorrect. And a trade acceptance is between a buyer and a seller of goods. So D is incorrect. We come back to the correct answer A, a promissory demand note. Question number four on the same document, we've gotten into the elements now of negotiability. Is this document non-negotiable, even though it's payable on demand? 
non-negotiable because the numeric amount differs from the written amount, negotiable even though a payment date is not specified, or negotiable because of Abner's guarantee. Well, let's go back through the SOMBOD requirements. Is it signed? Yes, it is. Signed by T. Title. Is it unconditional? Yes, it's an unconditional promise to pay. Is it in money? Yes, it is. Now, the amount is either $1,000 or $1,100. But if you recall, we talked about an ambiguity. Words control numbers, so even though they are different, we do have a sum certain. The money requirement is met. It is, is it payable to order or to bearer? Yes, it's payable to A.B. Shark, so we've taken care of the O. And is it payable on a date certain? Well, no, there is not a date certain. Therefore, what is our rule? No date specified. It is payable on demand. Well, let's look at the possible answers again. Let's scratch out A and B because we have met all the SOMBOD requirements. It is negotiable even though a payment date is not specified. It's a demand note. And Abner's guarantee has no effect on negotiability. That may make the document a little bit better in terms of the next holder who takes it because we do have Abner's guarantee. But it is not a SOMBOD requirement. C is the correct answer to question number four. Question number five. On February 15th, year four, P.D. Stone obtained the following instrument from Astor Company for $1,000. Stone was aware that Helco disputed liability under the instrument because of an alleged breach by Astor of the computer purchase agreement. On March 1st, Willard Bank obtained the instrument from Stone for $3,900. Willard had no knowledge that Helco disputed liability under the instrument. Well, what does this instrument look like? Helco promises to pay Astor or bearer $4,900, maker may elect to extend the due date with interest at 12% per annum, and then it references a computer purchase agreement. The reverse side is endorsed, pay to the order of Willard Bank. Now, we have a number of facts here, but let's take a look at the answer and cut through the fog, because this is a fairly straightforward question in spite of the fact they've thrown a lot of different facts at you. Is this instrument non-negotiable because of the reference to the computer purchase agreement? Well, here we're focused on the U, the unconditional part of our SOMBOD phrase. And this does not, this reference to the computer purchase agreement does not make it non-negotiable. It's not subject to the purchase agreement being met. It simply references that the agreement was part and parcel of the transaction that gave rise to the agreement. So A is an incorrect answer. Is it non-negotiable because the numerical amount differs from the written amount? No, again, we talked about resolving the ambiguity. The numerical amount is different, but the written amount will prevail, and this does not make the instrument non-negotiable. Let's look at answer D and skip over C for a moment. D reads it's negotiable when held by Astor, but non-negotiable when held by Willard Bank. Not true. It was a negotiable instrument when held by Astor. That's clearly correct. Astor took it and then endorsed it, paying to the order of Willard Bank. Willard Bank uh, also gets a negotiable title to the property. And remember the general rule I talked to you early on in this program. Once negotiable, always negotiable. Negotiable when held by Astor, it remains negotiable when held by Willard. So let's look at C now. Negotiable even though the maker has the right to extend the time for payment. Yes, it is still a negotiable instrument because there is a time certain, even though that right may be extended and it includes an interest clause with it. 
So the holder of the instrument can still find a way to know when he is going to be paid and the compensation to be paid for the instrument. A is incorrect, B is incorrect, D is incorrect, C is the correct answer. Negotiable even though the right to extend, even though there is a right to extend payment. All right, you looked at problem number six, and it reads, under the negotiable instruments article of UCC, which of the following statements is or are correct regarding the requirements for an instrument to be negotiable? And we're spending a lot of time talking about SUMBOD because the examiners love questions focused around the elements of negotiability. Statement number one, the instrument must be in writing. That's true. It must be signed by the drawer and draw E and contain an unconditional promise or order to pay. Remember, it must be an unconditional promise or order to pay or payable to bear, and it must be signed. But there's a problem here. It says signed by both the drawer and the draw E. It does not have to be signed by the draw E. How about statement number two? The instrument must state a fixed amount of money, be payable on demand or at a definite time, and be payable to order or to bearer. This looks like a pretty good statement of what SUMBOD is all about. Fixed sum of money, payable on demand or at a definite time, be payable to order or bearer. Statement two is correct. And now if we look at our choices, we know one is wrong and two is right. So of the four possible answers, only B Statement two only is the correct answer. A, C, and D fall by the wayside. Question number seven. Under the negotiable instruments article of the UCC, which of the following requirements must be met for a transferee of order paper to become a holder. Now, as you read these questions, you need to focus on the elements of negotiability and who are they asking about here? Order paper. Remember we said that bearer paper is simply transferred by possession. However, order paper must be transferred by both possession of the document and the endorsement of the transferor. You need both statements one and two. The correct answer, obviously then, is letter C, both one and two. Answers A, B, and D are all incorrect. Number eight, under the negotiable instruments article of the UCC, which of the following provisions satisfies the requirement that an instrument to be negotiable must be payable at a definite time? Well, first, let's look at A. The instrument is dated and payable 15 days after sight. Does that give you a definite time? Well, yes, the sight means the instrument is looked at by whoever the drawee is, the payee, and so 15 days after that appears to give us a definite sight. That looks a definite date. That looks like a good answer, but let's check out the other three. The instrument is dated and payable in six months. That would seem to be definite, but the payor may extend this period indefinitely. Up Watch the operative words there at the end, indefinitely. This has just taken us out of the definite time period. Clearly, B is wrong. The instrument is undated and payable 30 days after date. Again, you cannot fix the date for payment. Suppose once this instrument was prepared like this, the date was then inserted. Well, remember what I told you. If it's negotiable on its face, when it's pre prepared, then it remains negotiable. But we can't make it negotiable after the fact. So this C is the incorrect answer. Finally, D, the instrument is undated and payable when the payee dies. Well, at some point we know the payee is going to die, but we have an indefinite dating here. So for problem number eight, the answer clearly has to be A. Number nine. A bank issues a negotiable instrument that acknowledges receipt of $50,000. The instrument provides that the bank will repay the $50,000 plus 8% interest per annum 
to the bearer 90 days from the date of this instrument. What is this instrument? Well, is it a negotiable instrument? Certainly it is. It meets all the requirements of time, dating, signed, because it'll be signed by the bank. What else is it? Certificate of deposit, time draft, trader banker's acceptance, or cashier's check. First of all, the certificate of deposit is an acknowledgement by a bank or savings and loan that they have funds on deposit, that they will be repaid at a particular point in time. A is beginning to look like a pretty good answer, but could it be a time draft? A time draft is again a three-party check, a three-party document that requires the payment at a time certain, which is why it's not a check, it's a time certain, not on demand, to a directing a second party to pay a third party. This is not what this document is. It is not a time draft. A trade or a banker's acceptance. Banker's acceptance is very similar to a trade acceptance, which we said occurs in the transfer of goods between a buyer and a seller. The banker's acceptance is simply that the uh, amount, rather than being drawn on the buyer's own account, is on a different, on a bank of the buyer. So this is not a trade acceptance. And a cashier's check is a check drawn by a bank on itself directing it to pay a th another party. This is not a cashier's check. So we come back to the correct answer. A, we have a certificate of deposit. Finally, question number 10 that I asked you to look at. Third Corp has agreed to purchase goods from Silk. Third could not pay for the goods immediately. Therefore, a draft was drawn up by Silk, this is the seller, ordering Third, the buyer, to pay Silk the price of the goods at a specified future date. Third, the buyer, then signed the draft and returned it to Silk. What do we have here? We have a negotiable document of some type. What is it? It's a draft. Uh, remember, we're, all, we're dealing with a maker here, a drawer, excuse me, a drawer, not a maker, a drawer, a drawee, and a payee. Is it a trade acceptance? Answer A. A letter of credit? Answer B. A bank draft? Letter C. Or D. A check? Well, let's take the easy one. Is it a check? A, an amount made by a maker having a third party, the bank where the deposit is held, make a payment to another party on demand? No, it's not. Is it a bank draft, which is a document where one bank draws on another bank? It's between the two banks. That's not what's happened here. A letter of credit, which as we just discussed in an earlier problem, deals with a deposit and a payment at a later point in time with interest. Clearly answer B, this is not a letter of credit. Then does it meet the criteria we talked about as a trade acceptance? Answer A between a buyer and a seller of goods with a delayed payment. This is exactly what Silk and the third party have agreed to here. We have a trade acceptance, answer A. That takes us for our review of the first 10 problems in commercial paper. What I'd like to do now is turn to some of the elements on negotiability, which we've talked about, but see those negotiabilities played out with the endorsements and with a holder of due course. So on we go to types of endorsements. There are a number of different types, and each one has implications for how the negotiable instrument is transferred. First, we have a blank endorsement. This is not highly recommended, but let's talk about it because many people do it. A blank is simply a signature only. In other words, I talked earlier in this program about making a check payable to Wendy Urca. If Wendy simply signs it, Wendy Urca, that is a blank signature. And a blank endorsement makes the instrument now bearer paper for the next negotiation. So a signature in blank transfers or makes order paper into bearer paper. A special endorsement names the person that is 
names the endorsee. So let's continue with my example of Wendy taking my check. Now she wishes to endorse it over to another person. Let's say that she has decided to take my check and give it to her mother. So Wendy signs that check, pay to the order of, or doesn't even need to put pay to the order, but says to, puts her mother's name, and then signs Wendy Urka. This is a special endorsement. Notice it's more than the signature. So this special endorsement makes the instrument order paper. And in order for Wendy's mother to transfer that to the next person, she would have to sign it. It no longer is bare paper. So remember, a blank endorsement makes the next negotiation bare paper. A special endorsement, which names the endorsee, makes that instrument order paper for the next negotiation. The next type of endorsement is the one I highly recommend for almost any check that you receive. This is the restrictive endorsement, and it places conditions on the instrument. Whenever I get a check in for virtually any reason, not only do I sign it, Jack Norman, but then right below it, for deposit only. And this means that the check is handed to the bank and it is only for deposit in my account. I'm not endorsing it over to another party and it is not a bearer instrument. The restrictive endorsement, bear this in mind, does not prevent further negotiation. The bank could deposit it. They're not going to negotiate it further, but I can put restrictive endorsements on these. And that is what I frankly believe is probably the safest for you to do with any check or other document that comes into your hands that is a negotiable instrument. Finally, we're going to talk about qualified endorsements. And you may have seen this on occasion where someone will take a negotiable instrument and write on it without recourse. So I sign the, the check, Jack Norman, without recourse. This qualified endorsement does not guarantee, I'm not going to guarantee, that the primary party will pay that check. However, it does make warranties that every other endorser makes. So keep this in mind. It doesn't guarantee payment by the primary party but it makes the same warranties of every other endorser. With those endorsement rules clear, let's go back and look at the contract liabilities from negotiable instruments. First of all, we have primary parties, that is, who is going to pay on the instrument? The maker of a note, the person who actually prepares that note, is the one who is primarily liable on the note. A drawee acceptor of a draft is the person who is the primary liability. The drawer is never primarily a liable party. Okay, so let's go back to the note that we talked about early on in the program. I will pay you, my good friend, the $50 that I owe you from our poker game. I am the maker of the note. I am primarily liable on the note. Suppose I write a check to you saying that I am going to write this check. It is payable by my bank and it is payable to you. I am not primarily liable on that. The acceptor of the draft is. How about secondary parties? They are liable for payment only after the presentment to the primary party who defaults. Now, who is a secondary party? Any endorser of the obligation unless they have put without recourse. So a secondary party is liable for payment on that document after presentation to the primary party and that primary party defaults. In other words, does not pay the obligation as due and notice of dishonor 
In other words, notice that that primary party did not pay is given to the endorsers or the secondary parties. So when you're endorsing checks or taking other negotiable instruments and you have endorsed them, you become secondarily liable if the primary does not pay. That's the contract liability for payment. There are also warranties that are made when you sign a document. And these are warranties of title. In other words, that you have title to the instrument. You also warrant that the signatures on those documents are genuine. You warrant that there is no material alteration of the document. Every endorser, including an endorser without recourse, has warranty liability so that that endorser without recourse gets themselves out of the payment, contractual obligation for payment, but does give a warranty. Suppose a problem comes up in the document. Subsequently, can anyone recover on breach of warranty? Yes, these are civil actions where you can sue the secondary parties for breach of the warranties, even if they are not obligated to make the payment on the debt. Everyone who takes a negotiated property or takes bare instruments becomes a holder and they get the rights of the original payee or acceptor on those obligations. But there is a very, very special type of holder. It's called a holder in due course. And a holder in due course can actually get better title and better rights to that negotiable instrument than an earlier holder. So in this case, the transferee, if they are a holder in due course, will actually get better rights than the original holder or transferor of the property. Since you want this status, how do you become a holder in due course? I'm going to give you another little learning device. It's called VFW. The holder in due course must give present value for the instrument. V, present value, not future value. You must take the instrument in good faith with no knowledge that there is any wrongdoing on behalf of either the maker, an earlier endorser, or holder of the obligation. And you must take without notice that there are missing signatures or other required items. So V value, F good faith, W without notice. Those are the three elements of a holder in due course. Now, of course, you have to have two other things. You have to be a holder. You have to hold that piece of property and it has to be a negotiable instrument. But assuming you're holding it, assuming it's a negotiable instrument with all the sumbod characteristics that we talked about earlier, and you take it with value, good faith, and without notice, you will be a holder in due course. That's a great, great right, and we're going to talk about what it gets you in just a few moments. But let's talk about something else, and that's someone who is a holder but doesn't meet the holder in due course rules but comes under what is called in this parlance under the shelter rule, and you become a holder under or a holder from a holder in due course. I know that sounds like a mouthful, but you're a holder under a holder in due course. This means that you have taken that property, but you have not met one of the three elements of value, knowledge, and good faith. Here is an example of how you can be a holder in due course and then a holder under a holder in due course. 
suppose I have received, I, I have a good friend who has an obligation, a, a note, let's say. That note promises to pay him $4,000 on June 1st. He needs some money right now and says, Jack, I will sell you this note, which I received in a, in a good transaction. I will sell it to you for $3,700, and four months from now, you will collect the, the entire sum. So I just, I'm giving you a discount. It's for you to wait to get the money. I need the cash today. So I am going to take this note as a holder. It is a negotiable instrument. I will give them the discounted value, so I have parted with value for it. I'm taking it in good faith, and I have no knowledge that there's a problem. The document is complete on its face. It's negotiable. I see no alterations. Nothing looks wrong. I've paid for it. I am a holder in due course. Now, my brother runs into some financial difficulties, and he'd like uh, some money. We're coming up on uh, June 1st, but we're not quite there. Uh, I could give it to him and say, look, in three more days, you can collect this full note, uh, and that'll solve your problem. I'm giving it to you as a gift. You need the money. I don't right now. I have been a holder in due course. I'm transferring it to him in good faith. I have no knowledge of any problems. Neither does he have any knowledge but he has not given me value for it. He's paying me nothing. It's a gratuitous transfer. Therefore, my brother is not a holder in due course, but he is a holder under a holder in due course. And he steps in and has the same rights as I do, even though he is not a holder in due course. Well, now you're going to say, all right, Jack, I've got all these acronyms floating around in my head. What difference does it make? Here's the difference it makes. A holder in due course takes the instruments free of any personal defenses that could be raised by a maker or the earlier uh, drawer of the instrument. Such uh, things as there was a failure of consideration, contracts weren't performed. I, don't, I cannot have any of those personal defenses raised as barriers to my collecting on the instrument. But the maker, the drawer, can raise what are called real or universal defenses against me. And here's something that the examiners love to test on, the real defenses and whether or not you are a holder in due course, whether the payor is obligated to you. You need to remember if MIF, another mouthful, if MIF, I-F-M-I-F. -I and this goes through the real defenses that can be raised by a holder in due course. First, infancy, or lack of uh, coming of adulthood uh, under state law. If the person who made the note, let's say a 15-year-old child, uh, takes his checkbook and goes down to the uh, store and writes a check for an iPod, that check is a real defense. He has not reached the age of majority and does not have to pay on the obligation. So infancy is a real defense against a holder in due course. If there is a forgery on the check, it is a real defense and the holder in due course cannot collect on the obligation. If there is a material alteration, in other words, Let's say I wrote a check, as I should not, but let's assume I did, to IRS. And somebody gets that check and changes it over to IR Stevenson and cashes, tries to cash the check. Material alteration. If I've done that, uh, that is, or some other party in the chain has done it, that's a material alteration which will act as a real defense against a holder in due course. The second I is actually three I's, but I didn't want to say if the myth. The I stands for illegality, 
insanity or insolvency of the maker. So if any of those were applicable to the person who made the commercial paper at the time of making it, the transaction was illegal, the maker was insane, the maker was adjudicated insolvent, then that will constitute a real or universal defense against the holder in due course. Finally, the second F stands for fraud in the execution. Now, on this point, I want to tell you that there are two types of fraud. The one that gives rise to a real defense is fraud in the execution. In other words, someone stole checks from my house broke in, stole checks, forged my name. That's fraud in the execution and operates as a real defense. I had no intention of writing such a check. The second type of fraud is called fraud in the inducement. And this can be a, uh, this cannot be raised, fraud in the inducement, against a holder in due course. And as an example of that, Suppose a friend of mine says, Jack, I'm really indebted to uh, Bob Jones. I need you to write a check to me, if you will. Uh, I'm going to use it to pay off a, a note to Bob. Uh, he's breathing down my neck. I'm afraid what he might do. The man's a little unstable. So I said, OK, I'll give you the check. Here it is. Uh, I've written the check. I meant to write the check in good faith for this friend of mine to pay off his rather threatening creditor. Nevertheless, my friend has no threatening creditor. Instead, takes it down to a check cashing place and pockets the money. That was fraud in the inducement. I actually intended to write the check, uh, but it was used for the wrong purpose. So there, that does not constitute a real defense against a holder in due course. The holder in due course can collect on that check, or the bank cash, check cashing facility can collect on it. Let's talk for a minute about banking relationships. First of all, the certified check. Uh, you may have already dealt with certified checks. Uh, I know that when I went to buy my first home, the uh, lawyer that was going to be handling the closing said, when you come to closing, we need you to bring a certified check for X amount. When he told, he told me the amount, I gulped twice, but then went to the bank to get the certified check. And what this is, is the bank becomes the primary party once they certify a check. In effect, what they've done is taken money out of your account, immediately said that it's good to be paid. So they will actually certify that the funds are available to pay that check. Once the check has been certified, all prior parties, whether they were the uh, drawer of the note or the prior endorser, if for any reason there was one, are released. The only person who is liable now on that commercial paper is the one who is certified payment. Another relationship we have is the stop payment order. Let's assume that you've made a purchase and you get it home and it doesn't fit in the room or the colors aren't right or your, your spouse is not happy with your decision. You've written a check for it and you can immediately call the, uh, let's say the furniture store where you purchased it, said, I want to bring it back, I am canceling the purchase, and you then call the bank to stop payment on the check. You may have a dispute with the furniture company over the return, but you can clearly stop payment from the bank on that check. An oral stop payment order is good for 14 days, but you can get an extension up to six months if you put the stop order payment in writing. So the best advice if you want to do this, call the bank immediately, get it an immediate uh, oral stop payment in place, and then during the 14 days, follow up with a written stop order payment to the bank, which will uh, be good for six months. Another issue where banks, endorsers, and other parties to commercial instruments run into problems on occasion. Hopefully you'll never see one of these, but since you're going to become CPAs, 
I suspect you will have a chance to see a forgery at some point in your career. In the case of a bank, when the depositor signature is forged, we have one set of rules. When an endorser signature is, is uh, forged, there's another set of rules. So first let's look at the bank question. As you recall, when you opened a bank account, the bank asked you to sign signature cards. So here in their records was your signature, which is supposed to be used on, for example, all the checks you're writing. Take the situation where someone breaks into my house, steals some checks that I have, and forges my name on checks, goes and then cashes the checks. In this particular case, the bank has the obligation and is liable on the forgery. I certainly did not intend that that check be written, and the bank had the ability to stop it by checking my signature card against the check that came in. The depositor has one year to notify the bank that there was a forgery on a first forgery occurrence. If this particular thief has forged a second check, then there's 30 days for me to give notice to the bank. But the general rule is, on a forgery of a depository signature, the bank is liable. A different rule applies if an endorser's signature is forged. The rule is that the first taker from a forger bears the risk of loss. So if I get a check that has been endorsed over to me, and the person who transferred the check to me forged the signature, I'm responsible and I will assume the loss that I won't be able to collect the money. The reason is that forgery never passes title. In other words, that's a crime that prevents title from passing. Now, as you all know, in the law for every rule, and I've just given you a couple, there are exceptions. And in this particular case on the forged endorsement, there are two exceptions. The first is the imposter rule. If an issuer is tricked into issuing a check to a phony payee, in other words, I write a check to somebody who is an imposter. I think I'm writing it to person A, and indeed they have been using identity theft, have uh, changed identity, and they are the imposter. That person is the one who bears the risk of loss. The second case is the phony payee. And let's take a dishonest employee who tricks his or her employer into issuing checks to a non-existent payee. Uh, the bookkeeper, the person responsible for payroll, makes up three or four employees, has the check signed, then after distributing all the checks to the bona fide employees, takes these non-existent employee checks and cashes them himself. The phony payee situation is also an exception to this rule about forgery not passing title. In each of these two cases, the imposter or the phony payee, once endorsed, a good faith purchaser is protected. So if that, for, that non-existent employee name is forged on the check, is cashed, then the good faith purchaser who takes that check is protected. The loss is borne by the issuer, who has to find the forger. Now, ultimately, that forger is liable for the crime, for the payment. You may not be able to collect from them, but that's where the loss falls. It does not fall on the innocent taker under those two scenarios. Now that you understand some of the rules about holder in due course, taker under a holder in due course, the rules with respect to endorsements, and the banking relationship and liability issues, let's turn to problems 11 through 22. After you've worked through these problems and gotten them all right, I'll review your correct answers with you. All right, problem number 11 reads, under the negotiable instruments article of the UCC, when an instrument is endorsed, pay to John Doe and signed Faye Smith, which of the following statements is or are correct? Payment of the instrument is guaranteed. The instrument can be further negotiated. Well, before we answer this question, let's 
Let me ask this of you. When it reads, pay to John Doe and signed Faye Smith, what kind of endorsement is this? This is a special endorsement because it's not just the signature, but is requiring or transferring it to pay to John Doe. With this type of endorsement, is payment of the instrument guaranteed? Yes, it is. Can the instrument be further negotiated? Yes, it can. Well, now that we have two yes answers, we clearly know A is the correct answer. Yes, payment guaranteed. Yes, further negotiation. B, C, and D are incorrect. You, of course, have circled answer A. Problem 12. One of the requirements to qualify as a holder of a negotiable bearer check is the transferee must. Now, focus on a couple of words in this question as you're answering it. Qualify as a holder, and it doesn't say holder in due course, merely a holder, of a negotiable bearer check. What does the transferee have to do? Receive the check that was originally made payable to the bearer, take the check in good faith, give value for the check, or have possession of the check. Since we're not focused on a holder in due course, simply having possession of a bearer check is all it takes to qualify as a holder. Answer A is incorrect. You don't have to receive the check that was originally made payable to bearer, whoever that may be, and you do not have the good faith or value requirements of a holder in due course. All you have to have is D, mere possession of the check. Now, for question 13, we have the following endorsement on the back of a negotiable promissory note payable to Lake Corp, payable to John Smith only, Frank Parker, president of Lake Corporation. Then signed John Smith, pay to the order of Sharp Inc. without recourse, but only if Sharp delivers computers purchased by Mary Harris by March 15th, year two, then signed Mary Harris, then signed Sarah Sharp, president of Sharp Inc. Looking at this, these endorsements, we're asked, which of the following statements is correct? The note became non-negotiable as a result of Parker's endorsement. Harris's endorsement was a conditional promise to pay and caused the note to be non-negotiable. Smith's endorsement effectively prevented further negotiation of the note and Harris's signature was not required to effectively negotiate the note. All right, if we go back to A, the note became non-negotiable as a result of Parker's endorsement? Clearly not. Remember early on in this program, I said, if a note is negotiable, it remains negotiable. If a note is non-negotiable, it can't become negotiable. So just because of Parker's endorsement did not affect the negotiability of this particular note. It was and remains negotiable. Answer A is wrong. We then read about Harris's endorsement being conditional and causing the note to be non-negotiable. No, whatever Harris wrote on the back of the note doesn't have any effect on whether the instrument changes from negotiable to non-negotiable. It remains negotiable. Answer B is wrong. Smith's endorsement effectively prevented further negotiation of the note. No, again, Smith did exactly what was required, properly endorsed the note, and it is available to be further negotiated. Harris' signature was not required to effectively negotiate the note to Sharp. Well, this is the correct answer, and if we go back and look at the back of the note again, remember that John Smith signed it without a, an endorsement. All he did... Rather, he just did not do to an order of or pay to the order of someone, simply endorsed it in blank. This became bearer paper. Mary Harris did not have to sign it. And so the correct answer is D. Harris's signature was not required to effectively negotiate the note to Sharp. Problem 14 focused on Article 2 of the UCC, the Negotiable Instruments Article. It says, which of the following requirements must be met for a person to be a holder in due course of a promissory note? Now remember, we have some magic things that have to be done to become a holder in due course. The individual taking the paper or the organization must be a holder. The note must be negotiable. The person acquiring the note 
must give value, take the paper in good faith, and not have knowledge of any uh, missing signatures or other facts that would impair the instrument. So A, the note must be payable to the bearer, not a criteria for a holder in due course. A is wrong. The note must be negotiable. That is one of the considerations that appears to be the correct answer. All prior holders must have been a holder in due course. Absolutely not true. You can have holders who are not holders in due course, or they may have been, but it's not, not a requirement that all prior holders must have been. And the holder must be the payee of the note. That's absurd. Uh, the endorser uh, has transferred title, and the holder may or may not be the payee of the note, but it's not a requirement. So answer B is the only correct answer for question 14. Problem 15. Under the negotiable instruments article of the UCC, which of the following parties will be a holder but not entitled to the rights of a holder in due course? Now remember that someone who is not a holder in due course can take and stand with the benefits of a holder in due course, and that person would be a holder under a holder in due course. But in this particular case, they are asking us about a holder who doesn't meet either one of those criteria. A, a party who, knowing of a real defense to payment, received an instrument from a holder in due course. Now, that individual, even though they know of the real defense, would still take with the rights of a holder in due course. B, a party who found an instrument payable to the bearer. The key to answer B is the word found, because in this particular case, this is the correct answer. The party is going to be a holder, but since there was no transfer, they, that's all they will be, is simply a holder of bearer paper. Answer C is incorrect. A party who received as a gift an instrument from a holder in due course will stand in that position of a holder under a holder in due course. They obviously will not be a holder in due course because they did not give value for it. They received the instrument as a gift. And now a party who, in good faith and without notice of any defect, gave value for an investment, uh, for an instrument rather, that is going to be a holder in due course and will have those rights. So A, C, and D are incorrect. The correct answer is B. The party who found the bearer instrument is merely a holder, and that's all. We turn to question 16. Cobb gave Garson a signed check with the amount payable left blank. I'm sure that none of you will ever do this, particularly after you see the rest of the problem. Garson was to fill in, as the amount, the price of fuel oil Garson was to deliver to Cobb at a later date. Garson estimated the amount at $700, but told Cobb it would probably be more like $900. Garson did not deliver the fuel oil, but instead filled in the amount of $1,000 on the check. Garson then negotiated the check to Joseph's in satisfaction of a $500 debt, so this is an antecedent debt, and with the $500 balance paid to Garson in cash. Cobb stopped payment, and Joseph is seeking to collect $1,000 from Cobb. Cobb's maximum liability to Joseph will be 0, 500, 900, or $1,000. Well, I think the first thing you can do in this answer is throw out the $900. Where did that possibly come from? Could be a 0, could be a 1,000, might be 500. Let's analyze it. Did Cobb prepare a negotiable instrument? Did it meet all the Sumbob requirements? Well, not when he did it, but by the time uh, it had all been negotiated by Garson, yeah, we had a negotiable instrument. Was it negotiated to a holder in due course? Mr. Josephs. Joseph paid value for it? Yes, he did. He paid the $500 antecedent debt plus $500 in cash. Did he know of any defect in it? No, he did not. Did he take it in good faith? Yes. It appears that he's a holder in due course. But what about the fact that there was 
literally a material alteration which would normally be a real defense against a holder in due course. The problem here is Cobb's negligence. Cobb didn't complete the instrument completely and allowed Gerson to perpetrate the fraud. In this particular case, Cobb cannot use that as a defense against a holder in due course. Joseph will collect his $1,000, answer D. Question number 17 focuses on an instrument dated February 1, year 4, $10,000, Ludlow, Vermont. I promised to pay to the order of Custer Corporation $10,000 within 10 days after the sale of my two-carat diamond ring. I pledged the sale proceeds to secure my obligation hereunder, signed R. Harris. Do you have a negotiable instrument? And the chorus I should be hearing is absolutely not. Why? Because some bob was not met. Answer A, the instrument is non-negotiable because it is not payable at a definite time. Bingo, you've hit the right answer right out of the box. When is this note payable? If you had it in your hands, do you know when you can collect? No, at some point after a ring is sold. So it flunks the negotiability test. Let's see about the others, the other possible answers. The instrument is non-negotiable, that's true, because it is secured by the proceeds of the sale of the ring. No, that's not a disqualifying piece. The instrument was non-negotiable, but it was because of the definite time. This, this is not a subject to condition. It is an unconditional promise to pay. It just says it's secured by those proceeds. C, the instrument is a negotiable promissory note. You knew this before we even got to C. Since it flunked the Sumbob rules, it is a non-negotiable instrument, and the instrument clearly is not a negotiable site draft payable on demand. It is non-negotiable because it is not payable at a definite time. Answer A. Problem number 18. This is a complicated fact pattern, so let's walk through it carefully. Hunt has in his possession a negotiable instrument, which was originally payable to the order of Carr. It was transferred to Hunt by mere delivery by Drake, who took it from Carr in good faith, in satisfaction of an antecedent debt. The back of the instrument reads as follows. Pay to the order of Drake in satisfaction of my prior purchase of a new video calculator, signed Carr. So this is a debt that went from Carr to Drake to Hunt. The question that is asked, which of the following statements is correct? Let's begin this going in reverse order. Let's look at D, as in David, first. Hunt is a holder in due course. Could Hunt be a holder in due course? Well, the problem we have here is that Hunt took the instrument from Drake by mere delivery, even though it had been paid to the order of Drake. So in the only way that Hunt can become a holder in due course is of what? To take a negotiable instrument for value in good faith without knowledge of a problem. Well, in order to take this, since it is order paper coming to him, he has to take that by negotiation. Mere delivery does not work. So Hunt will not be a holder in due course under D. That's an incorrect answer. Carr's endorsement was a special endorsement, thus Drake's signature was not required in order to negotiate it. That is not correct either. Now, Carr's signature is a special endorsement, pay to the order of Drake, but Drake must now sign it in order to negotiate it further. So the answer C is incorrect. Answer B is in boy. Drake's taking the instrument for an antecedent debt prevents him from qualifying as a holder in due course. This is wrong because Drake has to give value in order to receive the property as a holder in due course. Giving value for antecedent debt does qualify, so this would 
have been one of the conditions allowing him to qualify as a holder in due course. Though this statement is incorrect, it says it would prevent him. No, it would allow him to become one. Let's now look at A, which is, it turns out, by process of elimination, the correct answer. Hunt has the right to assert Drake's rights, including his standing as a holder in due course, and also has the right to obtain Drake's signature. Is, was Drake a holder in due course? Yes. Hunt is taking not as a holder in due course, but under a holder in due course. And since Drake had the special signature, Hunt has the right to obtain Drake's signature. Maybe the easiest way to have answered this question was to work by process of elimination, focusing on the criteria for a holder in due course and the transfer rules. Turning to problem number 19. Here we have Bond fraudulently inducing Teal to make a note payable to Wilk, to whom Bond was indebted. So Bond was indebted to Wilk, but he's fraudulently induced. Bond delivers the note to Wilk. Wilk negotiates the, the instrument to Monk, who purchased it with knowledge of the fraud after it was overdue. Question, if Wilk, qualifies, if Wilk qualified as a holder in due course, which of the following statements is correct? Monk has the standing of a holder in due course through Wilk. That's the correct answer. He's not a holder in due, Monk is not a holder in due course, but he can exert the rights coming through Wilk. Teal can successfully assert the defense of fraud in the inducement against Monk. Teal can't. Uh, Teal can effectively make that argument, but it's not good against a holder in due course or one who takes under a holder in due course. So B is the incorrect answer. Monk personally qualifies as a holder in due course. As we said, no, he does not. He is taking under the holder in due course, which was Wilk. The reason being, Monk already knew about the problems and the debt was already overdue. So he can't meet the knowledge criteria. Teal can successfully assert the defense of fraud in the inducement against Wilk. Again, not true because Wilk is a holder in due course. Problem 20 has a rather complicated fact pattern, so let's walk through this one slowly. Rob, a miner, executed a promissory note payable to the bearer and delivered it to Dodson in payment for a stereo system. Dodson negotiated the note for value to Mellon by delivery alone and without endorsement. Mellon then endorsed the note in blank and negotiated it to Bloom for value. Bloom's demand for payment was refused by Rob because the note was executed when Rob was a minor. Bloom gave prompt notice of Rob's default to Dodson and to Mellon. None of the holders of the note were aware of Rob's minority. We're then asked which of the following parties will be liable to Bloom, either Dodson or Mellon or both or neither. Let's go back now to a couple of facts. First of all, Rob is a minor. Did he execute a negotiable instrument? Did it meet the requirements of signature, unconditional, promise to pay, and so forth that we talked about early on in the program. The answer is yes, he did. The problem was he was a minor and didn't have capacity to execute that. So that would be a real defense uh, against a holder in due course. Let's now take a look at Dodson negotiates the note to Mellon. Mellon endorses the note in blank to Bloom. Well, first of all, is Dodson liable to Bloom on this? And the problem is that when Dodson negotiated the note simply to Mellon by delivery and without endorsement, he only became liable to Mellon, not to Bloom as the subsequent uh, transferee. So 
While Dodson is liable to Mellon, he is not liable to Bloom. Mellon, on the other hand, endorsed the note in blank, negotiated it to Bloom for value. Now, Bloom, uh, so the question here is, does Mellon have liability to Bloom? The answer is yes. Dodson, no. Mellon, yes. If we look at our matrix, A, B, C, and D, only D meets that criteria. Dodson, no. Mellon, yes. So D, as in David, is the correct answer for problem number 20. Question 21. To the extent that a holder of a negotiable promissory note is a holder in due course, the holder takes the note free of which of the following defenses? Now we're going back to that uh, little mnemonic, the if-diff uh, problem, uh, mnemonic. And A, minority of the maker where it is a defense to enforcement of a contract. Yes, the minority status or infancy is a defense. Forgery of the maker's signature. Clearly, that is one of the I, uh, one of the F's, excuse me, I can't spell. One of the F's in our little mnemonic, forgery of the maker's signature would be a defense. Discharge or insolvency. One of the I's is a defense against a holder in due course. So C is an incorrect answer. Non-performance of a condition precedent or precedent. This is not a defense which will hold up against a holder in due course. The holder in due course is entitled to payment. Answer D, David, is the correct answer to problem 21. And problem number 22, under the negotiable instruments article of the UCC, in a non-consumer transaction, which of the following are real defenses against a holder in due course? Material alteration, discharge in bankruptcy, breach of contract. A little bit of review. The material alteration is a real defense against the holder in due course. The discharge in bankruptcy or the insolvency is a real defense. The breach of contract, as we previously mentioned, is not a real defense. So we're looking for one of these four choices with material alteration, yes, discharge in bankruptcy, yes, breach of contract, no, the clear answer, B, bravo, is the correct answer for 22. A, C, and D do not meet our criteria. We've now completed our discussion of commercial paper, and we've worked 22 problems in this area. We're now going to talk about documents of title. The entire program has been focused on negotiable instruments. And for the first part of the program, we've turned our attention and discussion to commercial paper. Now we are over in documents of title. They're not the same as commercial paper, but they follow the same general rules. So what is a document of title? It is evidence that a person is in possession, that the person in possession of that document is entitled to receive, hold, and dispose of the goods that are discussed in the document. Documents of title may be either negotiable or non-negotiable. And in our discussion here, we're going to focus on warehousemen and common carriers primarily. These individuals must exercise the level of care in handling the goods and the documents of title that a reasonable person would under similar circumstances. So what is a negotiable document and what's its effect? A warehouse receipt or bill of lading, these are documents of titles, they're similar, there are other items with similar titles, and it is negotiable, very similar to our commercial paper, if by its terms the goods are to be delivered to either the order of a named person or to the bearer. And as, as pointed out uh, over and over again when we're talking documents of title, we have to describe what the goods are. Quantity, 
where they're located, unique uh, classification or characteristics, if they have uh, serial numbers, these may need to be placed on the negotiable document itself. And of course, a non-negotiable document is any one, any document that is not a negotiable one meets all these criteria, and a carrier may deliver a bill of lading to a consignee as an example of a non-negotiable document. Negotiation is a key factor when we're dealing with these documents of title. And in order to obtain the rights of a holder, there either has to be due negotiation or the transferee must take under the shelter principle. If you recall, we talked about the shelter principle or a holder under a holder of due course. There's a similar concept uh, here under documents of title, the shelter principle. Negotiation is a form of transfer that makes the transferee a holder. Now, that transferee acquires title to the document, title to the goods, and the rights to the goods if they're not in the possession. So upon negotiation of a document of title, keep in mind that the transferee acquires title to the document, title to the goods, and the right to the goods, the possession of the goods. One of those phrases I just used was due negotiation. The transferee, very similar to a holder in good faith, must take the documents in good faith in the regular course of business of the transferor and for present value. The shelter principle focuses on the situation where the transferee receives the document of title. It's been delivered to him, but that document has not been duly negotiated. Therefore, under this principle, the transferee acquires only the title and rights which the transferor held. Now, when, an, when a document is transferred, the endorser or the transferor makes warranties. And when we were talking commercial paper, we talked about warranties. In the documents of title of the Uniform Commercial Code, there are also warranties. The endorser or transferor warrants that the document is genuine, that he has no knowledge of any fact that would impair its worth, and that the negotiation or transfer is both rightful and fully effective with respect to the title of the document and the goods that it represents. So you can see that these liabilities are quite similar to those that we talked about in the commercial papers section of our discussion. What about the duties of care and the risk of loss for individuals involved in these title transactions? Warehousemen are in, carriers are liable for damages for loss or injury to goods caused by their failure to exercise such care, and notice these words, as a reasonable person would exercise under the same circumstances. Now, the risk of loss. When title to good is transferred without the transfer of the goods themselves, so they're sitting in the warehouse, title is transferred, but the goods haven't moved, the risk of loss passes to the transferee along with title to the document at the same time as the document transfers. So the risk of loss, the title to the goods, the title to the document all pass at the same time. A carrier's duty of care and risk of loss, slightly different from the warehouseman. His duty of care is the degree of care which a reasonably careful person would exercise under similar circumstances. The risk of loss between the buyer and the seller depends on whether the contract is shipment or a destination contract. And you remember in your accounting classes you probably had some discussion about whether title passes at shipment or upon receipt free on board or destination charges. That's where the risk is allocated between the buyer and the seller. The common carrier is not liable if the goods are destroyed by an act of God or by the act of the shipper. For instance, improperly packed goods. The common carrier is not responsible in that case. But generally, 
uh, that common carrier does have liability to act in a reasonable, prudent manner just as any other individual would. A special and unique situation, something we call bailment, B-A-I-L-M-E-N-T. Bailment is not really ownership of goods, but it's possession. And the most common situation, you've done it 101 times, you go into a restaurant, it's winter time, you have a coat on. You take the coat off and leave it at a coat check. You are the bailor. You are literally leaving the property in the custody of the bailee. So they have possession of the property, but they don't own it. When the meal is over, you expect to get your coat back. The liability for the bailee is uh, for actions of others, not responsible if they can explain what happened. But if they cause it, then they are liable for it. So let's give a simple example. Your coat, and not only have you left your coat, but you've left uh, a briefcase that's got important papers in it at this coat check. Someone comes in and steals your briefcase while the coat check person is handling some other transactions, some other customers. If they can explain that it was stolen from them, they are not liable for it. Uh, so, but if you come back, they can't explain what happened, it's just missing, then they will have the liability on it. A bailey can limit their liability, but they have to call attention to that limitation. They can't just put up a sign and say, we're not responsible. They, first of all, they can't disclaim 100% of their responsibility. They can put dollar limits on it, but they have to call that to your attention. So when you've parked in a parking garage, have you ever noticed on the bottom of the ticket that it says, not liable for property stolen from the car or something along those lines. They are limiting their liability. And of course, they are supposed to call your attention to it. But let's be candid. How many times have you parked in a parking garage and on your way out, the person said, by the way, did you read the sign and did you agree to the little notice on the bottom of your claim check? Probably not, but that's what they are doing, attempting to limit their own liability. All right. This has been a very short discussion of several topics. Warehousemen and common carriers, documents of title, the limitations on liability, and bailment. The areas don't get a lot of attention on the CPA exam, but for some reason the examiners still manage to slip in one or two problems. So let's review a few problems now, get yourself prepared for the exam, and we will have gotten a full review of documents of title. We begin with problem number 23. Field Corp issued a negotiable warehouse receipt to Hall for goods stored in Fields Warehouse. Hall's goods were lost due to Fields failure to exercise such care as a reasonably careful person would under like circumstances. The state in which this transaction occurred follows the UCC rule with respect to a warehouseman's liability for lost goods. Therefore, the warehouse receipt is silent on this point, but under the circumstances, field is liable because it's strictly liable for any loss? No. There's no strict liability under the Uniform Commercial Code. How about liable because it was negligent? This is the standard that's applicable to the warehouseman's liability. Negligence, the reasonable care of an ordinary person in like circumstances. C answer is incorrect. It says he's not liable, but unfortunately, Mr. Field is liable. Since the warehouse receipt was negotiable, it has absolutely no bearing on it. There is liability on the warehouseman. And D says not liable unless Hall can establish that Field was grossly negligent. No, that's a higher standard. It's between negligence and strict liability, but the UCC title here does not require gross negligence. The answer is B, simple negligence, and field is liable. Answer B. Moving forward to 24, Bell Company 
owned 20 engines which it deposited in a public warehouse on May 5th, receiving a negotiable warehouse receipt in its name. Now, Bell sold the engines to Spark Company. On which of the following dates did the risk of loss, so this is the ownership shifting loss from Bell to Spark. June 11th, when Spark signed a contract to buy the engines from Bell for $19,000, delivery made at the warehouse. June 12th, when Spark paid for the engines. June 13th, when Bell negotiated the warehouse receipt to Spark. Or June 14th, when Spark received delivery of the engines at the warehouse. Remember, as we discussed previously, if there is due negotiation of the title, the document of title, then title to the document passes, title to the goods passes, risk shifts at that point. So when Bell or negotiated rather the warehouse receipt to Spark on June 13th, then that is the risk of loss transferring. Answer C, June 13th at the negotiation of the warehouse receipt. Number 25, under the documents of title article of the UCC, which of the following terms must be contained in a warehouse receipt? A statement indicating whether the goods received will be delivered to the bearer, to a specified person, or to a specified person or his or her order. The location of the warehouse where the goods are stored. Is it the first statement, the second statement? Do both these apply or neither? And I hope after your review of the materials and our brief discussion of this, you picked answer C. Rule 1 and Rule 2 are both applicable. The goods must be identified in a statement as to who will be, who will be the recipient of them, whether bearer or a specific person or his or her order. And furthermore, the location of the goods, the warehouse where they are stored, most, must be stipulated in the document of title. Answer C. Number 26. Under the Documents of Title article of the UCC, which of the following statements is or are correct regarding a common carrier's liability? Previously we talked about a warehouseman's liability. Now let's talk about a common carrier's duty to deliver goods subject to a negotiable bearer bill of lading. That's important. Negotiable bearer bill of lading. One, the carrier may deliver to the goods the goods to any party designated by the holder of the bill of lading. Two, a carrier who without court order delivers goods to a party claiming the goods under a missing negotiable bill of lading is liable to any person injured by the misdelivery. These statements are kind of interesting because one's a positive and one's a negative, but the correct answer you should have selected was C. Both statement one and statement two are correct. The statement may deliver it to any party holding the bill of lading. Why? Because it was a bearer bill of lading. And secondly, if the carrier, without a court order, delivers these goods or title to the goods to any person who just says, I'm sorry, we don't have the bearer instrument, but I am entitled to them, the carrier is going to be liable. Now, if there is missing documentation and the carrier were to receive a court order, then, of course, they would be exonerated from any liability because the court would have intervening, taken intervening action. As the problem is written, however, 26 should be answered C. Question number 27. Which of the following statements is correct concerning a bill of lading in the possession of Major Corp that was issued by a common carrier and provides that the goods are being delivered to bearer? So now, in this case, we're talking about a common carrier. Major Corporation is holding the bearer paper. So which statement did you select? A, the carrier's lien for any unpaid shipping charges does not entitle it to sell the goods to enforce the lien. This is not true. The carrier does have a lien uh, for unpaid shipping, uh, and it may sell the goods to enforce the lien. The carrier will not be liable for delivering the goods to a person other than major. 
Well, this one is also not true because if Major is holding that bear of paper, the carrier will be liable if he doesn't deliver the goods to the holder of that bear of paper. In other words, Major. The carrier may require Major to endorse the bill of lading prior to the delivery of the goods. Well, unfortunately, the carrier can't require Major to do so because it's bare paper. The carrier may very well ask Major to do it, but there's no obligation of Major to comply. So C is an incorrect answer. Answer D is the correct one. The bill of lading can be negotiated by Major by delivery alone and without endorsement. Why? It's bare paper, so Major could easily transfer that document to another person without endorsement. Our next problem, 28, asks which of the following statements is correct concerning a common carrier that issues a bill of lading stating that the goods are to be delivered to the order of Ajax? A. The carriers lien on the goods covered by the bill of lading for storage or transportation expenses is ineffective against the bill of lading's purchaser. Not true at all. The carrier's lien continues until the carrier is paid. So that will be effective against any purchaser of the bill of lading. B. The carrier may not, as a matter of public policy, limit its liability for the goods received, but for the goods by the terms of the bill. No, the carrier, as a matter of public policy, may limit its liability, but it can't completely disavow its liabilities, but it may put reasonable limits on its liabilities, and these should be spelled out in the carrier documents. C. The carrier must deliver the goods only to Ajax or to a person who presents the bill of lading properly endorsed by Ajax. Answer C is the correct answer because remember this document said to deliver to Ajax or a person named by them. So this must be endorsed or negotiated by Ajax. Answer C is correct. Answer D is wrong, but let's see why. The carrier would have liability only to Ajax because the bill of lading is non-negotiable. No, we know that the bill of lading is negotiable as long as it's properly endorsed by Ajax, and so answer D is incorrect. Number 29. On February 15th, year 2, P.D. Stone obtained the following instrument from Astor Company for $1,000. Stone was aware that Helco disputed liability under the instrument because of an alleged breach by Astor of the referenced computer purchase agreement. On March 1, Willard Bank obtained the instrument from Stone for $3,900. Willard had no knowledge that Helco disputed liability under the instrument. And here the instrument is a promise to pay Aster or bearer the sum of $4,900 in numbers, $4,400 written out. Maker may elect to extend due date with interest. And then it references a computer purchase agreement. This is a fairly uh, convoluted document because on the back we also have pay to the order of Willard Bank without recourse P.D. Stone. Willard demands payment from Helco. Helco refuses to pay the instrument because of Astor's breach of the computer purchase agreement. Which of the following statements would be correct? A. Willard Bank is not a holder in due course because Stone was not a holder in due course. Is that statement correct? Helco will not be liable to Willard Bank because of Astor's breach. C. Stone will be the only party liable to Willard Bank because he was aware of the dispute between Helco and Astor. Helco will be liable to Willard Bank because Willard Bank is a holder in due course. Let's go back. Although we're talking about documents of title, we have been talking about title, remember that we're following the same rules as we followed under commercial paper. These are all negotiable instruments that we're talking about here. The answer that is correct for this problem is D. Helco is liable to Willard Bank because Willard Bank is a holder in due course. What about our other choices? Our choice A, Willard Bank is not a holder in due course because Stone was not a holder in due course. Whether Stone was or was not is irrelevant. Willard Bank is a holder in due course, 
because they have met the requirements for that. So A is incorrect. B, Hilco will not be liable to Willard Bank because of Astor's breach. Breach of the contract is not a defense against a holder in due course. Answer B is wrong. C, Stone will be the only person liable to Willard Bank because he was aware of the dispute between Helco and Astor. Not true. Helco is liable to Willard Bank, as we said, because Willard is a holder in due course. Stone may also be liable to Willard Bank. All right. While we talked about documents of title, that was a little quick review for you coming out of the commercial paper arena into documents of title. Similar rules. We got the right answer. It's D. Question number 30. Hate to see these. Burke stole several negotiable warehouse receipts from Grove Company. The receipts were delivered to Grove's order. Burke endorsed Grove's name and sold the warehouse receipts to Federated Wholesalers, a bona fide purchaser. In an action by Federated against Grove's, and remember, Grove is the one whose property was stolen by Burke. Grove will prevail because Burke cannot validly negotiate the warehouse receipts. That's your A choice. B choice. Grove will prevail because the warehouser must be notified before any valid negotiation of a warehouse receipt is effective. Federated will prevail because the warehouse receipts were converted to bearer instruments by Burke's endorsement. Federated will prevail because it took the negotiable warehouse receipts as a bona fide purchaser for value. Answer D. The correct answer here is A. Grove will prevail. Grove was the victim of the stolen property. Burke could not validly negotiate the warehouse receipts. Answer B. Grove will prevail because the warehouser must be notified. That's nonsense. Warehousers don't have to be notified for the valid negotiation of a warehouse receipt. Federated can't prevail under either C or D because Grove was the victim of this threat, theft and Burke has made a forgery here. So C and D are wrong. A is the correct answer. Number 31. Under the UCC, a warehouse receipt is negotiable if by its terms the goods are to be delivered to bearer or to the order of a named person. B, will not be negotiable if it contains a contractual limitation on the warehouser's liability. C, may qualify as both a negotiable warehouse receipt and negotiable commercial paper if the instrument is payable either in cash or by the delivery of goods. D, may be issued only by a bonded and licensed warehouser, houseman. Question 31 may be the easiest of all the questions that we've been through thus far. The answer is clearly A, and think back to what is a negotiable instrument. One of the criteria is that they be delivered to a bearer or to the order of a named person. A is clearly correct. Will not be negotiable if it contains a contractual liability. No, we've said over and over again that you could limit uh, your liability. You can't simply absolve yourself of any liability. May qualify as a negotiable warehouse receipt and a commercial paper? No. If you remember when we talked about the somebody requirements of commercial paper, it had to be payable in money. The delivery of goods will not do. Cannot be a C. D. May be issued only by a bonded and licensed warehouser? No. Warehouse receipts can be issued by any warehouser. They don't have to be bonded or licensed. Although, as a practical matter, you would want to deal with a bonded and licensed warehouser. And our last question, number 32, under the UCC, bill of lading. A bill of lading, A, will never be enforceable if altered. B, is issued by a consignee of goods. Will never be negotiable unless it is endorsed. D, is negotiable if the goods are to be delivered to bearer. Well. A, B, and C are wrong. D is the correct answer. Now let's see why. Under the UCC, a bill of lading will never be enforceable if altered. 
No, it could be altered by the, by the parties. Then we have to look to whether we have a holder, a holder in due course, what are the rights and liabilities. But it could be enforceable. Is issued by a consignee of goods. No, a consignee certainly can issue a bill of lading. As a matter of fact, that usually is who issues a bill of lading. C, will never be ne negotiable unless it's endorsed. A bill of lading can be a bearer instrument, and that does not require an endorsement. C is wrong. D, is negotiable if the goods are be delivered to the bearer? Absolutely, positively, D is the answer for 32. Our 10 questions on documents of title. On this hot spot, we've tried to cover negotiable instruments in two different sections, commercial paper and documents of title. The issues surrounding negotiable instruments are fairly complex. They are the area of a whole law school class in and of itself. But for purposes of the CPA exam, you need to focus on two or three key points. And for these, there are three sort of acronyms or mnemonics that will help. The first of these is the elements of negotiability. The examiners, when they draft these questions, focus a great deal on whether or not instruments, whether they be commercial paper or documents of title, are negotiable. And let's focus on the six elements of negotiability. Sumbod, S-U-M-B-O-D. The document must be signed. There are many ways it can be signed, and we discuss those, whether in ink, pre-printed, uh, typed, it doesn't make any difference, but the document must be signed. The document must have an unconditional promise to pay. It may reference collateral. It may say where funds are coming from. There are a number of annotations that can be put with the document as long as the payment requirement is unconditional. Subject to is a condition. So if you see the words subject to in a problem, you probably do not have a negotiable instrument. The M focuses on the word money. Not goods, not services, money. We're talking currency, whether American currency or foreign currency. So the money component is an element of negotiability. Next, with the exception of checks, uh, the instrument must be payable to the bearer or to order. B and O from somebody. These are key words. Pay to the bearer, in which case it is bearer paper, and simply is transferred by delivery of the document. Or paid to the order of, in which case that property is transferred by endorsement and delivery. So again, for problems that you see on the exam, Bearer paper, you only need possession of it. Order paper, you need both endorsement and possession. The sixth and final element of some bod in the elements of negotiability is demand or definite time. Remember we said that if a document does not have a date certain on it, then it's a demand document. The demand or definite time must be ascertainable by the holder of the instrument. An instrument can be predated or antedated. It can have an acceleration clause or a definite deferral clause. The only requirement is that you must be able to figure out when the instrument becomes due. So if nothing else, the night before you go in to take the law part of the exam, sit there at night and do your mantra of sumbod. Remember, signed, unconditional, money payable to bearer or order at a demand or definite time. The second mnemonic to remember is the keys to becoming a holder in due course. And remember with negotiable instruments, a holder in due course stands in a very high position. 
this individual who becomes a holder of a document and a holder in due course may have greater rights and protections than even the transferor of a negotiable instrument. What do you have to have? The person must be a holder of the instrument, must have possession of it. The holder, in addition, must be holding negotiable paper. We know about that already. There are three other elements. You'll remember them as V, F, W. The holder must take for value, present value, not future value, but it could be for an antecedent debt. So they must give up, must give present value to get this negotiable instrument. They must take the instrument in good faith, with no knowledge of wrongdoing on behalf of either the transferor or the maker. And they must take without notice, no missing signatures, other required items. The instrument could not have already become due because then they would have notice, notice that there was a missing element. It had not been paid on time. So for a holder in due course, you must become a holder of a negotiable instrument and take for value, V, in good faith, F, without notice, W. In that case, you will have holder in due course down cold. Also remember, with respect to a holder, someone can also take from a holder in due course and not give value, good faith, or without notice. Miss one of those last three elements and still be a holder under a holder in due course. The third item we wish you to remember in mnemonics is IFMIF. These are the real defenses that can be held against a holder in due course because a holder in due course takes free of personal defenses but cannot take an instrument if there are real defenses, sometimes called universal defenses. So let's take a look at if MIF, I, infancy. So if the maker of the instrument is a minor, has not uh, met the state's rules with re respect to adulthood, that's a real defense. F, forgery. Easy to remember. Forgeries are a real defense against a holder in due course. A material alteration of the document is a real defense against a holder in due course. That's the M of IFMIF. The second I actually has buried in it three I's. Illegality, insanity, or insolvency. So when you see a problem that talks about the maker of the instrument has been declared bankrupt, you know that you have a universal or real defense against a holder in due course. The second F, the final part of this mnemonic, is fraud in the execution. If the document is executed in the manner with fraud involved in it, this is a real defense against the holder in due course. If myth being our third mnemonic. Now as you go into the exam, read the problems carefully. The examiners are most focused on questions of is a document negotiable or non-negotiable? And so you'll need the elements of negotiability. They will talk about holders and whether someone has become a holder in due course and what rights may be imposed against, what rights may be enforced, excuse me, against such a holder in due course. The last area on which there may be some testing questions, maybe more than one, will be the nature of signatures and endorsements. Blank endorsements, special endorsements, restrictive endorsements. And what does this give rise to, whether it be order paper or bearer paper? Remember, order paper requires endorsement and possession. Bearer paper only requires possession of the paper. The last rule and my parting words here are, if a document is negotiable, it is always negotiable.
Nothing subsequent will change the fact it's a negotiable instrument. If, on its face, the instrument is non-negotiable, nothing can make it negotiable. With these mnemonics, with this review, you are well set for part of the law section of the CPA exam. Good luck. Welcome to CPA Ready, comprehensive review materials for the computer-based CPA exam that lets you customize your own review program to meet your individual learning style and ensure your success. Thank you for selecting this hotspot video, which contains a targeted, intensive review of the specified topic area. We hope you find this video to be an effective tool in your CPA exam preparation. BISC Education. Welcome to the CPA review of the Law of Contracts. When you woke up this morning, did you really think, in the course of the day, you would engage in any number of contracts? Actually, it's quite true. Although we sometimes think about a contract as a formal written document, it certainly doesn't have to be. It can be quite informal. As you drove to the office this morning, you may have stopped to buy gas at the nearby service station. You made a contract. You agreed to purchase the gas that was offered by the service station. In exchange, you made the payment for that. Thus, a simple contract was formed and executed on your way to the office. When you got there, your boss expected you to perform another contract. You had agreed to work in exchange for a particular salary. A contract is really a quite simple document. It is an express or implied legally binding agreement. It may be between two or more per persons and to either perform or not perform some act or understanding. So let's step back to the beginning of your day. There was a contract between you and a service station. They sold you gas. They offered gasoline. You agreed to pay for it. You got to the office. Again, another specific undertaking. You agreed to labor all day in your boss's office in exchange for a salary and hopefully a couple of weeks of vacation during the year. Now, the one to whom performance under a contract is owed is the promisee, and that person has a contract right. 
On the other hand, the person who must perform under a contract is the obligee, and that person has a contractual duty. We see, therefore, that a contract definition has several components, two or more persons, perform or not perform, a obligor or promisee, and the contractor who has the contractual duty to perform that contract right. As we go through the contract, we're going to talk about a number of terms, but the basic element of a contract is an offer, let's say made by your boss, and an acceptance made by you, the employee. There is a meeting of the mind and a contract is formed. Sometimes that meeting of the mind is documented in a written employment agreement, for example, but it certainly doesn't have to be. It can be quite informal. You can accept the job and work without a written contract. As we go through these contracts, both formal and informal, we're going to talk about a number of terms, and I'm going to ask you, in preparation for the exam, to remember a very simple acronym, a cold sip of cola. A cold sip of cola comprises many of the components of contract law. The A stands for agreement. As I just mentioned, there must be an agreement between the offeror and the offeree. The C, there must be consideration for the contract, some form of giving up a right, a detriment, in exchange for the contract performance. The S stands for a statute of frauds. We'll talk about this a little bit later in this review program, but essentially it is a requirement that certain types of contracts be in writing. Capacity, the C refers here to the ability of the parties to enter into the contract. Minority, insanity, terms like that can affect the capacity to contract. The O is the offer, really the first part of the contract uh, negotiations, which will ultimately lead, we hope, to the agreement. L, a contract must have legal subject matter. And finally, the last A is the acceptance. So I originally began talking to you about there is an offer and an acceptance leading to an agreement. Those are the first three key terms of a cold sip of cola. We're going to talk about the others in a minute, but let me illustrate the offer, acceptance, and agreement with an example. Late last year, my wife and I were interested in purchasing a piece of property up in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia. We went and we looked at the property, were very interested in it, and talked to the real estate agent who was handling the transaction for the sellers. The sellers proposed a price. I looked at the price, looked at the work that needed to be done on the home that was located on the property, it was an old farmstead, needed significant repairs. So we proposed a different price. We did not accept their original offer. And that proposed adjusted price was a counter offer. So, so far, neither the seller nor my wife and I as the buyers had reached a meeting of the minds. They'd made one offer. We did not accept it. We made a counter offer. The sellers considered our counteroffer, did not like our number, and proposed another number. Let's just give as an example, they wanted $300,000, I and my counteroffer said $200,000. They came back and said, in a counter counteroffer, how about two forty? dollars Now I have the choice, I can accept their counteroffer or reject it and walk away from the deal, or propose another counteroffer. My feeling at this point was this counteroffer from them at 240 was still not acceptable in light of the work that had to be done on the property. So at that point, we simply said, thank you very much, we appreciate your time, and we walked away. We rejected the offer. There was no meeting of the mind, there is no contract. Two weeks later, the sellers called and said, we would be willing to consider your counteroffer number if you were willing to go to closing within four weeks. They had revived the offer with slightly different terms, because as I said before, we had already rejected 
their previous counteroffer. Now I'm confronted with the question, do I wish to accept their proposed new deal? Thinking about it, we decided that yes, we could make the four-week closing date and accepted the offer, the new offer. Now we have agreement. The offer and the acceptance, a meeting of the minds. There are a number of other items to be negotiated in this process, but indeed we have formed, at least initially, the contract. Let's talk about some of the issues, the elements of an offer, the O in my sip of cola. An offer has three characteristics. One, it is seriously intended. And as I mentioned, the buyer had said, they had set an original sales price. That was their offer, $300,000. It was communicated. They had run advertisements. They had a real estate agent who met with us and said, the buyers are willing to sell you this piece of property for $300,000. It was definite in its terms, the third particular characteristic of an offer. It said, in exchange for $300,000, we will sell you this five acres of property located in Stanton, Virginia. They had met all of the serious characteristics of an offer. Now, you're thinking, I see offers all the time. There may be a car dealership that advertises uh, cars at particular prices. Price quotes, television, uh, infomercials, always making you offers. But are they really offers, or are they really an invitation to deal? Remember, the offer has three characteristics, seriously intended, communicated, and definite. Frequently, advertising price quotes are sent out in general to the public and are closer to an invitation to deal, to negotiate, or make an offer. They are not an offer in and of itself. The acceptance element of a contract also has three particular components to it. The acceptance must be unconditional. In other words, I have to say I accept the deal as you offered it. The acceptance must be communicated. I am buying this piece of property, had to get back to the to the sellers through their agent and say, yes, indeed, I accept your terms. I will do $250,000 or $240,000 with a closing in four weeks. And an acceptance can only be accepted by the party to whom the offer was made. So the buyers made the offer to us. We, as the buyers, had to accept those terms. Suppose I had said, I'm willing to do the purchase and close within four weeks, but I need to have this property subject to an inspection. In other words, it had to be approved that there were no termites, that the building wasn't falling down, something like this. Do we have an acceptance? Actually, what we now have is a counter offer because I have put a condition in here. The buyers have put the condition on, the seller now has literally a counter offer back to them. I have agreed to their $240,000, I have agreed to their four weeks, but I have put an inspection clause in there. They can now accept that conditional clause and now we have come to an agreement, a meeting of the minds. All of the basic terms have to be agreed to by both parties in order for the contract to have been formed. Now, I told you that we communicated through their agent. Let's talk about effective acceptance. Most things in a contract are effective when they are received. In other words, the buyers got our word and the contract was formed when they received terms and conditions from us that they agreed on all of the specifics, and we agreed on all of the specifics. Generally, acceptance is valid if I send back the answer in the same method that was used to communicate to me, or an equally fast method. 
So in the particular case of purchasing this property, we had gone down to the property and talked to the real estate agent. She conveyed their offer to us verbally. I was attempting to accept the offer, and the way I did it in order to make an equally fast method was I then telephoned her. She had given it to us verbally, I accepted verbally, and then we confirmed this with writings and an exchange of emails. There's a big exception here, though. If an offer or an offer or the seller in our particular case says that the acceptance is not valid unless it's received, that rule applies. But the more general rule is, if I use an acceptable method equally fast, it's when I place, for instance, that material in the mail, if I trigger an email, something like that. When I send it, it applies. That's the mailbox rule. The acceptance is, the exception is, not the acceptance, the exception is if the offer or sets a different set of rules. Well, we've talked about three of the elements, offer, acceptance, and agreement. Let's move on now to three other elements of a contract, C, C, and L. The first of those Cs is consideration. The quid pro quo, the this for that, in other words, the price of the contract. In my example of buying the home out in the Shenandoah Valley, the quid pro quo, the price that I paid for the house, was 240000 So the sellers were expecting to get a check from me for the full price, 240000 and I was to receive title to the property. In my particular case, they got a check for some of that, but then they got the other piece of the contract from the mortgage company. The bank gave them $200,000, I gave them a check for $40,000, and the sellers walked away with the full price contract of $240,000. The second C, capacity. In other words, the parties to a contract must have the ability, under the law, to engage in the contract. Contracts that are made by people that have not met the age of majority, 21 or 18, depending on state law, those contracts are voidable. And we're going to talk about capacity a bit more a little bit later in the program. A person who has been judged mentally incompetent is not, cannot engage in a contract. The contract will be void. So we have to look at the capacity of the parties to engage in the contract, the second C in our elements. The third item I mentioned was an L, legal subject matter. A contract cannot be made in violation of the law or against public policy. In other words, I could not have a valid contract if I signed an agreement with someone that says, for, in exchange for $1,000, I want you to destroy my neighbor's car. Violation of public policy, it is a crime. There is no way to enforce that particular contract. C, C, and L, consideration, capacity, legal subject matter. We can talk about offer termination, and I hinted at some of these terms a little earlier as I was going through my example. Once the seller makes an offer, the buyer, the potential buyer, has a chance either to reject or to make a counteroffer. A counteroffer is effective when it's received by the original offeror. A rejection is also effective when it is received by the offer or. We can also have a revocation. That is something that is done by the offer or. In my first two instances, a counter offer or a rejection, that was done by the potential buyer. When we switch over to revocation, this is where the offer or withdraws his offer, and it can be done any time before acceptance, generally. And of course, you knew that you watched many of these programs. There are always exceptions to every general rule. Here's one of them. An option contract cannot be revoked. An option contract 
stays open for the term of the option. And what is an option contract? That's where the offeree, the potential buyer, pays consideration to keep the offer open. You've most often seen transactions like this in a stock market arrangement. You may have stock options or something like that where there is a consideration for keeping an offer open. In addition, a firm offer, which applies only to personal property, is that a merchant will guarantee, will have a written guarantee that the offer will be held open. This cannot exceed three months in length, must be made by a merchant, and no consideration is needed in this particular case. An offer can also terminate because of a lapse of time. The offeror, for instance, could say, I will make this possible transaction, this offer, good for 30 days. At the end of 30 days, the offer terminates without any further action on the part of the offeror. If either party dies or is adjudicated insane, the offer terminates. Obviously, as I mentioned before, we have to have legal subject matter for the contract. So if the subject matter is illegal, there will be no offer in effect. The offer is terminated. Here's a more interesting one. Destruction of the subject matter. This will terminate an offer also. Suppose I read an offer in the classified ads that a gentleman down the street is offering a stereo for sale. I'm interested in the stereo, but the ad reads, Saturday morning, the, I'll be having a yard sale and there's a, a large stereo uh, set up that's available. On Friday night, the offeror's house is burned and the stereo is destroyed. Obviously, the offer terminates because the material that I wish to purchase is no longer available. Finally, an offer terminates if the, the matter that is the subject of the offer is sold to another person. But this only applies at the time the offeree learns of the sale to another party. Go back to my house example. Suppose after I had made a counteroffer, the offeror rejected my counteroffer, and then another purchaser came in, was interested in it, and actually reaches agreement with the offeror buys the property that I was interested in but had only tendered a counteroffer. Once I found out about that sale, I cannot then accept the offer. It has been terminated by the sale to another party. We have talked about the elements, a sip of cold cola. We've talked about the elements of the contract. Offer, acceptance, agreement, capacity, consideration, legal subject matter. With these items, let's turn to problems 1 through 10, review those questions, and in a moment we'll be back and go through the answers of those first 10 problems. Kay, an art collector, promised Hammer one of her students, that if Hammer could obtain certain rare artifacts within two weeks, Kay would pay for Hammer's postgraduate education. At considerable effort and expense, Hammer obtained the specified artifacts within the two-week period. When Hammer requested payment, Kay refused. She said that there was no consideration for the promise. Hammer would prevail against Kay based on A, a unilateral contract, B, unjust enrichment, C, public policy, or D, a quasi-contract? Well, the answer is the first one, a unilateral contract. What do we have here? We have a promise by K to do something to pay if Hammer performed. So she will make a payment if he performs. This is a unilateral contract. A bilateral contract would be a promise for a promise. A unilateral contract is a promise for an act. A is the correct answer. How about B, unjust enrichment? Well, certainly K was enriched 
by this, particularly if she was not paid. But since we have a contract, the best answer is the unilateral contract. Is Kay's promise to hammer against public policy? No, it's certainly not. You can always offer to pay for something in exchange for a legal act. So C is clearly incorrect. D, a quasi-contract. A quasi-contract is when the court will infer or impute a contract where a contract otherwise does not exist. That's not the correct answer here because we do have, as previously mentioned, a unilateral contract between K and Hammer. The correct answer should be A. Looking at problem number two, Carson Corporation, a retail chain, asked Alto Construction to fix a broken window at one of its stores. Alto offered to make the repairs within three days at a price to be agreed upon after the work was completed. Would you make a contract like this? The contract based on Alto's offer would fail because of indefiniteness as to A, the price involved, the nature of the subject matter, the parties to the contract, or the time for, for, for performance. Well, let's look at each of these in turn. Was a price set? No, it wasn't. That's not set in the contract at all. That looks like it might be the right answer, but let's continue on. B, the nature of the subject matter. Certainly you could contract to have a window repaired. There's not a problem here. B is an okay. C, the parties to the contract. Well, here you have two businesses, normal course of business, nothing illegal about it. C is perfectly acceptable as part of the contract. D, the time for, for, for performance. Alto said that it would repair the window within three days. Perfectly acceptable. So B, C, and D are all acceptable terms of the contract. The contract would fail because of A, indefiniteness as to the price involved. In problem number three, we're asked the following. On September 10th, Harris Inc., a new car dealer, placed a newspaper advertisement. And right there, the phrase advertising should ring some bells at your head. That advertisement states that Harris would sell 10 cars at its showroom for a special discount only on September 12th, 13th, and 14th. On September 12th, King called Harris and expressed an interest in buying one of the advertised cars. King was told that five of the cars had been sold, so that's five out of its ten cars, that he should come to the showroom immediately or as soon as possible to negotiate on purchasing one of the remaining cars. On September 13th, Harris, the dealer, made a televised announcement stating that the sale would end at 10 p.m. that night, not be carried over until the 14th. King went to Harris's showroom on September 14th and demanded to buy one of the cars at a special discount. Harris had already sold the 10 cars and refused King's demand. King sued Harris for breach of contract. Harris, the car dealer, what would be his best defense to King's suit? A, the offer was unenforceable. B, it was an advertisement, not an offer. C, the television announcement revoked the offer. D, the offer had not been accepted. We've got several interesting answers here. Was the offer unenforceable? No, if it had been a true offer, it could have been enforceable unless it was revoked. But we don't really have an offer here. Remember, what Harris had put up was an advertisement to come in and negotiate on a special deal for one of ten cars. So we don't have an offer meeting all of those specified terms we talked about earlier in the program. B, what Harris said was an advertisement, not an offer. That looks like the right answer. But let's examine C and D. The television announcement revoked the offer. Well, the television announcement would revoke an offer, but we don't have an offer here. So be very careful when you see a question like this. Before you can have a revocation, you must have an offer. Yes, if there had been an offer, the television announcement would have revoked it, and C would have been an acceptable answer, but we did not have an offer. And finally, D, the offer had not been accepted. Again, we had no offer, so an offer could not be accepted. Answer B is the only correct answer.
Number four, Martin wrote Dow and offered to sell Dow a building for $200,000. The offer stated it would expire 30 days from April 1st. So here the offeror is putting an automatic termination date in his offer. Martin changed his mind and did, does not wish to be bound by his offer. If a legal dispute arises between the parties regarding whether there has been a valid acceptance of the offer, which of the following statements would be correct? A. The offer cannot be legally withdrawn for the stated period of time. The offer will not expire before the 30 days, even if Martin sells the property to a third person and notifies Dow. C. If Dow categorically rejects the offer on April 10th, remember the offer was made on April 1st and was to remain open for 30 days, Dow cannot validly accept within the remaining stated period of time. Or D. If Dow phoned Martin on May 3rd, and unequivocally accepted the offer, a contract would be created, provided that Dow had no notice of withdrawal of the offer. We have four fairly comprehensive answers, but only one of them is correct. Answer A is incorrect. The officer cannot be, can, is incorrect because the officer could be withdrawn before the stated period of time. There is no option. There is no consideration in here to keep the offer open. So an offeree can always withdraw his offer. A is incorrect. The offer will not expire before the 30 days, even if Martin sells the property to a third person. Absolutely incorrect. If Martin sells the property to a third party, notifies Dow, that, that's it. The contract has been made with the third party. Answer B is incorrect. C. If Dow categorically rejects the offer on April 10th, now remember, he rejected it. So that ends the transaction. Dow cannot validly accept within the remaining period of time. Once rejected, it is rejected. So answer C is the correct answer here. And I'm going to expound on that in just one moment after we look at D. If Dow phoned Martin on May 3rd and accepted the offer, the offer would be create the contract would be created. This is incorrect because the offer terminated on April 30th by the offering that had originally been stated by Martin. So D is incorrect. Let's go back to C and just expound on that one second. If you remember when I talked about my Shenandoah transaction, I said I made a counter offer which the offeree rejected. We walked away. And then the offeror came back and said, I will consider your counter offer. That's a little bit different than the situation with C, because what happened in my case is the offeror revived his offer, put a new offer on the table, and now I could accept that. In this particular case, if Dow rejects, it's over, and he cannot revitalize the original offer. So C is the correct answer to problem number four. On June 15th, year one, Alpha Inc contracted with Delta Manufacturing to buy a vacant parcel of land that Delta owned. Alpha intended to build a distribution warehouse because it was, its location was near a major highway. The contract stated, Alpha's obligation hereunder are subject to the vacant parcel being rezoned to commercial classification by July 31, year two. Which of the following statements is correct? So there is a condition in here for rezoning. Answer A, if the parcel is not rezoned by July 31st and Alpha refuses to purchase it, Alpha would not be in breach of contract. B, if the parcel is rezoned by July 31st and Alpha refuses to purchase it, Delta would be able to successfully sue Alpha for specific performance. C, the contract is not binding on either party because Alpha's performance is conditional. D. If the parcel is rezoned by July 31st and Delta refuses to sell it, Delta's breach would not discharge Alpha's ob obligation from tendering payment. Boy, there's some complex answers here, aren't there? Well, first, assume the parcel is not rezoned by July 31st. 
Alpha refuses to purchase it. Would it be in breach of contract? The answer is no. This is the correct answer. There is a condition, but both parties agreed to that condition and Delta was attempting to get the rezoning. If it is not rezoned, Alpha does not have to purchase the contract and would not be in breach of contract. That is the correct answer, answer A. Let's assume that Delta does get the parcel rezoned. Alpha refuses to purchase it, although they are under the obligation because the condition has been met. Delta will, will be able to sue Alpha, but not for specific performance. Delta can get monetary damages, but cannot require Alpha to purchase the property. So Delta would be able to sue on the contract, but only for monetary damages. C. This answer is also incorrect. The contract is binding on both parties because both parties have agreed to the terms even though there is a condition precedent to the closing agreement. So the contract is binding. It's a valid contract. Answer C is incorrect. Answer D. If the parcel is rezoned by July 31st and Delta refuses to settle it, Delta's breach would not discharge Alpha's obligation from tendering payment. No, once Delta has breached the contract, Alpha does not have to purchase the property. Alpha can sue, however, Delta to perform under the contract. Doesn't have to, however, because Delta has breached. In this particular transaction, the correct answer is A. Problem number six. February 12th, Harris sent Fresno a written offer to purchase Fresno's land. The, officer in, the offer included the following provision. Acceptance of this offer must be by registered or certified mail received by Harris no later than February 18th, 5 p.m. Central Standard Time. So the offeror has set out the terms for acceptance. On February 18th, Fresno sent Harris a letter accepting the offer by private overnight delivery service. Harris received the letter on February 19th, a day after his terms. Which of the following statements is correct? A contract was formed on February 19th. Fresno's letter constituted a counter offer. Fresno's use of the overnight delivery service was an effective form of acceptance. A contract was formed on February 18th, regardless of when Harris actually received Fresno's letter. Answer A is incorrect. There was no contract formed on February 19th because Harris had specifically said how that offer could be accepted. It was not done that way, and therefore the offer expired and there was no contract formed on February 19th. Fresno's letter constituted a counteroffer. This is the correct answer. Fresno did not do what Harris said. Fresno is saying, in effect, I will accept, and it's up to Harris to determine whether he wishes now to go forward and complete a contract. Answer B, as in boy, is the correct answer. Fresno's use of the overnight delivery service was effective. Well, it could have been if if Harris had not specifically said how it wanted the acceptance to be made. Uh, overnight delivery is an appropriate and can frequently be used in transactions, but not if the offeror has set forth specific terms and conditions, which Harris had done here. C is incorrect. D. A contract was formed on February 18th, regardless of when Harris actually received the letter. No. It might have been possible through the mailbox rule to form a February 18th contract because that would have been when, Harris, when Fresno actually sent the letter, but for the fact that Harris had specified that he had to have acceptance by 5 p.m. on February 18th. Answer D is incorrect. And the basic rule here is you must comply with the terms and conditions set forth by the offeror. If you do not do so, 
you may have a counteroffer, but you have not formed a contract. Answer B is the correct answer to problem number six. Number seven. On September 27th, Summer sent Fox a letter offering to sell Fox a vacation home for $150,000. Fox replied on October 2nd by mail agreeing to buy the house for $145. Summers did not reply to Fox. Do Fox and Summers have a binding contract? This is probably the simplest question we've come across so far. $150, $145. Do we have an agreement and a meeting of the minds? Answer A says no, because Fo we do not have a contract because Fox failed to sign and return Summers' letter. Not true. We don't even have an agreement between the parties. A is incorrect. B, we do not have a contract be because Fox's letter was a counteroffer. Here we have the correct answer. 150 proposed by Summers. Fox says 145. It is simply a counteroffer to which Summers can either terminate his original offer or begin further negotiations or accept the counteroffer? The answer C, saying that yes, we have a contract because the offer was validly accepted, is of course incorrect. We have no meeting of the minds whatsoever. And D, the answer is also incorrect. There is no contract. You cannot imply acceptance through silence. He would have to accept the contract. Answer B again is the correct answer to the Fox and Summers negotiations. Question number eight. Opal offered, in writing, to sell Larkin a parcel of land for $300,000. If Opal dies, the offeror dies, the offer will A, terminate prior to Larkin's acceptance only if Larkin received notice of Opal's death. B, remain open for a reasonable period of time after Opal's death. C, automatically terminate despite Larkin's prior acceptance. Or D, automatically terminate prior to Larkin's acceptance. All right. A is wrong. Terminate prior to Larkin's acceptance only if Larkin received notice of death. No. The rule is, upon death, the transaction terminates. The offer terminates. Period. So A is incorrect. B is also incorrect because at Opal's death, the offer dies. Same way Opal did. Death ends it. There is no reasonable period of time for acceptance after Opal's death. A is wrong. B is wrong. How about C? Automatically terminates despite Larkin's prior acceptance. No, this is also incorrect uh, because at the death of Opal, the transaction does close. The offer does close, excuse me. And D, as a consequence, automatically terminates prior to Larkin's acceptance. That is the correct answer. Answer D, automatically terminates prior to Larkin's acceptance. Number nine, a longer one. On July 1st, Silk sent Blue a tel telegram. Silk offered to sell Blue a building for $80,000. In the telegram, Silk stated it would give Blue 30 days to accept the offer. On July 15th, Blue sent Silk a telegram that included the following statement. The price for your building seems too high. Would you consider would you consider taking 75000 The telegram was received by Silk on the 16th. On July 19th, Tint made an offer to Silk to purchase the building for $82,000, more than actually Silk had offered to sell it to Blue for. Upon learning of Tint's offer, Blue, on July 27th, sent Silk a signed letter agreeing to purchase the building for $80,000. This letter was received by Silk on July 29th, which is before the expiration of the 30-day period. However, Silk refuses to sell Bill Blue the building. If Blue commences an action against Silk for breach of contract, Blue will win because he effectively accepted Silk's offer by July 1st, B, 
when because Silk was obligated to keep the, op the offer open for the 30-day period, lose because Blue sent the July 15th telegram, or lose because Blue used an unauthorized means of communication. All right, let's look at these in reverse order this time. Answer D. Would Blue lose because he used an unauthorized means of communication? No, absolutely not. He could use any means of communication here because Silk did not set forth criteria as to how he had to respond. Lose because Blue Silk sent the July 15th telegram. Again, this is not a problem because although he said uh, he was asking if Silk would accept $75,000, that was perfectly an acceptable thing to do. The telegram was an acceptable means of sending the communication. D is wrong. C is wrong. How about B? Do you think Blue will win because Silk was obligated to keep the offer open for the 30-day period? This answer is incorrect. Why? Because an offer can always be withdrawn unless it is an option, and an option requires consideration. In this particular case, Silk had simply said he would keep it open for 30 days, but there was no option period, and it could be closed. We've ruled out D and C and B. What about A? Blue will win an action for breach of contract because Blue effectively accepted Silk's offer of July 1. Yes, he did. He accepted the offer to Silk by saying he would agree to purchase the building for $80,000. The answer to this, by working through the four choices, we eliminate D, we eliminate C, we eliminate B. The correct answer, A, Blue did effectively accept Silk's offer of July 1st, and that is the correct answer. Last problem for this segment deals with the president of Deal Corporation, who wrote to Boyd offering to sell the Deal factory for $300,000. The offer was sent to Deal on June 5th and received by Boyd on June 9th, the officer state the offer. Excuse me. The offer stated it would remain open until December the 20th. The offer constitutes an enforceable option. Answer A. Answer B. May be revoked by deal at any time prior to Boyd's acceptance. C. Is a firm offer under the UCC, but will be irrevocable for only three months. D, is a firm offer under the UCC because it is in writing. Again, this should be a fairly easy question for you. Let's take a look at those answers again, eliminate a couple. First off, as we've talked about enforceable options, we do not have an enforceable option here uh, because there is no consideration on it. It is simply the offeror op offering to keep the deal open until December 20th. Answer A is incorrect. It may be revoked in any time prior to acceptance. Yes, it is. It's not an enforceable option. The offeror has the opportunity to withdraw prior to acceptance. Is the offer a firm offer under the UCC? The offer is a firm offer under the UCC, but will be irrevocable for only three months. Now, the UCC is dealing with the sale of goods by merchants. This is the company offering to sell real estate it does not fall under the UCC as we're thinking about it in this particular case. So answer C is incorrect. And is a firm offer under the UCC because it is in writing? Again, we're not talking UCC transactions here. Although it's in writing, that's fine, but answer D is incorrect. It is an offer to sell real estate, not a UCC transaction, and answer D is wrong. The only correct answer to problem number 10 is B, may be revoked by deal at any time prior to Boyd's acceptance. Now that we've done the first 10 problems, let's move forward. Well, we've had our cold sip of cola and we now know all the elements of a contract. Let's talk about the classification of contracts. We can have bilateral, or unilateral contracts. A bilateral contract is a promise for a promise. A unilateral contract is a promise in exchange for an act. 
Let's illustrate both of these. A bilateral contract, a promise for a promise. If we go back early on to the program, I promise to work for you for a year at a salary of $55,000 a year. A bilateral contract, a promise for a promise. A unilateral, a promise in exchange for an act. Now you're thinking to yourself, wait a minute, wasn't Jack's promise to, to work for a year uh, an act? Yeah, but what we're talking about on the unilateral is a promise in that specific transaction right now to do an act. And the best example, for instance, is a reward. I promise to pay you a reward if you can find and bring back my lost dog. That is a unilateral contract. I promise to pay you in exchange for your act of bringing the dog to me. Bilateral, promise for promise. Unilateral, promise in exchange for an act. Both are enforceable contracts. We also can talk about executed versus executory contracts. An executed contract is one that is fully performed by both parties to the contract. An executory contract has not been yet been fully performed. It's possible that one side has performed, the other one has not yet performed. Let's take an example of an executed contract. On the purchase of my house at settlement, when the seller of the property and I and my wife as the buyer sat down at the closing, signed all of the documents, titling transfers, uh, executing the agreements, and then passing the check. I gave the check, both my personal check and the mortgage check, to the seller, and the seller passed across the table, title to the property, to me, then we have fully executed the contract. An executory contract. I may promise, for instance, to drive your car across the United States. And when I get it to you in Los Angeles, you will then pay me. What do we have here? We have, first of all, a unilateral contract because I have agreed to do an act, drive your car from Tampa, Florida to Los Angeles and turn the car over to you. At that time, then you will write a check to me in payment of my expenses and my time for bringing the car to you. When I reach Phoenix, Arizona, we have an executory contract still because it is not fully performed by either party. I've not delivered the car, nor have you paid me. But now I pull up in front of your house in Los Angeles, in Beverly Hills, and hand you the keys. You've not yet given me the payment, but I have fully performed my side of the contract. So my part has been executed, yours has not. I have not been paid. So we still have an executory contract, even though I have performed mine. Notice that the word is not fully performed. The contract is not fully performed, so it remains an executory contract. We can also classify contracts as valid, voidable, and void. And you're going to see these phrases recur in several of the problems we'll go through, and I'm sure you'll see some of this on the CPA exam. A valid contract is enforceable. In other words, it can be enforced against both parties. A voidable contract is a valid contract, but one party can rescind or pull away from the contract. Fraud makes a contract voidable. I don't have to, but I can void it. Finally, we have a void contract, which is never a valid legal contract. It is not legally enforceable. So look at the extremes. Valid is enforceable. Void is not enforceable. Voidable is enforceable, but one party can rescind. Keep those three terms in mind. The AICPA loves to test on fraud. We have a couple of acronyms that I need you to put in your learning little brain here and hang on to until you get through the exam. MSRID, M-S-R-I-D, 
These are the elements of actual fraud. The M stands for misrepresentation of a material fact. And note the word material. There can be misrepresentations, there can be mistakes in facts, but you don't have fraud unless it is a material fact. But that's not the only element of fraud. There must be scienter, S-C-I-E-N-T-E-R. This is the S in Ms. Rid. Scienter is the intent to deceive. In other words, I must have, in my mind, the intent to deceive you in order to commit actual fraud. In addition, there must be reliance. You must have relied on my material misrepresentation. I must have intended for you to rely on that misrepresentation. In other words, I'm trying to deceive you. So the R is you must, I must have relied as the buyer. The I is you as the seller must have intended to deceive me. And D, there must have been damages. If there's no harm, there's no foul, as they used to say in sports. Here, there must be damages to the party in order for fraud to have occurred. So let's go back through actual fraud, because in a minute we're going to talk about uh, the other type of fraud, which is constructive fraud. But right now, actual fraud, misread. Misrepresentation of a material fact, number one. See enter the intent to deceive the other party. Three, the R is to rely on that misrepresentation. Four, the intent to have the person rely on that. And five, damages or D. If we turn over to constructive fraud, it's almost the same. Mr. Rid. So we went from Ms. Rid for actual fraud to Mr. Rid for constructive fraud. If you'll notice, the M is, in the initial M is exactly the same, misrepresentation of a material fact. But now, instead of scienter, we have the reckless disregard of the truth. R is for reckless. The second R is exactly the same as in actual fraud, reliance. The I is the same, the intent to deceive. And the D is the same, damages. So in fraud, what you're really looking at are two different levels, actual fraud, constructive fraud, virtually all of the same elements, misrepresentation, reliance, intent, and damage. The difference being in actual fraud, I have the intent to deceive you. In constructive fraud, I recklessly disregard the truth. When there is fraud, it can be fraud in the execution. And in this case, we're talking about tricking you so badly that you don't know that you've entered into a contract. That's one type of fraud, fraud in the execution. And this makes the contract void. In effect, what the courts have said is you had no intention of entering into that contract. You were tricked. There was fraud in the execution. We tricked you into this contract. Therefore, the courts will not uphold the contract. They declare it void from the beginning. Another type of fraud is fraud in the inducement. Now here, the courts will say you have a contract, but this involves being lied to about one or more of the terms in the contract. So the courts again look and say, there is a contract, but it may be voidable. It's not void from the beginning, but it may be voided at the option of the party. The injured party has a choice. You can disaffirm the contract and be repaid the money or the equivalent for services. Disaffirm and receive your money back, in effect. Or you can go ahead with a deal knowing that there is uh, an inducement, a uh, fraud in the inducement, and sue for monetary damages. So here the injured party is given a choice unwind the contract or accept the deal and receive monetary damages. When we talk about fraud, there can also be something called innocent misrepresentation. 
the fraud elements are there except for the scienter reckless disregard. In other words, there is a material misrepresentation, there is reliance, there is damages. And so in this particular case, the injured party can only disaffirm the contract if there is a, an innocent misrepresentation. You can't sue for damages. You simply disaffirm and walk away from the contract. As we continue our discussion about void, voidable, and valid contracts, we need to talk about illegal contracts. Here, the, primarily what happens is you have an illegal subject matter of the contract. To do a criminal act or to perform an act which is against public policy. For instance, courts will not aid either party and some of the contracts that are void as against public policy are selling children for instance, or uh, monetary payments for adoption. At one point, uh, surrogate uh, arrangements were deemed against public policy. That's no longer true. Uh, agreeing to sell drugs, illegal contracts. Anything that is either illegal uh, as a criminal act or against public policy makes the contract itself void. The courts will not step in and aid either party. Well, how about a covenant not to compete? Because we generally think about if you induce someone not to work or prevent them to work, that may be an illegal act. Well, covenants not to compete are legal if they fall within certain bounds. They are acceptable in the sale of a business or in an employment agreement if the terms are reasonable. Anything that is unconscionable will be a covenant not to compete, which is deemed to be void as against public policy. So how can we have a valid covenant not to compete? It must be reasonably needed to protect the business. For example, when one company acquires another, you may want to buy out the owner of the old business and you don't want them immediately moving down the street and opening a competing business. So it's reasonably needed for the protection of the acquiring corporation. A covenant not to compete must be reasonable in time. You can't say, let's just give as an example, you can't tell an attorney, we're acquiring your practice and you can never practice law again. That would be an unreasonable restraint on trade. Now a reasonable time period depends on the facts and circumstances, but generally three years or less is considered a reasonable time period. It must be reasonable in geographic area. So I can't prevent someone from practicing anywhere in the United States. I could perhaps restrict them to uh, a portion of a metropolitan area for a period of time. Putting these elements together can make for a valid covenant not to compete. Let me give you an example of a situation I was confronted in practice a little earlier. A gentleman was a doctor. He was a pediatrician, recently out of medical school and a pediatrician in the Washington area wanted to bring him in to the practice. So this young man, after medical school, joined the practice, worked there for about three years, and then decided that he wanted to go out on his own and start his own pediatric practice. The doctor that he had been working for had proposed a covenant not to compete, and it said essentially you may not practice as a pediatrician within 250 miles of the Washington metropolitan area for a 10-year period of time. Clearly an invalid covenant not to compete. There was a reasonable, it was quite reasonable to protect the established doctor from having his young associate compete in the neighborhood. What would be a reasonable time period? Perhaps two to three years, but 250 miles of the Washington metropolitan area would take in everything from Richmond, Virginia, to beyond Baltimore, uh, almost up to Philadelphia. So that is clearly unreasonable in geographic area, unreasonable in time, would have been against public policy, and would not have been valid. In addition, when we talk about illegality, we have the question of licenses. Many professions, many occupations require licenses. 
and a failure to have a required license makes a contract void, even if the client knows that the individual does not have a license. Now, there is one exception, and that is if the license is merely a revenue-raising measure. But let's look at most licensing requirements. States will, will finally regulate you and give you a license as a certified professional accountant, a CPA, once you have passed the exam and met your uh, education and perhaps experience clauses. So failure to have that license would make a contract, if you were being retained as a CPA, void from the beginning. Real estate agents, if not licensed in the jurisdiction where they are selling real estate, will make the contract void. Contracts that states you're not liable if you're negligent, those are void as against public policy. These are not licenses, but the public policy is such that we don't want you to say, I'm going to see my doctor, and the doctor says, well, yes, I will, I will treat you, but by the way, if I'm negligent, you can't sue me. That exculpatory clause will not be enforced. It is against public policy. In this segment, we've discussed classification of contracts, whether they're unilateral or bilateral, executory or executed contracts. We've talked briefly about fraud, both actual and constructive fraud, as well as misrepresentations. Remember Ms. Ridd and Mr. Ridd when we look at the elements of fraud. We've talked about void, voidable and valid contracts. We've also mentioned issues dealing with exculpatory clauses, covenants not to compete, and illegality. Keeping those principles in mind, let's turn and work now problems 11 through 20. Let's turn now to problem 11. West, an Indiana real estate broker, misrepresented to Zimmer that he was licensed in Kansas under the Kansas statute that regulates real estate brokers and requires all brokers to be licensed. Zimmer signed a contract agreeing to pay West a 5% commission for selling Zimmer's home in Kansas. West did not sign the contract. West sold Zimmer's home. If West sued Zimmer for non-payment of the commission, Zimmer would be a liable to West only for the value of services rendered, liable to West for the full commission, not liable to West for any amount because West did not sign the contract, or not liable to West for any amount because West violated the Kansas licensing requirements. All right, the first answer is going to be incorrect. Zimmer is not liable to West at all, so he can't be liable to West only for the value of services rendered. In addition, Zimmer is not liable to West for the full commission. We we're looking really at C and D. Zimmer is not liable to West for any amount because West did not sign the contract. Well, that's not true. This is not one of those contracts that requires the signature. That's not the problem. The problem is D. Zimmer is not liable to West because West violated the Kansas licensing requirement. Remember I said that if you have a licensing requirement that is other than just a revenue requirement but regulates a profession, then the failure to be licensed in accordance with a state or local requirement does make the contract void from the beginning. So answer D is the answer to problem number 11. Number 12, which of the following would be unenforceable because the subject matter is illegal? Now, before we look at these answers, let's go back to early on in the program when we talked about the requirements for a valid contract. And one of them was that we had to have legal subject matter. So if the subject matter is illegal, we don't have a valid contract. Here, here are our choices for the answer. A contingent fee is charged by an attorney to represent a plaintiff in a negligent action. An arbitration clause is included in a supply contract. 
a restrictive covenant in an employment contract prohibiting a former employee from using the employer's trade secrets, and finally, an employer's promise not to press embezzlement charges against an employee who agrees to make restitution. Any of those look like either crimes or against public policy? Well, A is perfectly acceptable. A contingent fee is frequently charged by an attorney, particularly in tortious actions as negligence would be. A is absolutely acceptable. B, an arbitration clause. Very frequently in supply contracts you have arbitration clauses because the parties don't wish to have their disputes end up in a courtroom with all the attendant costs. So B is absolutely an acceptable clause in a, in a contract. A restrictive covenant, well, if it meets the terms of reasonableness in terms of business need, duration of time and location is acceptable. Here, a restrictive covenant prohibiting a former employee from using the trade secrets is acceptable. A, B, and C are all allowable provisions of a contract. But D, an employer's promise not to press embezzlement charges, that's against public policy. There is an obligation, a public policy regime that says criminal acts, as embezzlement is, are to be reported to the authorities. Such an agreement is void as against public policy and makes the contract uh, unenforceable. It is an illegal subject matter. All right. If we turn next to problem number 13, Miller negotiated the sale of his liquor store to Jackson. Jackson asked to see the prior year's financial statements. Using the store's checkbook, Miller prepared a balance sheet and profit and loss statement as well as he could. Miller told Jackson to have an accountant examine his records because Miller was not an accountant. Jackson failed to do so and purchased the store in reliance on Miller's financial statements. Jackson later learned that the financial statements included several errors that resulted in a material overstatement of assets and net income. Miller was not aware that the errors existed. Jackson sued Miller, claiming Miller that Ms. Miller represented, misrepresented the store's financial condition and that Jackson relied on the financial statements in making the decision to acquire the store. Which of the following statements is correct? A. Jackson will prevail if the errors in the financial statements were material. B. Jackson will not prevail because Jackson's reliance on the financial statements was not reasonable. C. Money damages is the only remedy available to Jackson if, in fact, Miller has committed a misrepresentation. D. Jackson would be entitled to rescind the purchase even if the errors in the financial statements were not material. Before we look at each of these individual answers, let's talk about a couple of facts that came out in the, in the problem. We do have material misstatements. We do have reliance on those misstatements. There are damages because Jackson did not get exactly what he bargained for. However, was Jackson reasonable in relying on those statements that were given to him by Miller? I think not, and I think as up-and-coming CPAs, you would have both trouble with Jackson's reliance and the failure to consult an accountant. So with the answers, A, Jackson will prevail if the errors of the financial statements were material. Well, they were material, but he doesn't prevail because it was not reasonable for him to rely on those statements, particularly after Miller told him that he wasn't an expert and he should consult an accountant. Answer A is incorrect. B, Jackson will not prevail because his reliance was not reasonable. This is the correct answer. Knowing that Miller was selling the property, pulled together the financial statements off the checkbooks, told him to have them checked, saying he was an accountant, Jackson's actions were unreasonable. He will not prevail. Answer B is correct. Let's see about C and D, though. Money damages is the only remedy available to Jackson if, in fact, Miller has committed a misrepresentation. Now, Miller did commit misrepresentation, but if we could find fraud, actual or uh, constructive fraud, because of the scienter or the reckless disregard, then Jackson may even have been able to rescind the contract. It could have been for more than money damages, but we do not have fraud in this case. Answer D, 
Jackson would be entitled to rescind the purchase even if the errors of the financial statements were not material. Well, I said if there were fraud, he might be able to rescind the contract, but for that to occur, there had to be material misstatements, reliance, damages, etc., as we talked about. Since these were, the answer talks about non-material misstatements, D is incorrect. The only correct answer is B, Jackson will not prevail because his reliance was unreasonable. Question number 14. To prevail in a common law action for fraud in the inducement, a plaintiff must prove A. The defendant was an expert with respect to the misrepresentations. B. The defendant made the re representations with knowledge of their falsity and with an intention to deceive. C. The misrepresentations were in writing. D. The plaintiff was a fiduciary in a fiduciary relationship with the defendant? Answers A, C, and D are incorrect. Answer B is the correct one. The defendant made the misrepresentations with knowledge of their falsity and with an intention to deceive. These are the fraud elements. This is fraud in the inducement, material misrepresentations leading the pl uh, plaintiff into a contract that he did not intend to enter into. It is not, Im not important as in A, that the defendant be an expert with regard to the misrepresentations. Answer C, it doesn't make any difference if the misrepresentations were in writing or oral. C is incorrect. And D, the fiduciary relationship is not required when you were trying to prove fraud in the inducement. D is incorrect. Only answer B, bravo, is correct for problem number 14. Number 15, if a person is induced to enter into a contract by another person because of the close relationship between the parties, the contract may be voidable under which of the following defenses? Fraud in the inducement, unconscionability, undue influence, or duress? Well, here we're talking about a close relationship with the parties. This is not fraud in the inducement because of the close relationship. Fraud in the inducement is the misstatement, material facts as we just talked about in the previous problem in entering into the contract. That is not what we have here as a defense. Unconscionability. This arises when there is an unreasonable or an inequitable bargaining positions between the parties. The courts looks at it and says it is unconscionable for this contract to be enforced because of the disparity between the parties. That's not what is true here either. B is incorrect. Undue influence. The close personal relationship between the parties may sway one into entering a contract because of that close relationship. In this case, the courts very often will void the contract because of that close relationship influence. Finally, answer D is incorrect because duress is normally the physical uh, threat coercion. Uh, it can be economic, but most often it's physical threat uh, or coercion over the party or members of the immediate family. So item D is incorrect. The close relationship should be the clue that undue influence, answer C, is correct. Item 16. Baker fraudulently induced Abel to sell Baker a painting for $200. First sentence, fraudulently induced. So we know that it might be voidable or even void. Subsequently, Baker sold the painting for $10,000 to Gold, a good faith purchaser. Well, Abel really is out in this particular situation. Is Abel entitled to rescind the contract with Baker? It's answer A. Can Abel recover the painting from Gold, the good faith purchaser? Answer B. Answer C, recover damages from Baker. Or answer D, rescind Baker's contract with gold. Well, here we need to focus on the transaction first between Abel and Baker, and second, the transaction between Baker and gold. Clearly, Abel was fraudulently induced, 
and should be able to set aside the contract with Baker. However, there is an intervening transaction. Baker sold the painting in good faith to Gold, a good faith purchaser. Therefore, the transaction between Baker and Gold stands. Abel is not able to rescind his contract with Baker. Abel is not able to recover the painting from Gold. Answers A and B are wrong. Gold, as a good faith purchaser, is entitled to keep the painting that he has purchased for $10,000. As a consequence, Abel cannot rescind Baker's contract with gold, item D. So essentially, Abel has only one recourse. That is to recover damages from Baker for the fraud in the inducement. Answer C is the only correct one. You have to take answers B and C, I'm sorry, B and D, and strike them because as a good faith purchaser, gold will get to keep the painting. Then we look to A and C, knowing that Gold gets to keep the painting, obviously answer A is wrong. Abel's only recourse is to recover damages using answer C. Problem number 17 asks us to prevail in a common law action for innocent, innocent misrepresentation, the plaintiff must prove. Now remember, this is an innocent misrepresentation. We're not talking about fraud. A, the defendant made the false statements with reckless regard disregard for the truth. That would be a component of Mr. Ridd. Remember, reckless disregard was the second item in, in that constructive fraud criteria. Item B, the misrepresentations were in writing. C, the misrepresentations concerned material facts. And D, reliance on the misrepresentations was the only factor inducing the plaintiff to enter into the contract. Well, Innocent misrepresentation does not include constructive fraud. Answer A, where we talk about reckless disregard, is not correct. The misrepresentations were in writing. If there are misrepresentations, it does not matter whether they're in writing or oral. Answer B is incorrect. Answer C, the misrepresentations concern material facts. Yes, to have the common law action for innocent misrepresentation, they must be material. Immaterial mistakes will occur all the time, but the misrepresentations must concern material facts. Item C is correct. And item D, whether it is the only factor or simply one factor inducing the plaintiff to enter into the contract is immaterial. Item D does not make any difference. It can be one. It doesn't have to be the only one. So answer D is incorrect. Only item C is the correct answer for problem 17. When we look at problem 18, which of the following, if intentionally misstated by a seller to a buyer, would be considered a fraudulent inducement to make a contract? Now remember here, we're asking for a material misstatement, fraud in the inducement. Non-expert opinion, answer A. Appraisal value, B. A prediction, item C. An immaterial fact, item D. We're talking about intentionally misleading somebody, fraud in the inducement, a contract that would be set aside. Answer A is incorrect. A non-expert opinion will not be constituting part of the fraud in the inducement. We frequently give non-expert opinions. It's part of the sales pitch. It's part of a transaction. It may be puffing. But as a non-expert, that does not con constitute a component of fraud. Appraised value. Now, when we're talking about appraisals, we are talking about a professional giving a judgment call. An appraised value would be a component if that is intentionally misstated and would give rise to the fraud. So an appraised value, answer B, is correct. A prediction. Well, what is a prediction? It's someone's non-expert opinion of what's going to happen in the future. This is not going to be considered a component of fraud. Item C is incorrect. And finally, an immaterial fact. Remember, of course, that when we're talking about fraud, it has to be a material fact that is misstated. Item D is automatically out. So in this particular case, 
you would have immediately thrown out item D. You would have tossed out A and C, their non-expert opinions, predictions of performance in the future, which is no indication. Neither of those would be fraud components. But misstating an appraised value given by an expert, that would constitute fraud in the inducement. Answer B, the correct answer to problem 18. Number 19, as we almost finish this set of problems, Bradford sold a parcel of land to Jones, who promptly recorded the deed. Bradford then resold the land to Wallace. And of course, we know by then Bradford didn't have title to the property. In a suit against Bradford by Wallace, recovery will be based on the theory of bilateral mistake, answer A. Ignorance of the facts, item B. Unilateral mistake, C or D, fraud. Well, this should be one of the easiest problems you ever hope to see on the CPA exam. Bradford sold the property to Jones. There was no mistake. Bradford knew what he was doing. Jones knew what he was doing. Bradford sold the property. Jones bought the property. Jones recorded the deed. There was no mistake. A bilateral mistake would be on the part of both parties. Both parties knew what was happening. A is wrong. B, ignorance of the facts. Again, both Bradford and Jones knew exactly what was going on. This transaction took place before the transaction with Wallace. Neither party was ignorant of the facts. Answer B is incorrect. A unilateral mistake. Did either Bradford or Jones make a mistake in the first transaction? Absolutely not. Bradford sold the property. Jones bought the property. Jones recorded the deed. Bradford pocketed the proceeds. No unilateral mistake. What happened is item D, Bradford fraudulently resold the property to which he did not have title to Wallace. So Wallace is able to recover against Bradford on the theory of actual fraud. Finally, the last problem in this segment, Mako Inc. and Kent contracted for Kent to provide Mako with certain consulting services at an hourly rate of $20. Don't laugh, you're going to get a higher consulting rate than that. But in this case, the rate was $20. Kent's normal hourly rate was $90 per hour, the fair value of his services. Kent agreed to the $20 rate because he was having serious financial problems. At the time of the agreement was negotiated, Mako was aware of Kent's financial condition and refused to pay more than $20 per hour for Kent's services. Kent is now sued to rescind the contract with Mako claiming duress during the negotiations. Under these circumstances, do you think Kent will A, win, because Mako refused to pay the fair value of his services? B, will Kent win because Mako was aware of Kent's serious financial problems? C, will Kent lose because Mako's actions constitute, did not constitute duress? Or will Kent lose because Mako cannot prove that Kent at the time had no other offers to provide consulting services. What do you think? If you think that Kent is going to lose this, you're correct. Kent will lose because Mako's actions did not constitute duress. Item C is the correct answer. Now you're probably looking at the screen and saying, but he was under duress. He was forced to take the $20. No, that's not true. Mako may have known that Kent needed the money was in a tight financial condition. But Kent had the free will to negotiate. He did not have to accept this agreement. Duress focuses primarily on physical threats or physical actions against the contracting party or the immediate family. It can be economic, but this would not rise to that. Kent had the option to walk away if he did not like the $20. He was in a bad bargaining position. Mako took advantage of it but Kent will not prevail. Answer C is correct. Let's look at the other three answers which we did not select. Kent will not win because Mako refused to pay the market price. Mako and Kent negotiated at arm's length for a rate. Therefore, Mako will prevail, does not have to pay anything other than what they negotiated with Kent. Kent will not win in item B because Mako is aware of his serious financial conditions. Of course, Mako was aware of it. They used it as a bargaining tool, but that does not mean that Kent will prevail. Item B is also incorrect. 
item D. This says Kent will lose because Mako cannot prove that Kent at the time had no other offers. That's irrelevant. Kent doesn't have to prove anything. There was an agreement. Mako got the consulting action the activities from Kent at the agreed upon rate. That's all the contract called for. That's all Mako has to pay. That's all Kent is entitled to. Answer C is the correct answer to problem number 20. We're going, now going to begin to look at the statute of frauds. And in order to get a full appreciation of what this is all about, we have to go back to early English law prior to even the settlement of the American colonies. The British Parliament enacted a statute, obviously called the statute of frauds, which requires certain contracts to be in writing. The concept of a statute of frauds has been incorporated into United States jurisprudence. And essentially what the statute requires is a writing for certain types of contracts to be enforceable. Now there doesn't have to be a single document. It can be a series of interrelated or interreference documents, but all of the major terms of the contract must be in writing. Such a writing needs to be signed by only one person, one party to the contract, but it can only be enforced against the signing party. So in many cases you will find that a statute of frauds type contract will be signed by both parties so it can be enforced against both parties. The one exception on signatures is sales contracts where both parties are merchants. As you prepare for the CPA exam, I'm going to give you another mnemonic which will help you focus on the statute of frauds. The following contracts require a writing and they can be remembered as gripe, G-R-I-P-E, plus marriage. Let's go through these mnemonics. G stands for the sale of goods of $500 or more. R, real estate contracts. They must be in writing also. The I in gripe stands for a contract which is impossible to perform within one year. Now, notice it's impossible to perform not performed within one year. So it's the impossibility of performance within a one-year time period. The P from gripe stands for the promise to pay the debt of another party. E, promise of an executor to be personally liable, the executor of an estate to be personally liable on a debt. So those are the gripe components. And I couldn't make a mnemonic with marriage, so we simply tacked plus marriage on the end. Contracts where marriage is the consideration, and I don't think we'll find this in America in today's world very often, but such marriage contracts must be in writing also. There are four notable exceptions to the statute of frauds. First, a contract that is fully performed by both parties, and if you remember we call these an executed contract, does not have to be under the statute of frauds because obviously it has already been executed and the party should have fulfilled the contract. Number two, a contract fully performed by one party when the other party is only required to pay money. That too is an exception to the statute of frauds. Number three, where the buyer has entered into land and made substantial improvements. Now this is an exception to the requirement of the statute of frauds, the real estate transactions be in writing. So if the buyer has already gone on to the property taken possession of it and made substantial improvements, that contract does not have to be in writing. Fourth and finally, there is a sale of goods exception to the statute of frauds requirement. Let's move over now to lack of capacity. Miners that is, M-I-N-O-R-S, those who are less than 21 under common law, or depending on state law, perhaps 18 or 19 years old, can disaffirm contracts, and that is most contracts, at any time when they are a minor. If they do so, the individual must return what they have acquired. 
In other words, if a 15-year-old goes into, let's say, a Best Buy store and buys an iPod, comes home with it, and the parents hit the roof, that child can return the iPod and disavow the contract. However, the seller may not disavow the contract. This is a power reserved only to the minor child. That child can, however, ratify a contract after reaching the age of majority. A minor cannot disaffirm necessary contracts. In other words, contracts that provide food, clothing, shelter, and in some jurisdictions, even some basic educational and medical needs. So a minor making a contract for necessaries may not disavow that contract, but may disavow most other contracts if they return the property that they have acquired. Minors are not liable for torts that arise because of such a contract. Finally, a minor cannot disaffirm a real estate contract. Uh, normally, you're not going to see a real estate contract made with a minor unless there's some kind of fraud involved. But in any case, a minor cannot disavow a real estate contract. There are other types of lack of capacity for contracting. Drunk. I know you've never seen anybody drunk. But if you do, do not contract with them. A drunk can disaffirm a contract, but only if they are so intoxicated that they did not understand what they were contracting to do. Nevertheless, this is an area where excessive drinking simply avoid contracts because the contract can be avoided. In the case of insanity, the contracts can be disaffirmed. In other words, if someone has not been adjudicated insane, so there's been no adjudica adjudication, the contract can be disaffirmed. This is somebody with diminished capacity, perhaps. That individual can disaffirm the contract. However, once a court has ruled on insanity, then all future contracts are void from the beginning. Where does this come about? You may see this most often in practice with senior citizens. There are a number of cases in today's world where as people get older, dementia, Alzheimer's begins to set in, and occasionally this will occur at a point long before doctors or family realize how much the mental capacity is being diminished. Uh, you'll see this sometimes with contracts to uh, extend telephone service, order things uh, on a subscription basis. Never, the individuals are capable of contracting, but those contracts can be disaffirmed. Once it has been adjudicated, the decision has been made, it can even be done by a medical practitioner with a certification that the is actually diminished capacity, a capacity that makes it impossible to understand the contractual arrangements, then those contracts are voided. There are mistakes which will be made. You and I have gone through our, our lives noting mistakes probably almost every day. Most mistakes have no effect on a contract. They're immaterial, they're not significant, but when there is a material mistake, not necessarily fraudulent, remember we talked earlier in the program about fraud, but let's just talk about a material mistake. If it's a unilateral mistake, when one part, then when one party knew or should have known about that mistake being made, the mistaken party can disaffirm it. So when you discover the mistake, a unilateral mistake, that party that was under the misunderstanding can disaffirm the contract. If it's a mutual mistake of fact, both parties to the contract didn't understand the facts, made a mistake, uh, then the contract is voided. So on a unilateral mistake, then only the mistaken party disaffirms. Mutual mistake, the contract is voided. There's also a concept called duress. When an injured party can disaffirm or accept a contract if they are under duress, they are forced into a circumstance where they had to make a contract. Uh, the person who has been subject to that pressure 
has an option. They can either accept the contract and sue for damages, or they can disaffirm the contract. Generally, duress is a physical threat, an imminence of danger to the contracting party or to a member of their family. In a rare case, you may be able to show economic duress, but that's much more unusual. I think in most of the problems that you'll see, it will be a physical coercion or threat of physical coercion. Finally, undue influence. Uh, contract is voidable. And the situation that very frequently comes up is a close family member. And the classic situation that we used to get in law school is changing wills when a person is uh, in the hospital or in hospice. The daughter, the son, wants to change the will to their benefit, uses influence on a vulnerable person. In the case of undue influence, the contract is voidable, again, by either a person who has been influenced or potentially in the case of a guardian uh, who steps in and recognizes that undue influence has been involved. So we've looked here at different requirements for the contracts. Statute of frauds requiring a writing. The statute of frauds, I gave you a mnemonic of gripe plus marriage. G, the sale of goods of $500 or more. R, real estate contracts. I, a contract impossible to perform within one year. P, the promise to pay the debt of another. E, the promise of an executor to be personally liable for the debts of a decedent. And five, the marriage contract. Those are the keys to the statute of frauds. We also talked briefly about mistakes. Mutual mistakes void the contract. Unilateral mistakes, the mistake of one party, the contract becomes voidable at the option of the party who made the mistake. With these concepts in mind, Let's turn to the next few problems in the text. There are eight of them, and we will be back to go through those answers in just a moment. Our first problem addresses the statute of frauds. Which of the following statements is true with respect to that statute? A, all contracts involving consideration of more than $500 must be in writing. B, the written contract must be signed by all parties. C, the statute of fraud applies to contracts that can be fully performed within, within one year from the date they are made. Or D, the contract terms may be stated in more than one document. As you go back addressing any question on statute of frauds, you should have the gripe concept in mind. And letter A says all contracts involving consideration of more than 500 must be in writing. No, gripe would tell you, and the G says all contracts involving sale of goods of more than $500 must be in writing. A is an incorrect answer. The written contract must be signed by all parties. No, the contract must be in writing, but it is only enforceable against the party who signed it. So one party to a bilateral contract may sign it, the other may not. It will then be enforceable only against the signing party. So the answer B is incorrect. C is a bit deceptive and you have to read it carefully because it says the statute of fraud applies to contracts that can be fully performed within one year from the date they are made. That answer is incorrect because it should read cannot be fully performed within one year from the date they are made. Read the questions very carefully. Little tricky words can mean a lot. Answer D, the contract terms may be stated in more than one document. As I mentioned as we were going through the statute, a single document is not required. Multiple documents that reference or are interrelated to each other may satisfy the requirements if all the contract terms are set forth in that collection of documents. D is the correct answer. Problem 22, on June 1, year 2, 
Decker orally agreed to guarantee the payment of a $5,000 note Decker's cousin owed Baker. Decker's agreement with Baker provided that Decker's guarantee would terminate in 18 months. On June 3, year 2, Baker wrote Decker confirming Decker's guarantee. Decker did not object to the confirmation. On August 23rd, year 2, Decker's cousin defaulted on the note and Becker demanded that I'm sorry, and Baker demanded that Decker honor the guarantee. Decker refused. Which of the following statements is correct? And now we're looking to the question of whether Decker is liable to pay his cousin's debt. Answer A. Decker is liable under the oral guarantee because Decker did not object to Baker's June 3rd letter. Becker did not, is not liable under the oral guarantee because it expired more than one year after June 1st. Decker is liable under the oral guarantee because Be Baker demanded payment within one year of the date of guarantee was given. So the first three said Decker was liable, not liable, and liable. Item D, Becker is not liable under the oral guarantee because his promise was not in writing. D is the correct answer. Remember that under the gripe formula, statute of frauds requires a writing if you will be promising to pay the debt of another. Decker promised to pay the debt of his cousin. An oral agreement, irrespective of the writing that Baker subsequently sent to Decker, does not do this. Decker is the one who had to sign under the statute of frauds for the contract to be enforceable against him. Item D is the answer to question 22. Problem number 23 involves a Mr. Nolan who agreed orally with Train to sell Train a house for $100,000. Train sent Nolan a signed agreement and a down payment of $10,000. Nolan did not sign the agreement. However, he did allow Train to move into the house. Before closing, Nolan refused to go through with the sale. Train sued Nolan to compel specific performance. Under the statute of frauds, A. Train, who is the buyer, will win because he signed the agreement and Nolan did not object. B. Train will win because he, took, he made a down payment and took possession of the property. C. Nolan, the seller, will win because he did not sign the agreement. Or D, Nolan will win because the house was worth more than $500. Well, let's immediately throw out D, sale of goods. The house is not the sale of goods. $500 is irrelevant. Answer D is clearly wrong. Now, we do remember that under our discussion of the statute of frauds, real estate transactions must be in writing. One of the exceptions to that, however, is that if the transaction occurred and the party entered onto the premises and made the down payment, took possession of the property, uh, it will be enforced. And answer B meets those criteria. Train made the down payment, took possession of the property, entered into it, and will be able to prevail under the statute of frauds. A is not correct. Train will win because he signed the agreement and Nolan did not object. Uh, that's not the problem here because he was trying to get Nolan to sell. Nolan did not sign the contract, so under the statute of frauds it was not enforceable against Nolan, which is who you really wanted to have the enforcement action taken against. And C, Nolan will win because Nolan did not sign the agreement. Uh, not true because Train entered into possession and had made the down payment. Answer B is the correct answer here. In our next problem, number 24, Abel hired Carr to restore Abel's antique car for a price of $800. The term of their oral agreement provided that Carr was to complete the work within 18 months. Actually, the work can be, could be completed within one year. Is the agreement enforceable or unenforceable? And our answers come down as A, unenforceable because it covers services with a value in excess of $500, dollars 
unenforceable because it covers a time period in excess of one year, enforceable because personal service contracts are exempt from the statute of frauds, or D, enforceable because the work could be completed within one year. Well, if you've kept the gripe formula in your head, you know that answer A is wrong because the $500 test applies to the sale of goods. Here we're talking services. So that particular provision of the statute of frauds does not apply. Answer A, incorrect. Unenforceable because it covers a period of time in excess of one year. Remember the definition here was that it was impossible to perform within one year. Although the contract said the performance could take up to 18 months, it could be done within one year. So this does not fall under the statute of frauds. Answer B is incorrect. C, the contract is enforceable because personal service contracts are exempt from the statute of frauds. Not necessarily. We do have a goods provision. We do have real estate provisions. Uh, marriage contracts involve personal services. So this is not the correct answer to this one. The correct answer really is enforceable because the work could be completed within one year. Therefore, it was not under the statute of frauds. The answer D is the correct answer to problem number 24. Problem number 25, on May 25th, Fresno sold Brosnan, a minor, a used computer. On June 1st, Brosnan reached the age of majority. On June 10th, Fresno, the seller, wanted to rescind the sale. Fresno offered to return Brosnan's money and demanded that Brosnan return the computer. Brosnan refused, explaining that there was a valid contract. Now let's talk about the minor. Brosnan's refusal is A, not justified, because Fresno is not bound by the contract unless Brosnan specifically ratifies the contract after reaching the age of majority. B, not justified because Fresno does not have to perform under the contract if Brosnan has a right to disaffirm the contract. C, Brosnan's refusal is justified because both Brosnan and Fresno are bound by the contract as of the date Brosnan reached the age of majority. Or D, justified because Fresno must perform under the contract regardless of Brosnan's minority. Well, when I talked to you about the statute, of, uh, about the minority situation, I said that the minor could disaffirm a contract, the adult cannot. Answer D is correct. Fresno is bound by the contract. Brosnan was the one who had the right to disavow it when he was a minor. So D is the correct answer here. Fresno's bound by his contract. Brosnan had the flexibility. So D is the correct answer. A is not correct because Fresno was bound by the contract, period. It doesn't make any difference about the ratification reaching the age of majority. In addition, Brosnan's, uh, Fresno did have to perform under the contract if Brosnan had a right to, to disaffirm the contract. Fresno must perform under the contract irrespective of whether Brosnan could disaffirm the contract. Fresno, Fresno is on the hook for this transaction. He can't get out. And C is an incorrect answer. Both Brosnan and Fresno are bound by the contract as of the date Brosnan reached the age of majority. Well, as we said before, Fresno is bound under all circumstances. Brosnan could keep the contract in force. He didn't have to disavow it uh, as a minor or as upon reaching the age of majority. So the best answer here is the D answer. In problem number 26, Carson agreed orally to repair Ives' rare book for $450. Before the book was started, Ives asked Carson to perform additional repairs to the book and agreed to increase his contract price to $650. After Carson completed the work, Ives refused to pay and Carson sued. Ives' defense was based on the statute of frauds. What amount will Carson recover? A. Nothing. B. $200. C. $450 
or D, $650. Well, what did the statute of fraud say about this particular transaction? It was a personal service contract. It was performed. There's no requirement that it was impossible to perform within one year. It was not the sale of goods of more than $500. It was not real estate. It was not answering to pay the debts of another. It was not an executor agreeing to be liable for the debts of a decedent. It was simply a contract to perform services for $650. The defense will fall and Carson will recover the $650 of contract amount. Answer D is the correct. A, B, and C are all incorrect. Problem number 27. Sand orally promised Frost a $10,000 bonus in addition to a month's salary if Frost would work two years for Sand. Assume Frost works for the two years. Will the statute of frauds prevent Frost from collecting the bonus? So remember, we had a requirement of two years of work. Frost has fully performed that two years of service. So the question is, can the employer say, I'm not paying you because we didn't have a statute of frauds contract executed? A, no, because Frost fully performed. B, no, because the contract did not involve an interest in real estate. C, yes, because the contract could not be performed within one year. Yes, because the monthly salary was the consideration of the contract. Well, there are a couple of answers here which might lead you astray. Let's look at the correct answer first. The correct answer is A. The statute of frauds will not prevent Frost from collecting the bonus because Frost fully performed. Remember that I said, although we have these requirements in the statute of frauds, one exception is a fully performed contract. Frost fully performed. He can collect not only his bonus, but the month's salary that were promised, that is the correct answer. The statute of frauds will not prevent him from collecting the bonus because it didn't involve real estate. We knew B was wrong clearly. C, could not be performed within a year? Well, it was true that it couldn't be performed within a year, but that's not the right answer because having been performed, it takes us outside of the C answer. And the D answer, because the monthly salary was the consideration of the contract, that's a red herring question, answer, and it should be disregarded. So you might have been a little bit torn between A and C, but A is the correct answer because having performed, the statute of frauds no longer applies. Frost may collect. And finally, question number 28 asked, Green was adjudicated incompetent by a court having proper jurisdiction. Which of the following statements is correct regarding contracts subsequently entered into by Green? So this is contracts that Green made after being adjudicated incompetent. A, all contracts are voidable. In other words, they can be either fulfilled or canceled. B, all contracts are valid. C, all contracts are void, or D, all contracts are enforceable. As we mentioned, while there may be mental impairment, a party with mental impairment can execute contracts which will be voidable, but at the point that individual is adjudicated incompetent by a court of competent jurisdiction, thereafter all contracts are void. So in this case, once Green was adjudicated incompetent, answer C applies, the contracts are void. A, B, and D are incorrect. The parole evidence rule is another concept brought into American jurisprudence from English common law. Essentially, the rule states that you cannot contradict a final written contract in court with either oral or other written evidence. So the court is presuming that once the contract is finalized, that incorporates all of the terms 
conditions, and agreements, and mental state of the contracting parties. It is possible to introduce evidence, parole evidence, that occurred after the initial contract. So in other words, if a contract is executed on Tuesday and subsequently, let's say Thursday afternoon, the parties agree to a change, that could be introduced. But something that was written on Monday prior to the contract being executed on Tuesday would be inadmissible. Parole evidence can also be admitted after the contract in order to clear up an ambiguity in that original written contract. Uh, if there's something that the parties agree they just didn't understand or there was a misunderstanding, that evidence can be admitted. Or parole evidence may be admitted that goes to the essence of whether there was fraud in the execution or the inducement to make the contract. But otherwise, the contract stands on its own. The four corners of the document are evidence of everything that the parties intended. That is the offer, the acceptance, the meeting of the minds, the agreement that all of the parties were seeking. So the contract th is thought of as the party's entire deal. That's the parole evidence rule, which we'll talk about as we go through a couple of the problems after this discussion. A second concept that needs a little clarification is something called beneficiary contracts. Generally, you think of a contract as having two parties, the offeror, the offeree, the party who is buying, the party who is selling. But occasionally, there may be other parties, a third party to a contract. And typically, there will be a couple of types. There may be a donee beneficiary, someone who is a recipient of a gift arising out of the contract between the two parties. There can be a creditor beneficiary. Uh, for instance, I could say that I will purchase my brother's business, and as part of the consideration, I will pay off a creditor that he owes. So a supplier to my brother's store, he's not going to pay him before closing out the transaction, in buying his house, his business rather, I will make one payment to him, one payment to the creditor. That is the creditor beneficiary, the party to whom money is owed. There is also an incidental beneficiary, one who really obtains no rights to enforce or sue under the contract, but simply benefits from the contract being made. If there is a breach of a contract, the two parties that executed that contract, one of them fails to perform, a third party beneficiary may sue either party, either the obligor or the obligee, to get his benefit. However, that third party beneficiary, whether it be a donee beneficiary or creditor beneficiary, can only get one recovery from either the obligor or the obligee. The incidental beneficiary has no rights, so of course, no suit is available in that circumstance. We also need to discuss the concept of alterations to an already executed contract. And there are three different terms and explanations that I want to go through with you. The first is novation. This is a substitution of debtors. In effect, a creditor agrees to release the old debtor and substitute a new debtor in the, in the place of that original debtor. We've talked about the concept of novation in commercial paper, and commercial negotiable instruments, commercial transactions. The same thing can apply in a contract environment. So the creditor could agree to release the old debtor and substitute a new debtor in place, a novation. Secondly, a contract can be rescinded. And rescission is simply the cancellation of a contract and returning all the parties to the position that they were in before the contract was executed. Some people will call this a return to the status quo ante, or where we were before the contract began. It's an unwinding, if you will, of the contract. The third concept is one of assignment. And unless prohibited by the terms of the contract, virtually all contracts can be assigned. 
What happens in an assignment is the rights to perform and the duties to perform are all transferred to, to another party. So the contract rights are assigned, but the correlative duties are delegated. Now, there is one exception to this, which prohibits an assignment if it would alter performance materially, particularly increasing the risk on one of the performing parties, or if it's a personal service contract calling for specialized skills. And let me illustrate this personalized uh, skill with this example. Assume the house that I just purchased up in the Shenandoah Valley earlier in our discussion needs some restoration work. And it's a historic old home, so I hire a carpenter who is supposedly very skilled in restoration work of colonial uh, woodworking. And he does all kinds of special carvings and period reproduction work. That individual is taken sick. And so he says, well, I'm going to transfer this to a good friend of mine who's another carpenter here in the valley. But that particular carpenter does not have the specialized skills that my original contract carpenter did have. He is not allowed to make that assignment because I had contracted for special technical skills and I would not get them under the assignment. So if there is an increase in risk to one of the parties or the specialized skills are not met, the assignment is prohibited. Just remember that in virtually all assignments, however, both rights and duties are subject to the assignment. So we have novation, rescission, and assignment. As we begin to look at the next set of questions, we will be focusing on the parole evidence rule, beneficiaries, both creditor and donee beneficiaries, as well as incidental beneficiaries under the contract, and the alteration concepts of novation, rescission, and assignment. So if you would now turn and work problems 29 through 38, we'll come back and go through those answers in just a moment. We're back with problem 29 now. On August 1st, Neptune Fisheries contracted in writing with West Markets to deliver to West 3,000 pounds of lobsters at $4 a pound. Delivery of the lobsters was due October 1 with a payment due November 1st. On August 4th, Neptune entered into a contract with Deep Sea Lobster Farms, which provided as follows, quote, Neptune Fisheries assigns all the rights under this contract with West Markets dated August 1 to Deep Sea Lobster Farms, end quote. The best interpretation of the August 4th contract would be, A, it was only an assignment of rights by Neptune. B, only a delegation of duties by Neptune. C, an assignment of rights and a delegation of duties by Neptune, an unenforceable third-party beneficiary contract. Well, let's strike D immediately, an unenforceable third-party beneficiary contract. This was an assignment by Neptune to the other lobster company, and it clearly is not a third-party beneficiary contract. Was it an assignment of rights, as in A, a delegation of duties, as in B, or both rights and duties? And the answer is C. Generally, an assignment is both rights, an assignment of rights, and a delegation of duties. C is the correct answer. A and B, focusing only on one side of that equation, are both incorrect answers. So, question, answer, C for question number 29. Number 30. One of the criteria for a valid assignment of a sales contract to a third party is that the assignment must be supported by adequate consideration from the assignee, B, be in writing and signed by the assignor, C, not materially increase the other party's risk or duty, and D, not be recoverable, I'm sorry, revocable by the assignor. Well, this one is a fairly straightforward question, and only answer C is correct. Number 30, answer C. Now, let's talk about why the others aren't right and why C is correct. A, be supported by adequate consideration. There is no requirement 
the consideration pass when there is an assignment of a contract. So A is out. A contract can be assigned orally or can be in writing. It can be signed or unsigned. So there is no requirement of a writing signed by the assignor. B is incorrect. There is no requirement that the assignment not be revocable. So it can be revoked. You can make an assignment and pull it back if you wish. D is an inappropriate answer. But we did talk about during the lecture that no assignment is possible if it materially increases the other party's risk or duties. Problem 30, answer C is correct. Turning to problem 31, where the parties have entered into a written contract intended as the final expression of their agreement, which of the following agreements will be admitted into evidence because they are not prohibited by the parole evidence rule? Now remember, this is a problem we haven't seen in this format until right now. Two columns, yeses and noes. So we need to go through both columns and find out where we can marry up the correct yeses and the correct noes. So our problem talks about subsequent oral agreements, the left column, prior written agreements, the right column. So can parole evidence be admitted to talk about subsequent oral agreements? The answer is yes prior written agreements? No, because we had said that the contract that's executed by the parties is intended to encompass the full scope of their agreements, and contemporaneous or prior written or oral agreements may not be introduced except under very limited circumstances. So the answer should be no for prior written agreements. If the answers are yes for subsequent oral, no for prior written, only answer B with a yes in the first column and a no in the second column, meet that criteria. Answer B as in boy is correct. Problem number 32 says that Mr. Egan contracted with Barton to buy Barton's business. The contract provided that Egan would pay the business debts of Barton owed, that Barton owed to Ness, and the balance of the purchase price would be paid to Barton over a 10-year period. So what we're doing in effect is when Egan buys out Barton, he pays off the outstanding obligations and then the outstanding obligations to Ness, and then the balance of the purchase price goes to Barton for his residual interest in the property. The contract also required Egan to take out a decreasing term life insurance company, naming Barton and Ness as beneficiaries, to ensure that the amounts owed Barton and Ness would be paid if Egan died. Again, we have a two-column format. We have to address the question, which of the following would describe Ness's status? Remember, he's the one who's going to be paid first under the contract and insurance policy. Is he a donee beneficiary, the recipient of a gift, or is he a creditor beneficiary because of a debtor-creditor relationship? Under both the contract and the insurance policy, Ness is a creditor beneficiary. He's not receiving any gift at all. With the answer being creditor beneficiary for both the contract and the insurance policy, answer D, as in David, is the only correct answer here. Problem number 33. Graham contracted with the city of Harris to train and employ high school dropouts residing in Harris. Graham breached the contract. Now Long, a resident of Harris and a high school dropout, sues Graham for damages. And obviously Long is saying that I was a beneficiary of this contract. Under the circumstances, will Long win because he's a third party beneficiary entitled to enforce the contract? Will he win because the intent of the contract was to confer a benefit, benefit on all high school students who were dropouts, including those, all those residing in Harris, that's B, or will Mr. Long lose because he's merely an incidental beneficiary, or will he lose on the grounds that he did not assign his contract rights to Long? And the answer here is C. Long would have been a beneficiary, but it was really incidental to Graham carrying out the terms of the contract. 
There's no creditor relationship. There's no donee benefit. It is an incidental benefit. Incidental beneficiaries do not have the right to sue to enforce contract terms. So Long is out of luck. Answer C is correct. He cannot win under A or B, and the question of assignment is irrelevant. Long was merely an incidental beneficiary. Answer C. Problem number 34. On February 1st, Burns contracted in writing with Nagel to sell a used car to Nagel. So this transaction is going from Burns to Nagel. The contract provided that Burns was to deliver the car on February 15th. Nagel was obligated to pay $800, not later than March 15th. On March 21st, Burns assigns the contract to Ross for $600. Nagel was not notified of the assignment. Which of the following statements is correct? A. By making the assignment, Burns implicitly warranted Nagel would pay the full purchase price. B. The assignment to Ross is invalid because Nagel was not notified. C. Ross will not be subject to any contract defenses that Nagel could have raised against Burns. Or D. By making the assignment, Burns impliedly warranted a lack of knowledge of any fact impairing the value of the assignment. Let me give you a hint in working these problems. Sometimes it's helpful to draw a little graphic. And here you might want to put Burns over to Nagel and then down to Ross and put little arrows as to what's passing back and forth. It might help keep the fact pattern straight. Once you have the facts clear, then let's go look at the answers. A. By making the assignment, Burns impliedly warranted Nagel would pay the full purchase price. Not at all. All Burns said to Ross was, here is the contract I have with Nagel. There are defenses back and forth, their rights and their obligations. You have whatever I have. So Burns made no warranties whatsoever. A is incorrect. B. The assignment to Ross is invalided, invalid because Nagel was not notified. Again, there is no requirement of notification in an assignment. Contracts are generally assignable without notification. The only exception might be, and it did not happen in this case, if there were terms or limitations set forth in the contract related to an assignment. Since that wasn't specified in the problem, there's no requirement for notification. Answer B is wrong. C. Ross will not be subject to any contract defenses Nagel could have raised against Burns. Again, C is incorrect for the very simple reason all Ross has is the same relationship with Nagel that Nagel had with Burns. If there are defenses that Nagel could have raised against Burns, Nagel could have raised them against Ross. Item C is incorrect. Item D. By process of elimination, we think this is right, but let's make sure we know why. By making the assignment, Burns impliedly warranted a lack of knowledge of any fact impairing the value of the assignment. And this is correct because when I told you in the first one Burns impliedly warranted, I said he didn't give any implied warranties about the full purchase price and payment. However, in D, Burns did impliedly warrant that he knew of nothing that would impair the contract. So all he told Ross is, you have what I have. That being the case, D is the correct answer to this problem. In problem number 35, we find out that Yost contracted with Egan for Yost to buy certain real property. If the contract is otherwise silent, Yost's right under the contract are A, assignable only with Egan's consent, non-assignable because they're personal to Yost, non-assignable as a matter of law, or D, generally assignable. Problem number 35 is your gimme question. We know that generally, unless specified in the contract, all contracts are assignable. That is answer D and is correct. A is wrong because there's no requirement for consent. B is wrong because this is not a personal contractual obligation, which is non-assignable. It's a real estate sale. The contract can be assigned. And there is no requirement in the law that the contracts not be assignable. The answer, in contrast, is they are generally assignable. That is answer D. That is problem 35's correct answer.
In problem 36, we're we'll focusing on the parole evidence rule. And it says, oral evidence will be excluded if it relates to A, a contemporaneous oral agreement relating to a term in the contract. B, the failure of a condition precedent. C, a lack of contractual capacity. D, a modification made several days after the contract was executed. Now, before we go through these four answers, let's go back and focus on the parole evidence rule. And it says that we can't introduce oral evidence about the contract unless it's subsequent to the executed contract. It clears up an ambiguity in the contract that the parties agree is ambiguous, or it goes to whether indeed there was a valid contract. So, the answer of lack of contractual capacity, answer C, does go to whether there's a valid contract. That oral evidence would be admitted, so that answer is not appropriate for this question. A modification made several days after the contract. That could be introduced under the parole evidence rule, so that's not a correct answer. Failure of a condition precedent. No, that's a fact after we were into the contract. That's not that's something we can look at under the parole evidence rule. So again, that is not a correct answer. The only correct answer to problem 36 is A. We cannot introduce evidence of a contemporaneous oral agreement relating to a term in the executed contract. That is the heart and soul of the parole evidence rule. That is the answer for problem 36. Now here we have another type of problem that you'll see interspersed throughout the exam and it's a one, two, both, neither. Let's go through the question. Which of the following offers of proof are inadmissible under the parole evidence rule when a written contract is intended as the complete agreement of the parties? One, proof of the existence of a subsequent oral modification to the contract. Is that allowed under the parole evidence rule? Yes, it is. Proof of the existence of a prior oral agreement that contradicts the written contract. No, that's not allowed under the parole evidence rule. So, one is allowed, two is not allowed. Go back to the question, which are inadmissible? The only one inadmissible is number two. That's answer B. A is wrong, C is wrong, D is wrong, B is in Baker. Two only is the correct answer to problem 37. 38 is another one where you want, may want to do a little graphic. Furco claims to be a creditor beneficiary of a contract between Bell and Allied Industries. Allied is indebted to Furco. There's a contract between Bell and Atlantic that provides that Bell is to purchase goods from Allied and pay the purchase price, which it would have otherwise owed to Allied, directly to Furco until Allied's obligation is satisfied. So you have a triangular third-party creditor-beneficiary arrangement here. Without justification, Bell failed to pay Furco, and Furco sued Bell. Now, will Furco not prevail because Furco lacked privity of contract with Bell or Allied? Is it possible Furco will not prevail because Furco did not give up any consideration to Bell? Or under answer C, will Furco prevail because it was an intended beneficiary of the contract between Allied and Bell? Or will Furco prevail because Furco was aware of the contract between Bell and Atlantic at the contract was entered into, at the time the contract was entered into? Well, Furco will prevail because it was the intended beneficiary. That contract between Allied and Bell said that the payment would come to Furco for goods purchased by Bell from Allied. C is the correct answer. Furco is going to win on this, and the answer C is correct. Now, D said for, that Furco would prevail because Furco was aware of the contract. It doesn't make any difference how that came about. Furco doesn't have to know about the contract. They were the intended beneficiaries. That was a contract term. Yes, they're going to prevail, but that's not the reason. So D is out. And A and B are wrong because, indeed, Furco will prevail Lack of privity, there was privity in there, 
and not prevail because FERCO did not give up any consideration. That's irrelevant because they were not a party to the contract in the contractual term. They were a beneficiary, a designated creditor beneficiary, and did not have to provide consideration to Bell. That concludes this set of 10 problems. We have a little bit more to go as we plow our way through a review of contract law. We've set up the contracts, we've talked about all the terms, we've discussed beneficiaries of contracts, uh, we've talked about impossibility of contracts. Let's talk about performing the contracts now. We expect a contract to be performed by both parties fully and completely in conformity with the terms of the contract. Both, both sides have obligations, both sides have duties, both sides have responsibilities. That concludes a contract when both parties have fully performed. But what about something short of perfect performance? And sometimes you'll hear the concept of substantial performance. This, however, applies to construction contracts generally. A builder perhaps unintentionally departs from a contract in a minor arena. Now the builder can still collect under his contract, but may be subject to damages for minor defects or shortfalls, the so-called punch list where they have to make corrections. Nevertheless, the builder has substantially performed in building uh, the building that you asked for, constructing the road. That is a substantial performance doctrine. The contract is completed and there is simply an adjustment for the minor defects or the shortfalls under the contract. What about the case where there is a contract for performance, a unilateral contract, and I'm going to give you an example of the woman who says, my dog has run away. I haven't seen uh, Snoopy for six days. I will offer a reward of $100 to anyone who brings Snoopy back to me. You think this is a good opportunity. You live in the same neighborhood. You know Snoopy. So you're out one day about six, eight blocks away from where Snoopy disappeared, and you see him. So you call Snoopy over to the car, jumps in the front seat, and you think, okay, I will now take Snoopy back to its owner. I'll collect my $100. Snoopy's got his head hanging out the window, just ears flapping in the breeze, having a great time. You get within a block of the house. Snoopy recognizes where he is. He knows he's close to home jumps out the car window while the car is still moving, not very fast, but gets away from you, runs home, gets to the front door, and its owner comes out and says, Snoopy, you've come home. At that point, you drive up and say, uh, I just found Snoopy. I brought him home. I'm here for the reward. And the owner looks at you and said, you didn't perform. Snoopy came home to me on his own, ran right down the front steps, right up to the front door. Are you entitled to compensation? Have you performed under the contract? Well, the contract said, I will give a reward for the person who brings Snoopy back to me. You didn't literally meet the terms of that contract. It's not a construction comment, contract, but did you substantially perform? You found Snoopy, brought him back into the neighborhood, got him close to home. I think you've substantially performed, and any court will probably enforce the contract for you. But this simply illustrates all of the myriad of questions that can fall out when you're confronted with a contract question. Is it a bilateral contract, a unilateral contract? Is it executed or is it still executory? Have you substantially performed? Have you completely performed? Well, we'll leave Snoopy's question for the courts to sort out when you see it on your first bar exam question. For now, let's move forward with other issues in performance under contracts. There's a phrase that you'll sometimes hear called specific performance. If one party breaches a contract, maybe you don't want damages. You want what you contracted for. Here the example I might give you is there's an oil painting that you've seen. You go to, uh, let's say you saw it in a state sale. Uh, you contract for it, or you think you have. You've told the person running the estate sale that you will 
take that contract, that painting, that oil painting, you need to go to the bank and get the certified check that you could bring back to pay for it. When you come back with the certified check, ready to pick up the oil painting, the estate, the person running the estate sale says, oh, I'm sorry, the owner of it decided to take it off the market. It's not being offered for sale. They've rescinded the offer. And you said, but I have a contract. I've already uh, gone and gotten the certified check. I want that particular oil painting. Damages are not going to be adequate. Well, here we run into the first question, can an offer be rescinded? Until it's been accepted, of course it can be rescinded. But by your saying to the agent, I will buy the painting, I want it, I'm going now to get the check to hand to you, have you come to the agreement, has the, con has the contract been accepted? And I think the answer there is, yes, it's been accepted. All you're doing is picking up the medium of payment. Therefore, you have the right to enforce the contract, and you don't want monetary damages. You want that specific painting. You don't want the money back. You think that's a great old master oil painting that you want to hang on your wall. That would be the time when you would go to court and ask for specific performance. It has to be unique property, and there isn't another oil painting like this. So here we might see a demand for specific performance. One particular point needs to be borne in mind about specific performance, however. You cannot use it for personal service contracts. If I've contracted with you to provide a personal service, let us say that I've agreed that I will prepare your will, powers of attorney, and health care directives. As we've talked, I've gotten more and more uncomfortable with some of the decisions that you want to make, and I say, I'm withdrawing from this engagement. Even though you've contracted with me, I do not want to provide these personal tax planning services, wealth planning transfer, and health care services for you. The other party looks at me and said, I demand that you render these services. I want specific performance. No court will enforce that. They might award damages for breach of contract, particularly if there's been reliance and consideration as would be natural in putting together this contract. But the reason they won't enforce specific performance is slavery. If you order somebody to provide a service, what are you doing? You are enslaving them. This is against public policy, and no court will enforce a personal service contract under specific performance. Let's talk about the concept of contract termination. How can a contract end? Well, most likely, and the most agreeable solution, is to have the contract performed in accordance with its terms. But there are other ways that a contract may terminate. And we're going to talk briefly about breach, breach of contract, agreement, novation, which we previously mentioned, rescission, which we previously mentioned, death or illness, and impossibility. There are two rules with respect to a breach of contract. The first is an anticipatory breach. The party on the other side of the contract tells you that I'm not going to perform before they are obligated to perform under the contract. And you have two choices. You, as the injured party, may sue immediately and say, all right, I've incurred damages. You've told me that the other party has told you, I'm obligated to perform. I am not going to perform. So you have been damaged. You may then sue for those damages immediately, or you have another choice. You can wait until the performance time arrives when that contract was supposed to be performed, and if there's still a breach, sue at that point. So upon notice, you may take the action, or you may wait until the contract comes available and at that point sue. If there is an illegal contract, of course, that's going to be completely negating the contract itself. The contract will terminate on those grounds. If we have a novation, we know that the existing contract between the creditor and the debtor ended 
and there is a substitute debtor in place with that creditor. That's a contract termination for the replaced debtor. The rescission, as we mentioned before, both parties agree to literally unwind the contract and put the parties back at the position they were in prior to the beginning of the contract. The parties can simply agree that they want to end the contract. There may be some payment or settlement that they work out, but by mutual agreement, the parties can simply terminate the agreement. In the case of a personal service contract, death or illness of one of the parties may terminate the contract. Frequently, if it's a minor illness, it will simply delay the contract, although the other party has the right to say, I need the work performed now. If you can't perform as under the contract, let's terminate it and I'll find another person to do the work. Uh, that's an option for them. Obviously, death in a personal service contract will end the contract. Impossibility to perform. If the subject matter of the contract is destroyed, I say that I'm going to purchase from you uh, the wheat crop, which will be d delivered next month. I'm going to purchase all of the wheat that's coming from your 14 acres of agricultural ground. Just before you're ready to harvest, the locusts come in and decimate the wheat crop. There is no wheat to be sold to me. You cannot perform the contract. It is impossible. Therefore, there's a contract termination. It may also be possible that there is a contract termination under either the impossibility or the illegality clause by government action. Suppose, for instance, I have a sale to ship, and let's just say it's drugs to a particular country somewhere. The president or the Congress declares an embargo on all shipments into that country notwithstanding that it's health care. For whatever reason, if it is an embargo, it may be a violation of U.S. law, that will be an illegality for me to continue, that will terminate the contract. If it's not illegal, it's simply an embargo and saying, put it and ship it somewhere else, it's impossible for me to perform that. Or, let's take one other variation, I am allowed to ship drugs into this particular country, there's an embargo on everything except essential foodstuffs and medical supplies, but I can't find a carrier, a ship or an aircraft that will take the goods into that country before they spoil. That impossibility will also terminate a contract. You will hear in your study of contract law liquidated damages. What are liquidated damages? Because we've been talking about how do you recover when one party breaches the contract? You can sue for whatever damages you believe have been incurred because of the breach, or sometimes to forestall litigation, there will simply be a clause in the contract stipulating in advance how much will be paid for the breach. Quite often between merchants or uh, in shipping arrangements, there will be a liquidated damages clause. No one wants to get into expensive litigation, so we'll simply say, should something happen, uh, the contract is breached, here are the liquidated damages that will be paid. The stipulated damages must be contracted for in advance, and they must be reasonable. If a court finds that the amounts are unreasonable, they constitute a penalty and not damages for breach, they will generally not enforce those liquidated damage clauses. Turn for a moment to the concept of consideration, which we talked about very early in this program as one of the elements of a contract. Consideration in forming a contract must be present for both parties. It's giving up a legal right. You may either pass money, make a down payment, a deposit, which is giving up a legal right to use those funds, or you may make a commitment not to do something. Now, it has to be a legal right to do something which is not illegal. Remember our earlier problem we talked about on the embezzlement. But you can either give up property, you can give up a legal right. That is consideration and is necessary for the contract. One exception. 
if there is a contract to donate to charity, I promise to make a charitable contribution to X foundation. No consideration is needed on a promise for a charitable donation. Generally, consideration must be mutually bargained for and legally sufficient. But courts are not concerned with the adequacy of the consideration. They're not going to go in and second judge, second guess what considerations the parties agreed to. So consideration mutually bargained for, adequate for the task, but not second guessed by the courts. Now there are several areas where consideration is not considered. These are items that no matter, even if you bargain for it and you give it up, it's not considered consideration. That was an awkward sentence, wasn't it? But these things, an undisputed claim, a pre-existing duty, or past consideration will not be allowed by the court as consideration in forming a contract. An undisputed claim. If I say, I owe you $500 and that's my consideration for this, that will not stand. We have no dispute over the amount of the claim. If on the other hand the claim is disputed, you say I owe you $1,000, I say I only owe you $400, so $600 is in dispute. If I say I'll settle this by paying you $800, that can be valid consideration because there was a disputed claim. Both of us gave up something in settling it. A pre-existing duty a duty already to perform will not constitute consideration for a contract. If you extend a, an offer that says, I, do, I will do this, and the other party looks at it, but you're already obligated to do that, there is no consideration. A pre-existing duty does not work. And a promise made after an act is completed. Once you've already, somebody has already done the act, a promise to do it, is considered past consideration and will not be valid for purposes of contract formation. Consideration, completion, and termination of contracts. These are the focuses as we look through problems 39 through 48. We'll pick up on those topics, but you also may see a couple of recurring thoughts from our earlier discussions throughout this program. Please turn to problem 39, and I'll be back in a moment with the answers to the last 10 questions of this program. Here we go with our last set of 10 problems. Question number 39. A sheep rancher agreed in writing to sell all the wool shorn during the season, shearing season to a weaver. The contract failed to establish the price, or set a minimum quantity of wool. After the shearing season, the rancher refused to deliver the wool. The weaver sued the rancher for breach of contract. Under sales article of the UCC, will the weaver win on this contract? A. Yes, because it was an output contract. B. Yes, because both price and quantity terms were omitted. C, no, because quantity cannot be omitted for a contract to be enforceable. Or D, no, because the omission of price and quantity terms prevents the formation of a contract. Now remember, we generally talked about a contract having all the terms and conditions both parties agreed upon. However, here we're talking about an output contract. The sheep herder said he would sell all of the sheared wool from his, his flock to the weaver. It's an output contract. Those price and quantity were omitted, but under the Article 7 of the UCC, in such an output contract, they are presumed to be at a reasonable price for the full amount of the output. So it is an enforceable contract, A. It is an output contract. That's set forth in A, and that is the correct answer. B is clearly wrong, because why would the weaver win if the price and quantity were omitted? So B is clearly wrong. C and D you might have considered, except for the fact that it's an output contract, and there the UCC presumes reasonableness for price 
and the quantity produced by that particular agricultural produ producer? Answer A for question number 39. Question 40 asks, in which of the following situations does the first promise serve as a valid consideration for the second promise? Interesting question. Let's read these very carefully. A, a police officer's promise to catch a thief for a victim's promise to pay a reward. B, a builder's promise to complete a contract for a purchaser's promise to extend the time for completion. C, a debtor's promise to pay $500 for a creditor's promise to forgive the balance of a $600 liquidated debt. And by a liquidated debt, we mean a debt that is already come due, the time for payment has come due. Or D, a debtor's promise to pay $500 for a creditor's promise to forgive the balance of a $600 disputed debt. This is, a, this is a tough question, but I think we can eliminate the first two, A and B, rather quickly. First of all, a police officer's promise to catch a thief for a victim's promise to pay a reward is a promise to do an already required duty. The police officer has an obligation to try and catch the thief. And as a consequence, that cannot be consideration. The builder was also obligated to complete the purchaser's house. And since that promise is a pre-existing duty, it cannot serve as consideration for the second promise. A is out and B is out. Now let's look at C and D, and the wording of these gets a little tricky. They almost look the same. C is incorrect and D is correct. Let's see why. The first one is to pay $500 to forgive the balance of a $600 debt already owed. So that debt is already matured. It is a pre-existing debt that has come due. That cannot give rise to consideration for the next promise. However, the debtor's promise to pay $500 to forgive the balance of a $600 disputed debt can work because the debt was not settled, it was in dispute. D is the correct answer here. And if nothing else, problem 40 should encourage you to read very closely two answers where the wording looks very similar. Here, virtually the only difference is, un is disputed and liquidated. Everything else looks exactly alike. The final answer is the disputed debt, answer D. Problem number 41 talks about June 1st, year 3. Nord Company engaged Milo Company, CPAs, to perform certain management advisory services for nine months for a $45,000 fee. The terms of their oral agreement, and we're beginning to think, as soon as you see the word oral agreement, you immediately are starting to think what? Statute of Frauds, right? Their oral agreement required Milo to commence performing at any time before October 1, year 3. So they had to begin before October 1, year 3. On June 30, year 4, after Milo completed the work to Nord's satisfaction, Nord, pile, Nord paid Milo $30,000. Remember, they had negotiated $45,000. Nord conspicuously marked on the check that it constituted payment in full for all services rendered. Nord has refused to pay the remaining $15,000, arguing that although it believes forty-five dollars was reasonable, it had received bids of $20,000 and thirty-eight from other firms to perform the same services. Milo endorsed and deposited the check. If Milo commences an action against Nord for the remaining $15,000, Milo will be entitled to recover. First warning, we talked in here about endorsements and everything else. Don't confuse this as a negotiable instruments problem. This is a contracts problem. We are being asked about Milo suing to recover the balance due on a contract. Answer A, is Milo entitled to recover nothing because there's been an enforceable accord and satisfaction? Recover nothing because the statute of frauds was not satisfied. Recover $8,000 because $38,000 was the highest other bid. Or $15,000 
because that was the balance due on the agreement. Well, let's take this solution in its easiest form. Throw out answer C. Just because Nord got a $38,000 bid, that has absolutely nothing to do with the amount that Nord and Milo agreed to, nothing about the statute of frauds, nothing about anything else. So C is clearly wrong. Answer A is wrong. There was no accord and satisfaction. That, that deals with both parties accepting and agreeing to the terms. Here we have $15,000 still in dispute. There is no accord and satisfaction. Answer A is incorrect. Was the statute of frauds not satisfied? No, we do not have, we have a personal service contract. We're not under the sale of goods. Could this consulting agreement have been performed within the uh, requisite time periods, within a period of less than a year? Yes, it could. It was a nine months consulting agreement. Do any of the other gripe criteria apply? No, they don't. So it's not a statute of frauds problem. We have a valid binding contract. It has been fully performed by Milo. Milo should be entitled to rely on D and collect its other $15,000 due under the agreement. The answer is D for problem number 41. Problem number 42 throws us back into the columns format and asks simply, which of the following types of conditions affecting performance may validly be present in contracts? Conditions precedent, in other words, this condition must be fulfilled before something else can happen. Conditions subsequent, this must occur after another event. Or concurrent conditions that run with the particular transaction or, that you're working on? The answer is all three of those conditions may be included in any contract. There may be conditions precedent, there may be conditions subsequent, there may be concurrent conditions. Yes, yes, yes leads us to only one answer, answer A. When we move to problem number 43, we are asked, when there has been no performance by either party which of the following events generally will result in a discharge of a party's obligation to perform as required under the original contract? Accord and satisfaction, mutual rescission. Accord and satisfaction will allow us to work out another agreement, substituting it for the original agreement. Mutual rescission sets us back into the status quo ante, or where both parties were before the contract was executed. Both of those will discharge a party's obligation to perform under the original contract. Accord and satisfaction, yes. Mutual rescission, yes. Two yeses. Answer A is the only possible answer to question number 43. Question number 44. We're looking at Master Manufacturing Corporation, who is contracted with Accure Computer Repair Corporation to maintain Master's computer system. Master's manufacturing process depends highly on the computer system. It must operate properly at all times. As a consequence, there is a liquidated damage clause in the contract that provides Acre will pay $1,000 to Master for each day that Acre was, was late in responding to a service request. On January 12th, Acre was notified that Master's computer system had failed. Acura did not respond to master service request until January 15th, three days later. If master sues Acre under the liquidated damages provision of the contract, master will A, win unless the liquidated damage provision is determined to be a penalty, win because under all circumstances liquidated damages provisions are enforceable, or C, lose because Acura's breach was not material, or D, lose because liquidated damage provisions violate public policy. Well, this should be another fairly easy one, get you some points on the exam. The answer B, win because under all circumstances liquid damages, liquidated 
damage provisions are enforceable is incorrect. As I mentioned when we were talking about damages before, if liquidated damages are found to be penalties, they will not be enforceable. So this being an absolute question, which should have sort of alerted you right away under all circumstances, it's clearly an erroneous answer. Lose because Ecker's breach was not material, that has nothing to do with the liquidated damages clause. Material or not material doesn't matter. C is wrong. Answer D, lose because liquidated damage provisions violate public policy? No, they don't. Liquidated damage provisions actually are quite helpful for public policy because they help minimize the amount of litigation. So D is incorrect, and we come back and look at A. Master will win unless the liquidated damage provision is determined to be a penalty. In that case, the court will not enforce it. But answer A should be the right answer to this problem. Coming down the home stretch with problem number 45. K contracted to sell Hodges a building for $310,000. The contract required Hodges to pay the entire amount at closing. K refused to close the sale of the building. Hodges sued K. To what relief is Hodges entitled? A, punitive damages and compensatory damages. B, specific performance and compensatory damages. C, consequential damages or punitive damages. D, compensatory damages or specific performance. Let's talk about a couple of these damages. First of all, compensatory damages are designed to make the injured party whole. Punitive damages are to punish for egregious behavior. Specific performance deals with unique property and mandates that the other party perform the contract, in this particular case, transferring the building. Consequential damages as the result of uh, their light compensatory damages and here, let's take a look at what the options are. K, Hodges may maintain that the building is unique, that this location, this site, this is the only particular property they want. There may be traffic considerations. It may be a historic property. If that can be proven that it is, it's a unique structure, then Hodges may be able to seek specific performance or he could decide, even though it's unique, to seek compensatory damages. D looks like a real good answer. It's unlikely that a court would award punitive damages to K. They usually come about because of a pattern of egregious or outrageous behavior by one party. So it's unlikely that a court would give punitive damages. That would tend to knock out A and C. Uh, let's take a look at B, specific performance and compensatory damages. This is being the hog. You can't get both. You can't get the building transferred to you and compensatory damages. B is a little bit of a red herring. It looks the same as D except for one word. And remember, I warned you, when they look alike, look for the odd word. Here it's and and or. B is wrong. D is in David is correct. Hodges may get compensatory damages, or specific performance. Problem 46. Dye sent to Hill a written office to sell a tract of land located in Newtown for $60,000. Now, outside of that, the parties were engaged in a separate dispute. The offer to sell the land said that it would be irrevocable for 60 days if Hill would promise to refrain from suing Dye during this time, presumably on the other dispute. Hill promptly delivered a promise not to sue during the term of the offer and to forego suit if Hill accepted the offer. Dye subsequently decided that the possible suit by Hill was groundless and therefore phoned Hill and revoked the offer 15 days after making it. Hill mailed an acceptance on the 20th day to Die. Die did not reply. Under these circumstances, Dye, answer A, Die's offer was supported by consideration and was not revocable at the time it was accepted. 
That's answer A. B. Dyer's written offer would be irrevocable even without consideration. C. Dyer's silence was an acceptance of Hill's promise. D. Dyer's revocation, not being in writing, was invalid. Well, let's knock out answer B first off. An offer is revocable unless there is consideration to keep it open as an option. B is not a valid answer. Dye's silence was an acceptance of Hill's promise. That doesn't make any difference. Dye's silence is irrelevant to this particular question. Dye's revocation, not being in writing, was invalid. Now, Dye could revoke it, uh, but something had already happened prior to Dye's revocation, and that is answer A. Dye's offer was supported by consideration. In effect, it was the promise not to sue during the 60-day period. That consideration made Dye's offer an option supported by consideration. It was not revocable for 60 days. During that 60-day period, it was accepted. Therefore, answer A is correct. Dye's offer was supported by consideration, was not revocable when it was accepted, and as a consequence, he must sell the property. Next to last problem, number 47. Grove is seeking to avoid performing a promise to pay Brooke $1,500. Grove is relying on a lack of consideration on Brooke's part. Grove will prevail if he can establish that. A. Prior to Grove's promise, Brooke had already performed the requested act. B. Brooke's only claim of consideration was the relinquishment of a legal right. C. Brooks' asserted consideration is worth only $400. Or D, the consideration to be performed by Brook will be performed by a third party. Well, actually, Grove will prevail if he can prove that Brook had already performed the requested act. There was no consideration in that case. The act has already been performed, no consideration passed. And that's what Grove was relying on, that there was no consideration. So A is the correct answer. What about the relinquishment of a legal right? That is consideration. We've already said, if you give up a legal right, that constitutes consideration. So B is an incorrect answer. Brooks asserted consideration is only worth $400. I told you that while the parties need to agree on consideration, the magnitude of that is not going to be second-guessed by the court. C is an incorrect answer or the consideration to be performed by Brooke will be performed by a third party. It can certainly be handled by a third party. How that consideration comes about is not relevant as long as there is consideration. So the only proper answer to question 47 is A. Prior to Grove's promise, Brooke had already performed the act. Having performed the act, there was no consideration. Therefore, Grove does not have to pay Brooke $1,500. The last of our many questions today. Dunn and Cook signed a contract requiring Book to rebind 500 of Dunn's books at 80 cents per book. Later, Dunn requested, in good faith, that the price be reduced to 70 cents per book. Orally, Cook agreed to reduce the price to 70 cents. Under the circumstances, the oral agreement is, is it A, enforceable, but proof of it is inadmissible into evidence. Interesting concept. B, enforceable and proof is, of it is admissible into evidence. C, unenforceable because Dunn failed to give consideration, but proof of it otherwise is admissible into evidence. Or D, unenforceable due to the statute of frauds and proof is inadmissible into evidence. All right, let's take a look first at Item D, statute of frauds. Does this meet one of the criteria of the gripe plus marriage consideration for statute of frauds? It is not the sale of goods. It is a performance of a service. And as a consequence, it's not under the statute of frauds. So let's take out the unenforceable D answer. Is the oral agreement enforceable? Well, what is the consideration for the revision to the contract. The problem is 
Dunn didn't give any consideration. There was already a commitment to bind the books for a particular price. This modification, the oral agreement, is unenforceable because Dunn failed to give consideration. Proof of it is admissible into evidence, but it's uh, unenforceable. Answers A and B, both of which say the oral agreement is enforceable, are incorrect answers. The final answer to question number 48, C. That is the end of our problems for this particular segment. It's also the end of the problems for the course. We finished a very short and highlighted romp through the law of contracts, probably one of the oldest and most venerable aspects of jurisprudence. But in preparation for the exam, let's run through a couple of mnemonics and highlight things for you to remember as you prepare for this final little test of your knowledge. First, a cold sip of cola outlines the elements for a contract. We're talking an agreement, the agreement of the parties, A. C, consideration, which must pass between the parties to have a contract. S, which is the statute of frauds. In a moment, I'm going to give you a mnemonic on the statute of frauds, but we remember that a contract, in certain cases, must be in writing. C, the capacity of the parties to the contract. O, the offer, which starts the contract negotiations. L, there must be a legal subject of the contract, otherwise it will be void. And finally, there must be a meeting of the minds, acceptance by the parties. So a cold sip of, so of cola, if you write that down at the top of the page, as you, on your piece of scratch paper, you'll be able to pick up the elements of a contract. Statute of frauds. Again, we have a mnemonic to remember. Gripe plus marriage. And here we're talking about a writing for the contract to be enforceable. It, must, it applies in the case of goods that are being sold for more than $500. The R stands for real estate transactions. The I in gripe, contracts which are impossible to perform within 12 months. The P is when you agree to pay the debts of another party. And the E is when an executor agrees to be liable for the debts of a decedent. Plus marriage, of course, any contract involving a marriage agreement must be in writing. So now we have a cold sip of cola for the elements, and we have gripe plus marriage for the statute of frauds. I want you to focus on two other mnemonics, and that's all there is to the mnemonics for contracts. They are misrid and Mr. Ridd. And here we're talking under Ms. Ridd for actual fraud and under Mr. Ridd for constructive fraud. Basically, the elements are almost identical for the two. First, let's go through actual fraud. There must be a material misrepresentation. There must be scienter, S-C-I-E-N-T-E-R, which is the intent to deceive. There must be reliance on that material misrepresentation. There must be an intention for the party to rely on that misrepresentation. And there must be damages. Misrid equals actual fraud. Mr. Rid is, again, a material misrepresentation. But now, instead of say enter, we have reckless disregard of the truth. That's the R. The other three elements of reliance, intent to rely, and damages are the same as we just talked about for Misrid. So Misrid, actual fraud, Mr. Rid, constructive fraud. You have four mnemonics. With those, you have all of the key elements in contract law. But let me give you a couple of other hints in working through contract problems. First, if you want to note down the mnemonics on your scratch paper, that's a great start. Secondly, when you are looking at problems, particularly where there are multiple parties, you may want to draw a little graphic. A sells to B, B assigns the contract, 
or there's a third-party beneficiary. Make sure you know the relationships of the parties before you begin to look at the answers. When two answers appear almost identically, and this is frequently done in contract questions, try and pick out the one word that may be different. They talk about possible to perform or impossible to perform, and or or. These are tricky little uh, wording changes that may make a big difference in whether you get the answer right or wrong. Finally, just relax. The key to an exam is not being uptight, not to worry about it. You are fully prepared. You are ready to succeed. You will get through the contracts part of the questions, and you will become a CPA. We look forward to having you as part of our profession. Thank you. Welcome to BISC CPA Review, comprehensive review materials for the CPA exam to let you customize your own review programs to meet your individual learning style and ensure your success. Worried about finding the time to study? Our customizable learning system allows you to study anytime, anywhere, 24-7 to fit your busy lifestyle and ensure your success on the exam. Looking for a particular way to prepare? From structured professor-led online reviews to independent self-study programs on CD-ROM, video, audio, and text, our interrelated products are designed to meet your individual learning style. Wondering how you are going to master the exam content? Our unique learning management system ensures that you will master the material.
and features such as exam preparation tips, streaming video lectures, and a computerized personal trainer actually reduce your study time. Concerned about the computer-based exam format? The online, classic, and software versions of BISC CPA Review accurately mirror the real-life experience of a computer-based exam, including multiple choice, simulation, and written communication questions. It's all about passing. Each of our products has been specifically designed to ensure your success on the CPA exam. With BISC CPA Review, you will have the confidence and knowledge to pass it, guaranteed. BISC Hotspot, Tax Ethics and Legal Duties. I'm Jack Norman. In this program, we are going to discuss both guidance that's issued as ethical rules and statutory provisions that affect practitioners that are dealing with the tax practice. Now, please bear in mind that laws are simply that statutory requirements that set a floor of behavior. Ethical rules are also guidance that set floors on behavior. The two should work together, but you may have an ethical value system which is even higher. The materials that we're going to discuss here are the floor on your requirements under the law and under professional ethics. You may operate at a much higher level if you so desire, and I encourage you to act in the best interest of the profession, the best interest of your clients, with your highest ethical standards. Now, a CPA is subject to several ethical regimes. There is the Code of Professional Ethics of the AICPA, and we're not going to cover that in this program because it is discussed in other materials. We will, however, discuss the AICPA statements on standards for tax practice. We will mention briefly regulations of state boards of accountancy. The Department of Treasury Circular 230 is a key component of our ethical and disciplinary guidelines. And finally, we will have to deal with penalty provisions set forth in the Internal Revenue Code. Let's begin with the AICPA Statements on Standards for Tax Services. There are seven statements, most recently revised and effective January 1, 2010. There are also two interpretations of Statement Number 1, which deals with positions taken on tax returns. That first statement, the tax return position, Statement Number 1, is probably the most important of all of these standards. They are designed to coordinate with Treasury Circular 230 
and two statutory provisions of the Internal Revenue Code, Code Section 6662 and 6694, which deal with penalties that may be imposed on either taxpayers or tax return preparers based on understatement of tax for positions taken on tax returns. Now, Circular 230, Statement Number 1, and the Internal Revenue Code have both been through a number of revisions in the past several years. Currently, they are all coming together in a single approach. The AICPA in Statement Number 1, as is currently written, has said that a practitioner must follow the tax return position standards of whatever jurisdiction the return is for and where it's being filed. For instance, if you are filing a Form 1040 with the IRS, you will follow the guidance under the Internal Revenue Code for tax return positions. If you're filing a New York State return, you'll need to look to the New York State Taxing Authorities guidance or an Arizona return, whatever standards are in that jurisdiction. So you tie the tax return positions into the standards for that particular jurisdiction. The Institute in Statement Number 1 has taken the position that the taxpayer's return must reflect positions where there is a realistic possibility of success if the position is not further disclosed. Now a realistic possibility of success is a one in three odds or uh, possibility of prevailing on the merits if the position is challenged and litigated. In contrast, the Internal Revenue Code specifically says that there must be substantial authority for these positions, which they interpret as around 40 percent. So there's a small gap between the two. That's for an undisclosed position. Let's step back now. If the position that's taken on the return is a reasonable position and the details are disclosed to the taxing authority on that return, then it may be a reasonable position, not rising to the level of realistic possibility. In no circumstances may a frivolous uh, position be taken on the return under any potential standards. Now, this statement number one and its associated interpretations is mandatory reading for anybody engaged in the tax practice. It is the heart and soul of how the AICPA views the work of the professional in preparing tax returns. However, it's not the end. There are six additional standards which we need to discuss briefly. Let's go through those six remaining standards. St standard number two deals with answers to questions on tax returns. And in this particular case, the position is all questions on the tax returns must be answered. If you look at a tax return that the IRS particularly has set forth, questions generally are yes or no. If there is a question, it cannot be left blank. An answer must be provided. There are rare exceptions when N.A. may be appropriate, but as I said, they're very rare. So a tax return to be complete in the eyes of the IRS and in the eyes of the AICPA must answer yes or no to each and every question. Statement number three is entitled Certain Procedural Aspects of Preparing Returns. And this is basically a, as it says, a procedural return which deals with such items as signing the return, making sure copies are available for the client, uh, making reasonable inquiry. Uh, it is the mechanical aspects of return preparation. Statement number four, use of estimates. This one raises an interesting question. Do we prepare tax returns on the basis of estimates? And if you ask that question of a layman, they would say, well, of course not. Every number on there is a definitive number. As potential CPAs, you know very well that we use estimates all the time. Depreciation is an estimate. We have an estimated useful life. We have an estimated salvage value. We use estimates in allowances for bad debts. We use estimates all the time in accounting 
and those numbers show up on tax returns. That's perfectly acceptable. But if you are going to use an estimate for another number, identify it as an estimate and do not mask it in such a way as to assume that it is a definitive number. For instance, if you're going to use an estimate of $5,000 for, let's just say, cost of supplies for a small business, mark it $5,000 and an estimate. Do not put in $4,876.42. That's not an estimate. It's a misleading use of an estimate that's inappropriate. St standard number four. Standard number five is entitled Departure from a Position Previously Concluded in an Administrative Proceeding or Court Decision. Assume your client has had a tax return examined by the, either the IRS or a state taxing authority. An adjustment has been made and the taxpayer contested. Either the appeals hearing officer or a court decision renders a judgment and indeed a deficiency is assessed against the client. Assuming that type of situation recurs in the future, can you file a subsequent return with a departure from that position that was previously concluded? Statement number five concludes, yes, you can. Statement number six, knowledge of error, return preparation, and administrative proceedings. Suppose in preparing a return, you discover that a prior return had an error in it. It may have been a return you prepared. It may have been a return prepared by another preparer and you have now picked up the client. In either event, knowledge of the error means that you need to inform the client of the error, apprise them of the magnitude, tell them how to correct the error, suggest any penalties and interest charges that might accrue from correcting the error, and then ask them to make a decision. It is their choice whether they correct the error or not. You may not inform the IRS of the error, but if it's significant, you may have to reassess your relationship with the client if they refuse to correct that mistake. Statement number seven is entitled Form and Content of Advice to Taxpayers. This statement addresses both oral and written advice to clients. And the best counsel I can give you on this is your advice should always be couched to the client in terms of their level of sophistication. Some clients will understand complex transactions. Others will not. It's your obligation to provide your advice, your counsel, in a method that is not only understandable, comprehensible, uh, and fully responsive to the client's understanding. As I said, it can be oral, it can be written advice. My sincere practice, my counsel to you, is that many, many clients will ask a simple question without pursuing the full details. Push to get all the facts. And if it's a fairly, if it's a reasonably complex issue, I don't want to even say fairly complex, reasonably complex, I would certainly suggest if you do not wish to write a memo to the client, write a memo to your files documenting the facts you were told, the advice given, and the support for your conclusions. If we turn now from the AICPA standards, to the Department of Treasury Circular 230, this is the guidebook for anyone preparing tax work that will be submitted to the IRS. However, Circular 230 talks about any person practicing before the Treasury, which does, of course, include the IRS. Who is it who are practicing before the IRS? Certified public accountants, you, attorneys, enrolled agents, registered return preparers, actuaries, appraisers, plan specialists. All of these people are subject to the ethical strictures and the discipline rules of Circular 230. Circular 230 was most recently revised in May 
2011. This is the edition that you should be very conscious of and very cognizant. The changes over the last few years have been in a number of areas and this is the Bible under which your ethics and disciplinary practice before the Treasury Department will be judged. Now, a practitioner who is subject to Circular 230 may be disciplined by the Office of Professional Responsibility, OPR, and they are the group that is charged with the ethical sanctioning of any professional, anyone practicing before the IRS, who violates the ethical guidelines of Circular 230. OPR frequently, although not always, re will refer a professional who has been found in violation of Circular 230 to a state disciplinary body. OPR can bar a practitioner from future practice before the IRS, can censure or fine them. The firm can also be sanctioned. And I should advise you that today, any fines, censures, disbarments, any action taken by OPR is a public record posted on the IRS website. This is not a place you want your name to show up. Now, Circular 230 contains many rules similar to the AICPA professional ethics rules and the statements uh, on tax practice. For instance, due diligence, client return, confidentiality, disreputable conduct, uh, all are included in the Circular 230 and are similar to the rules of the AICPA. Circular 230 requires any preparer who receives compensation for preparing a return to sign that return, provide a copy to the client, and to be held to the standards for positions taken on that return. The practitioner today also must obtain a PTIN, a Preparer Taxpayer Identification Number, and that number must be entered on the tax return near the signature block. Circular 230 contains specific requ requirements related to tax shelter opinions, and many of these rules are tied in to the provisions of the Internal Revenue Code. So as you can see, we're beginning to build an, a framework which is composed of AICPA rules, composed of Treasury rules, and of course, at the state level, you'll also have rules promulgated by your state society and in other cases by uh, the state uh, taxing authorities. So this regime is built on many, many levels. I mentioned earlier in the program standards for positions taken on tax returns. And let's take a look at how Circular 230 addresses this question. A tax return preparer may be liable for a penalty for signing a return with an unrealistic position that results in an understatement of tax. That's what they call the 6694 penalty. But here's the kicker. A taxpayer may also be sanctioned under 6662 if they take a position with an unrealistic position that results in an understatement of tax. So the IRS, the Treasury Department, has the authority to impose that penalty on both the taxpayer and the tax return preparer. I would mentioned before the realistic possibility of success, which is set forth in statement number one of the AICPA, the substantial authority position is the position that's inc included in the statutory language under 6694 and 6662 and is showing up in Circular 230. Let's do a little recap here. If there is substantial authority for the position, the, the Treasury Department says there is no requirement to disclose the position. That's a 40% chance. If there is a reasonable basis for the position, certainly it's less than 40%, less than one in three, but it's not frivolous, then that is a reasonable basis for the position. And on a federal return, it must be disclosed using either a Form 8275 or an 8275-R if it deals with a regulation. 
Those are the basic provisions. But if there is a tax shelter or a reportable transaction, then the standard is not substantial authority without disclosure or reasonable basis with disclosure. The standard is more likely than not. That means greater than a 50% chance of prevailing against the IRS. That's a very, very high standard. It applies to tax shelters and reportable transactions. In addition, if you have a tax shelter or a reportable transaction, there is a requirement to file a Form 8886 on reportable transactions. Please stay away from tax shelters and reportable transactions. But if you find a tax client that has done so, file this report because the penalties on this one are in the five and six figure dollar amounts. Now suppose there is a position taken on a return the IRS does not agree with and wants to impose the penalty. A taxpayer can argue that they have a reasonable cause or good faith defense to imposition of the penalty under 6662 or the tax return preparer can make the argument under 6694. They'll say I have a reasonable cause or a good faith defense for why that penalty should not be imposed. First of all, it could be used for almost everything except a penalty imposed for an understatement due to lack of economic substance. There was a special rule that was codified in 2010. Economic substance has been around for a long time, but when it was codified uh, in 2010, now you cannot use the good faith defense for a penalty asserted on this grounds. To obtain reasonable cause, good faith uh, protection from the penalty, it must be a competent tax advisor and the taxpayer must have disclosed all relevant facts. I'm going to have to tell you as a practical matter, it is possible for a taxpayer to avoid the 6662 penalty because of reliance on a competent tax advisor who has made a mistake. It is very difficult for a tax advisor to avoid imposition of the penalty. Now we've been talking about return positions. Let's talk about some of the administrative requirements that are on tax return preparers. You must obtain a PTIN, that's the preparer taxpayer identification number, and pay a fee annually to the IRS. Eventually, all of these tax preparers will have to have an IRS mandated CPE requirement unless they're a CPA, attorney, or enrolled agents. Beginning in 2011, tax return preparers submitting more than 100 returns must use e-filing. In 2012, that number drops to more than 10 returns. Failure to make an e-filing when required to do so may be a discreditable act which could be sanctioned under Circular 230. One of the interesting things about the practice of tax, and we have both CPAs and attorneys who practice it, as well as enrolled agents, but there is a question about privilege. Common law has always allowed an attorney-client privilege. CPAs wanted this privilege and argued to the Congress that they should have protection. A few years ago, the Congress did pass IRC 7525, which gives a limited statutory provision between CPAs, tax practitioners, uh, enrolled agents uh, could fall under this, as well as the new registered return preparers, with certain uh, limited statutory confidentiality privileges. However, it has some major exceptions to it. There is no confidentiality privilege for tax returns. There is no privilege involving criminal matters and there is no privilege for tax shelter cases. You might then say, what good is this limited privilege? And it goes to the question of giving tax advice by a non-attorney. 
Once that advice ends up on a tax return, it's no longer privileged. But in doing planning transactions, it is possible to get a privilege under 7525. I'd like you to stop the program right now and pick up a few questions and answers. I'll be back in a minute to go through those questions and analyze the answers with you. A tax return preparer is subject to a penalty for knowingly or recklessly disclosing corporate tax return information if the disclosure is made a to enable a third party to solicit business from the taxpayer b to enable a tax processor to electronically compute the taxpayer's liability c for peer review d under an administrative order by a state agency that registers tax return preparers well clearly the answer to this one is a it is an unethical approach to enable to to sell confidential corporate tax return information to solicit business from, from a taxpayer for a third party to do that. B, the tax processor, this is a necessary part of computing the tax liability, certainly an acceptable way to do it. And both peer review and an administrative order of a state agency, they are entitled to see corporate tax return information. Answer A. Our next question asks, which, if any, of the following could result in penalties against an income tax return preparer? Knowing or reckless disclosure or use of tax return information obtained in preparing a return, a willful attempt to understate any client's tax liability on a return or claim for refund. Is it neither one or two, only one, only two, or both one and two? Here, as you read number one, you should say, well, that's a problem. And number two, a willful attempt to understate, reckless disclosure. Those are the key words that should give away the answer, which is D. Both one and two could result in penalties against the tax return preparer. Answer D. Next, we're going to look at Morgan, a sole practitioner CPA. She prepares individual and corporate income tax returns. What documentation is Morgan required to retain concerning each tax return prepared? A, an unrelated party compliance statement. B, the taxpayer's name and identification number or a copy of the tax return. Work papers associated with the preparation of each tax return. Or D, a power of attorney. Well, the only one of these that is required is B the taxpayer's name and identification number or a copy of the return. However, I would strongly suggest that C should be kept. There should be some form of work papers associated with each return. You may or may not need a power of attorney if you're going to be representing that client. Normally they're not obtained just for the preparation of a return, uh, but you very well may have to obtain one, and if you do, make sure it's retained. An unrelated party compliance statement, no, that's not necessary. So you want answer B for question number three. In this question, we, it reads, to avoid tax return preparer penalties for a return's understated tax liability due to an intentional disregard of the regulations, which of the following actions must a tax preparer take? A, audit the taxpayer's corresponding business operations. B, review the accuracy of the taxpayer's books and records. C, make reasonable inquiries if the taxpayer's information is incomplete. D, examine the taxpayer's supporting documents. Well, this question is a little bit on the tricky side because the correct answer is actually C, make reasonable inquiries if the taxpayer's information is complete. You do not need an audit of the business operations. You do not need to review the accuracy of the taxpayer's books and records. You do not have to examine the taxpayer's supporting documents. But here I put an asterisk. 
I believe you should examine many of the taxpayers' supporting documents if questions are, uh, are arising. Now, the standard basically says you do not have to audit the information provided by a client unless you have reason to believe that there is an issue, and that's where the reasonable inquiry comes in. Suppose the taxpayer says, I purchased a apartment in the town where my son is going to college. I didn't want to pay for a room on campus. He wants to be off, so I've rented, I've bought this apartment for him, and that's where he resides now. Can I deduct the cost associated with that building? I don't think you're finished with that kind of inquiry. You need to find out, does the taxpayer son have a roommate? Is rent being charged to this other party? What are the costs? they are just a myriad of issues. So a bald statement from a taxpayer is insufficient. Make reasonable inquiry. If necessary, probe a little further. Ask, do you have supporting documentation? For example, the Internal Revenue Code requires documented receipts for charitable contributions. You must ask the taxpayer if they have such receipts. If they do, that's fine. That's the end of the inquiry. But suppose they made a very, very large charitable contribution. They gave a painting to the museum in town. Now there are other rules of support on quid pro quo and on valuations. Now you have to ask to see the supporting documentation. So answer C is the correct answer here. Answer D, delving a little further, is the practical side of the practice of tax. Question number five states, V Corp retained Walter CPA to prepare its year eight income tax return. During the engagement, Walter discovered that V failed to file its year four income tax return. What is Walter's professional responsibility regarding V's unfiled year four income tax return? A, prepare V's year four income tax return and submit it to the IRS. B, advise V that the year four return has not been filed and recommend that he ignore filing its year four return since the statute of limitations has passed. C. Advise the IRS that V's year four information return has not been filed. D. Consider withdrawing from the preparation of V's year eight income tax return until the error is corrected. Well, the correct answer is D. Consider withdrawing from preparation of V's year eight return until the error is corrected. I might have another answer, but that's the correct answer here. Let's talk about the three other choices you had, and then I'll tell you my other option. Answer A, prepare his return and submit it to the IRS. You cannot do this. Tax returns are the taxpayer's return. You may not submit it to the IRS. Answer A is clearly wrong. Answer C, advise the IRS that V's tax return has not been filed. You cannot communicate to the IRS that that return has not been filed. That's not your responsibility. You're in a confidential, professional relationship with V. The IRS will have to find that on their own. C is out. B, advise V that the year return has not been filed. I recommend he ignore its filing since the statute of limitations has passed. You cannot make an advice along these lines. He had an obligation to file. And remember that the statute of limitations never runs until a return is filed. So this not only would be not appropriate, it would be bad advice if you gave it. This may be the approach that V takes. My alternative answer would be advise V to file the year for return You'll be happy to prepare it for him at the same time you're doing year eight, and you could file them contemporaneously. If he refuses to file year four, then you have to consider disassociating yourself. So my answer is a variation on D, but under the exam guidelines, given the four choices here, you clearly would take D. Question number six says, According to the ethical standards of the profession, 
which of the following acts generally is prohibited? A. Accepting a contingent fee for representing a client in connection with obtaining a private letter ruling from the IRS. B. Retaining client records after the client has demanded their return. C. Using information gained from one client's return to prepare another client's return. D. Accepting a fee for tax matters, the amount of which is determined by judicial proceedings. The answer is B. Retaining client records after the client has demanded the return. This may be the single biggest issue between taxpayers and CPAs. It is one where more disciplinary actions have been filed than any other. Remember the rule. Client records are client files. They belong to them. If the client demands them, you return them. The answer is B. Now, what about contingent fees? Under Circular 230 and under various ethic rules of both the AICPA and state uh, societies, Contingent fees may be accepted in certain cases, and obtaining a private letter ruling from the IRS would be an area where a contingent fee would be appropriate. That's answer A. And answer D, accepting a fee for tax matters, a contingent fee, the amount of which is determined by judicial proceeding, that's acceptable. You cannot use a contingent fee for preparing an original or an amended return or a claim for refund but contingent fees are appropriate in the private letter context or if there's a judicial proceeding. So uh, A and D are acceptable activities. How about C, using information gained from one client's return to prepare another client return? And yes, this is acceptable to take information off of one return and put it on another return. You'll frequently see that there are transactions which involve multiple clients. It may be an owner of a Schedule C business and salaries or bonuses or in, uh, loans from the corporation of the shareholder or the shareholder of the corporation. Not only is it appropriate to use that information, it's essential because if you are preparing two returns and there is information that is linked between the two returns, it should be reconciled. Let's look at question number seven. Which of the following fee arrangements generally would not be permitted under the ethical standards of the profession? Before I go through the answers, let me point out, in reviewing questions on the CPA exam, be very careful in the ethics, uh, in the professional responsibility questions about whether they're saying what is permitted or what is prohibited. It's both ways of phrasing questions are used in the exam. Read the care questions very carefully. Here we're saying what would not be permitted. A, a referral fee paid by a CPA to obtain a client. B, a contingent fee for preparing an amended return based on a tax issue that is subject on which the taxing authority is developing a position. C, a contingent fee for preparing a client's income tax return. D, a contingent fee for representing a client in tax court. The answer here is C, a contingent fee for preparing the original return is absolutely not permitted. A referral fee is permitted, but generally there must be disclosure to the client. The question of a contingent fee in court is not a question, that's certainly permissible. B, a contingent fee for preparing an amended return based on a tax issue subject on which the taxing authority is developing a position. They say that this is okay. I do not recommend a contingent fee in this kind of context. This question, correct answer, number C, preparing the original return may not be done on a contingent fee basis. I would discourage you in taking a position on B. Question number eight, under which of the following circumstances may a CPA charge fees that are contingent upon finding a specific result? 
So here we're saying which ones may be uh, used. A, for the preparation of an original return, new. No. B, for the preparation of amended return, new. No. C, preparation of a claim for refund, no. The only one that is possibly even correct is D. If there is a result that is fixed by the court of the public authorities or in tax matters, it's based on the results of judicial proceedings. Only D. If you see A, B, and C, run in the other direction. Our ninth question states, a member would be in violation of the standards for tax services if the member recommends a return position under which of the following circumstances? A. It does not meet the realistic possibility standard but is not frivolous and is disclosed on the return. That would be acceptable under the standards. How about B? It might result in penalties and the member advises the taxpayer and discusses avoiding such penalties through disclosing the position. That's an acceptable approach. C. It does not meet the realistic possibility standard but the member feels the return has a minimal likelihood of examination by the IRS. This is the answer that you want, and you cannot, it, this would be a violation of the standards. You must select C here. Let's look at D, the last, it meets the realistic possibility standard based on well-reasoned opinion of the taxpayer's attorney. Under the standards of tax services, that would be acceptable. The Circular 230 rules say that the well-reasoned opinion of the tax attorney does not constitute substantial authority and would not work under Circular 230. But this question goes to the AICPA standards of tax services. So the answer you want to select here is C. Number 10. While preparing a client's individual federal income tax return, the CPA noticed that there was an error in the previous year's return that was prepared by another CPA. The CPA has which of the following responsibilities to this client? A. Inform the client and recommend corrective action. B. Inform the client and the previous CPA in writing and leave it to their discretion whether a correction should be made. C. Discuss the matter verbally with the former CPA and suggest the corrective action be taken for the client. D. Notify the IRS if the error could be considered fraudulent or could involve other taxpayers. Well, the answer is going to be A. That's the easiest one. You inform the client and recommend corrective action. This, after all, is the client's tax return and the client's decision to make. B says inform the client and the previous CPA. You have no relationship with that previous CPA. If your client now says, I would like you to discuss this issue, uh, with my previous CPA, make sure that he agrees with that there's an error. That's certainly acceptable, but get the client's permission first. Do not universally go out and inform the prior CPA without direction from the client. How about discussing the matter verbally with the former CPA and direct, suggest corrective action? No. Again, let's go back to what I just said in B. This is a matter for the client to decide how they wish to approach it. Under D, the CPA has confidentiality rules, confidentiality requirements, may not disclose this to the IRS, even if the error could be considered fraudulent or could involve other taxpayers. You must deal only with the client here and see what steps they wish to take. Select answer A. Now your question 11 deals with Clark, a professional tax return preparer who prepared and signed a client's federal income tax return that resulted in a $600 refund. Which of the following statements is correct with regard to an Internal Revenue Code penalty that Clark might be subject to for endorsing and cashing the client's refund check? A. Clark will be subject to penalty if Clark endorses and cashes the check. B. Clark may endorse and cash the check without penalty if Clark is enrolled to practice before the uh, Internal Revenue Service. Clark may not endorse and cash the check without penalty 
because the check is for more than $500. Clark may endorse and cash the check without penalty if the amount does not exceed Clark's fee for preparation of the return. Only answer A is conceivably correct. If Clark endorses and cashes the check, period, he's subject to penalty. And answer B says he could endorse and D says he could endorse. They're both absolutely wrong. Now Clark, in answer C, says Clark may not endorse because it's over $500. No, that one's wrong because Clark may not endorse, period. The amount is irrelevant. Clark is subject to penalty if he endorses and cashes the check and full stop. Question number 12. Which of the following acts by a CPA will not, and notice again it's not, result in a CPA incurring an IRS penalty? So we're looking for an act that will not result in a penalty. A. Failing without reasonable cause to provide the client with a copy of a tax return. No, you must do that, and if you fail, you'll have a penalty. Failing without reasonable cause to sign a client's tax return as a preparer. No, if you do that, you'll be incurring a penalty. C, understating a client's tax liability is a result of an error in a calculation. Well, that's not going to pose, impose upon you a penalty unless it is draconian where you've got a substantial understatement. An error in calculation is embarrassing. You'll have to talk to the client about it and inform them of the mistake, but it will not expose the preparer to a penalty. Negotiating a client's tax refund check with the CPA prepared the return, as we've already said, that's a no-no and also will get a penalty. Select only answer C and then you'll be red-faced. Question number 13. In preparing Watt's individual income tax return, Stark, a CPA, took a deduction contrary to a tax court decision that, he, that had disallowed a similar deduction. Stark's position was adopted in good faith and with a reasonable late belief that the tax court decision failed to conform to the Internal Revenue Code. Under the circumstances, Stark will A. Not be liable for a preparer penalty unless the understatement of taxes is at least 25% of, tax, of Watt's tax liability. B. Not be liable for a preparer penalty if Stark exercised due diligence. C. Be liable for the preparer's negligence penalty. Be liable for the preparer's penalty because of Stark's intentional disregard of a tax court decision. The answer here is B. Stark will not be liable for a preparer penalty if he exercised due diligence. Now, let's look at the other answers here. Will he be liable for a preparer penalty if the understatement is at least 20, not be liable? That's, that statement is not true. He could be liable for the penalty. Be liable for the preparer's negligence penalty? No. Be liable for the preparer's penalty because of his intentional disregard of the tax court decision. No, you can say, as you analyze various decisions, that they are not correct. The tax court has been known to be overruled by higher courts. What you're fo focusing upon is the due diligence exercised by Stark. And that means answer B is the correct answer here. Remember as we began this hot spot, the title was Legal uh, tax ethics and legal duties. We've talked about the AICPA standards. We've talked about Circular 230. Let's move now to some of the legal duties of the CPA. The legal duties to clients. There's a contractual liability. The accountant is an independent contractor with respect to his or her client. Thus, the liability stems from a violation of a contractual duty. Now, under contract law, there can be express duties as set out by the terms of the contract. And what is that? An engagement letter. And there are implied duties imposed by the court or by common practice, such things as diligence, confidentiality, etc. And a number of these are set forth in the professional ethics rules. 
Let's talk about the duty to perform. An accountant's duty to perform may not be delegated. In other words, you have contracted to provide services. It's a contract for personal services. Partners in the accounting firm may be liable for the wrongful acts of their subordinates that are committed while in the course of the employment. A professional is liable whether or not they are a member of a PLLC, a professional limited liability co corporation, or a PLLP, a professional limited liability partnership. Now, that what I just said is a hard and fast rule. The duty to perform may not be delegated. Of course, you may have subordinates doing work for you, but the legal obligation resides with the professional who made the engagement. Accountants generally are liable for their failure to fulfill the terms of the contract. What is this? As you remember from your contract law classes, this is a breach of contract, and it may result in damages. A substantial failure, a material breach, means that there was no benefit or no real benefit from the accountant's performance. If there are minor inaccuracies, it's not a material breach, and there the damages may be a compensation for services which were performed, but the payment, the remuneration for it, may re be reduced. One of the things you need to bear in mind is that if there's a, a breach of a contractual duty here, because this is the profession's the professional's obligation, uh, they must fulfill it, but a court is not going to order specific performance. Since it's a professional relationship, it's almost like slavery, so there may be damages, but not specific performance. Any professional must always comply with the profession's generally accepted standards of competence and care. Now, let's turn to the question of fraud and discovery of fraud. In a professional contract, it does not include a duty to discover fraud. We're talking about doing an engagement, and we don't commit to guaranteeing that we will discover fraud. We have a duty to discover fraud unless our own negligence prevents the discovery of that fraud. So we have a standard to perform at the professional land standards. We don't have a duty to discover fraud in an engagement subject to the exception if our own negligence prevented the discovery of that fraud. There is no liability for fraud if our non-performance is due to a client's interference. So there's no liability for failure to perform if it's caused by the client's interference in the work. An accountant who breaches a contract may be subject to liability for damages and any losses as a result of that breach. So let's just say that you have signed an engagement letter that says you will provide certain services. Let's just let's take this out of the tax context and say that an audit will be done. And that audit must be done by May 15th so that it can go to the financing bank and as part of a financing operation to close on another deal. If that deadline is not met, the audit report is not available, the bank doesn't get it in time, and the deal can't close because the financing is not lined up, there may be damages as a result of that breach, even arising from the failure to get the financing to close on the other property. So the scope of damages is measured by the losses that are occur incurred as a result of that breach. Generally, a simple breach of contract does not result in punitive damages. Now let's talk about what is negligence. Negligence is the failure to exercise that degree of care that a reasonable person would exercise under similar circumstances. It's measured by a degree of quality, accuracy, and completeness demonstrated by the average accountant when performing with reasonable care. Now, notice a couple of things here. There is a standard of quality and completeness demonstrated by the average accountant, not the average man on the street when you're talking about pro providing professional services. 
uh, and it's under similar circumstances. So you're comparing the work done by that professional with the work done by an average accountant in that same context. That's the negligence standard. Honest inaccuracies and judgmental errors are not negligence if the accountant used reasonable care. However, negligence may be based on unintended errors. Intent is not necessary. So we can have an honest mistake and it can rise to the level of negligence because it's not an intentional thing. Mere mistakes don't usually rise to that, but it is possible that one of these judgmental errors may give rise to negligence. As you will remember from, again, your law class, there's something called contributory negligence. And if the professional is deemed to be guilty of negligence to some extent, that liability may be reduced or eliminated by the contributory negligence of the client. And in that particular case, what you're going to do is say, yes, the professional did not exercise all the reasonableness and due care that was required in the circumstances. But, and let's just say, for instance, a defalcation was, was found, uh, but the scope of it wasn't fully uh, appreciated by the professional, the uh, CPA doing the work, and they missed part of it. Nevertheless, the client had not reviewed the hiring uh, background and the fact that the person who committed this uh, act in their entity had previously served prison time for a similar offense. So there was some negligence on the part of the client that gave rise to this defalcation, for instance. That would mitigate some of the damages that might be imposed on the CPA. Furthermore, damages are based on a loss that would, that would have been avoided with reasonable care. And the client also has an obligation in some circumstances to try and mitigate damages if they see something is going to be coming about. Now I have to introduce you again because you've seen these, these, this couple uh, several times in your legal courses and in other materials as you've been reviewing for the CPA exam. The couple of Mr. and Ms. Ridd. We're talking here about the elements of fraud. And the elements of actual fraud are Ms. Ridd. The acronym stands for misrepresentation, a material misrepresentation of fact is one essential element of actual fraud. There is scienter, and that Latin word means an intent to deceive. Scienter. So the person in an actual fraud case intended to deceive the other party. There's reliance upon that misrepresentation. The party making the misrepresentation intended the other party to rely and damages ensued. So what do we have? Ms. Ridd, the elements of actual fraud, misrepresentation, see enter, reliance, intent to rely, and damages. Now if we turn over to constructive fraud, it's a little bit different. And now we're talking about Mr. Ridd. Many of the elements are the same. Four of the five are the same. M, misrepresentation, the misrepresentation of a material fact. But instead of see enter, we have R, the reckless disregard of the truth. That's different from actual fraud. However, the remaining three elements, R for reliance, I for intention to rely, and D for damages are exactly the same. So when you think of fraud, four of the five elements, misrepresentation, reliance, Intention and damages are the same. The difference, actual fraud, scienter, or intention. Constructive fraud, reckless disregard of the truth. Now that we've talked about some of these duties, let's take a brief moment and work a few more questions. I'll be back in a moment with the answers to those questions.
Question number 14 asks, a CPA's duty of due care to a client most likely will be breached when a CPA A. Gives a client an oral instead of a written report. B. Gives a client incorrect advice based on an honest error of judgment. C. Fails to give tax advice that saves the client money. D. Fails to follow generally accepted auditing standards. This may be the easiest question in this entire program. Answer D. Failure to follow generally accepted auditing standards generally will be considered a breach of due care. You can give a client an oral instead of a written report that's perfectly acceptable. I simply caution that depending on the material, you may want to make sure it's written in a memo to the files. Gives a client incorrect advice based on an honest error of judgment? Well, we probably all regret we've done it, but we've probably all done it. That does not give rise to a violation of due care. And fails to give advice that saves the client money? <laughs> what a throwaway line. Answer D, the correct answer to problem number 14. When you get to number 15, it asks, when performing an audit, a CPA, A, must exercise the level of care, skill, and judgment expected of a reasonably prudent CPA under the circumstances. That looks like a real good answer to me, but let's keep looking at the rest. B, must strictly adhere to generally accepted accounting principles. C. Is strictly liable for failing to discover client fraud. D. Is not liable unless the CPA commits gross negligence or intentionally disregards generally accepted standards. Well, you can knock out very easily number C. We're not, we don't have a commitment to automatically discover fraud. There's no strict liability issue. C is clearly wrong. Uh, the CPA may be liable under D. Uh, if they commit even simple negligence. Uh, so gross negligence or intentionally disregarding is not required. C and D are wrong. And you know as well as I do after many years of education that generally accepted accounting principles are that. They are principles. And there is flexibility in those principles. So strictly adhere tells you that the answer, as we thought, must be A. 16. A client suing a CPA for negligence must prove each of the following factors except breach of a duty of care, proximate cause, reliance, and injury. So does the CPA have to prove a breach of duty of care? Yes, they do. That it caused the damages? Yes, they do. That there was an injury? Yes, they do. But they do not have to show reliance. C is not required in a negligence action. Now it isn't a fraud action, but it is not in a negligence action. C is the correct answer here. Question number 17. Which of the following penalties is usually imposed against an accountant who, in the course of performing professional services, breaches contract duties owed to a client. Specific performance, answer A. Punitive damages, answer B. Money damages, C. Or D, rescission. And I told you as we were going through this material, since it's a professional services contract, specific performance is not uh, usually a result of a breach, A is out. Punitive damages generally not awarded, B is out. Rescission is, is the answer to D, that is not applicable. Where there is a breach of a contractual obligation, monetary damages are going to be the answer. The answer is C. Number 18, which of the following statements is or are correct regarding the common law elements that must be proven to support a finding of constructive fraud against the CPA. One, the plaintiff has justifiably relied on the CPA's misrepresentation. Two, the CPA has acted in a grossly negligent manner. So does, now remember we're talking constructive fraud here. So that is the Mr. Ridd uh, mnemonic that I had given you. The plaintiff has relied on the CPA's misrepresentation. 
Yes, that's required. So we're looking for an answer that contains one. How about the CPA has acted in a grossly negligent manner? That's actually part of it. So we want to find one that has both one and two. The answer is C, both one and two. So for this question, you would want to circle number C or enter that as your answer to the question. When a CPA, would CPAs fail in their duty to carry out their contracts for services, liability to clients may be based on breach of contract or strict liability. Well, we certainly know that breach of contract is one of the areas in which clients uh, may recover damages. So we want to see a yes in the first column. Strict liability? No, there is not strict liability. That's generally a tort concept. Does not apply in a contract for services. So we want to see a B for the second column. And the only answer that gives us a yes for the first column and a no for the second, answer B. That is the correct answer for problem number 19. In this case, Suncorp approved a merger plan with Cord Corp. One of the determining factors in approving the merger was the financial statements of Cord that were audited by Frank & Co. Sun had engaged Frank to audit Cord's financial statements. While performing the audit, Frank failed to discover certain irregularities that later caused Sun to suffer, suffer su substantial losses. For Frank to be liable under common law negligence, Sun, at a minimum, must prove that Frank A, knew the regularities, B, failed to exercise due care, C, was grossly negligent, or D, acted with scienter. And remember, scienter is intent. Well, they don't have to prove that they knew the irregularities, nor that they acted with intent. The gross negligence standard is not required under the common law negligence rule. The answer we're looking for is failed to exercise due care, B. Question number 21. Which of the following statements best describes whether a CPA has met the required standard of care in conducting an audit of a client's financial statements? A. The client's expectation with regards to the accuracy of the audited financial statements. No. Client's expectations are irrelevant here. B. The accuracy of the financial statements and whether the statements conform to generally accepted accounting principles. C. Whether the CPA conducted the audit with the same skill and expertise of an ordinarily prudent CPA under the circumstances. Or D. Whether the audit was conducted to investigate and discover acts of fraud. Well, you should clearly have stricken A, the, audit, the client's expectations, or D, the requirement for fraud. But now, let's look at the two remaining choices of B and C. Remember our question, whether the CPA has met the required standard of care in conducting the audit. B says the accuracy of the statements and whether the statements conform to the generally accepted principles. That's not a standard of care. So we should eliminate B as one of our options and focus on C, whether the CPA conducts the audit with skill and ex and care expected of an, prudent, an ordinarily prudent CPA under the circumstances. That's the answer you wish to select here. The standard of care is answer C. In the last part of this program, we talked about a CPA's legal duties to clients. Now let's turn to the legal duties that the CPA owes to third parties. In some cases, the accountant may be liable to those third parties. This is particularly true in the case of negligence, when the accountant knew or should have known that another party would be a user of his work product. One of the key concepts behind negligence is the doctrine of privity, P-R-I-V-I-T-Y. Privity is the relationship between the contracting parties, the CPA and the client. Now, occasionally in your reading, you'll run across something called the Ultramares case. This is an old Supreme Court case from the 1930s, which talks about the relationship where it is required to prevail in litigation 
that the specific identity of the parties be known. You should be aware that this is a minority position and that the general rule is that there would be a case of privity where the relationship is of a class that should be known or is known to the other party, but you do not have to identify specific individuals or groups. In addition to negligence, the CPA may be liable to a third party for fraud. The duty to those third parties is that the work product will be without actual or constructive fraud. And as you recall, we have talked about the various elements of actual or constructive fraud using the mnemonics of Ms. and Mr. Ridd. To prevail in a fraud case, the third party must show reliance on the misrepresentation by the party being sued. Now, there is no need to show privity in either the case of fraud or gross negligence. Privity is an issue of negligence. Those were common law doctrines. And now let's turn to a couple of federal statutes that particularly impose liability on CPAs in their practice. The first one is the Securities Act of 1933. This legislation not only created the Securities and Exchange Commission, but requires registration and a prospectus for the public sale of securities. Section 11 of the Act imposes a liability for false statements contained in the registration or prospectus. There is a defense of due diligence by the accountant or the lawyer preparing the documentation. And there is a statute of limitations on when suits can be brought in reliance on Section 11 of the 33 Act. That statute of limitations is one year from the, do from the date that the error was or should have been discovered. The year following the Securities Act of 1933, Congress passed the Securities and Exchange Commission Act of 1934. This goes to the question of subsequently traded securities. So the 33 Act dealt with the initial offering of securities. The 34 Act goes to the question of subsequent trading. One of the key liability provisions of the 34 Act is Section 10b-5. In this particular instance, liability is imposed for any false or misleading statements of a material fact in any of the financial statements or other disclosures made by the registrant subsequent to that initial offering document. In the case of liability under 10b-5, the investor must show reliance and scienter. There is no liability for negligence for misleading statements. So this is a little higher threshold uh, to reach under 10b-5. Those two Securities Acts of 33 and 34 remained in place for a number of years and were the primary federal legislation dealing with securities law and financial reporting. However, in 1995, Congress passed the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act, and it sets forth procedures that are required of the auditors to detect fraud and to inform management of any findings. That act sat around for a few years, was implemented, uh, but then after a number of both accounting failures and what some perceived as overly aggressive accounting, the Congress passed the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. You may have heard it referred to as Sarbox. This act established the Public Company Oversight Board and Auditor Independence Rules. In addition, it requires the board to review audits performed by CPAs of a number of public companies. As we move beyond the common law and statutory imposition of liability on accountants, let's talk about some of the responsibilities 
of the accountant. The CPA has a duty of non-disclosure, a confidentiality requirement. And as you recall, the AICPA Code of Professional Conduct has a great deal to say about confidentiality and keeping clients' information private. Accountants also have a responsibility with respect to work papers. They do own their work papers, but it's in the nature of a custodial arrangement. So that while the accountants own their papers, it is a relationship where those documents can be reviewed by other organizations. Nevertheless, these are critically important for the accountant's responsibility. And as a very wise old auditor told me when I first started my career, if it's not documented in the work paper, you didn't do the work. So these are critical responsibilities for the accountant. Now, generally, the work done by the CPA is confidential, but there's no legal privilege like there is for the attorney. There's no client uh, privilege. How does the accountant get privilege? Well, first of all, for tax work, there is a statutory privilege under the Internal Revenue Code in Section 7525. That confidentiality provision says that it's similar to the attorney-client privilege, but does not apply in the case of criminal work, does not apply in the case of tax shelters, and does not apply to tax returns submitted to the IRS. So you ask, what does it cover? Basically, tax advice given by the CPA is placed in the same status as that for the attorney. Now, there is another confidentiality relationship that the CPA may obtain, and that's for doing attorney work product. In other words, here the CPA is retained by the attorney to do work which will assist in uh, litigation. It's a litigation support type of engagement. Uh, it could also be special work for something like a divorce settlement where you're doing valuations or forensic accounting. In that particular case where the CPA is retained by and does the work for the attorney, that relationship between the CPA and the attorney is covered by a work product confidentiality arrangement. The account has several exceptions to privileged communication, and you need to be aware of these. First of all, AICPA quality review means that the Institute's quality reviewers can get access to the documentation in the work papers of the accountant. The Public Accounting Oversight Board also has that quality review ability to take a look at the papers. A CPA may be compelled to surrender documents in his possession in response to a subpoena issued and approved by the court. Now let me talk about a subpoena for just a moment. If you or your firm receives a subpoena, for your work papers, your documentation, that order is on you to pr produce the documents. But I would make two phone calls and possibly a third if I were the subject of a subpoena. The first call would be to the client, advising them that some of your papers, which may include copies of some of the client's information, have been subpoenaed, whether it be by a law enforcement uh, group or the IRS or the SEC. So advise the client and ask the client whether they want you to comply with the subpoena or whether they intend to challenge the subpoena with respect to their material that's en encompassed by the scope of the document. The second phone call I would make would be to the CPA's attorney saying, I've received a subpoena, I've advised my client, this is the approach we wish to take. Either he's going to fight it or he wants me to comply and I need to discuss the matter with you. The third potential phone call is to the CPA's insurance carrier because very frequently on malpractice insurance, that carrier wishes to consult with the attorney and the CPA about any responses to court-ordered production. Finally, any time that the client grants a waiver, the CPA may automatically make that information available as directed by the client. Now, let me add a caveat here. I've had the experience in dealing with tax matters. I've prepared a return for a client. They've 
gotten their copy, they filed the original with the IRS, and they've misplaced their copy. They now want to do, let's just say, a home refinancing, and the bank has asked for a copy of their tax return. It's not unusual for an individual taxpayer to call the CPA and say, would you please send a copy of my return to my banker? Here's his name, here's the address. That's a client waiver which would allow you to do that. But be very careful because the IRS rules under Circular 230 say you may not disclose that information. That's a confidentiality requirement even though the client has given a waiver. Your response, when the client calls, you can say, I will be happy to send a copy of the return to you. You need to forward it on to the banker. It's just a matter of protecting yourself all the way around in terms of your professional responsibilities. Well, you think, I'm studying for the CPA exam. How bad, what areas could there be potential liability? And let me assure you, as a professional, you have exposure. But as a well-qualified, well-trained, conscientious CPA exercising due diligence in care in your engagements, you're not going to have a problem. Nevertheless, let me outline that you could have exposure for audits and reviews, attest engagements. There's potential exposure in the case of unaudited financial statements. And quite candidly, there is exposure under Securities Acts, the Internal Revenue Code, and state law. Some of those might be civil, some could even rise to the case of criminal activity. I don't expect to see any of you with any potential problems. So let us conclude this by taking a look at another set of questions and answers. After a brief pause, I'll be back to go through that material with you. Question number 22 states, which of the following statements is generally correct regarding the liability of a CPA who negligently gives an opinion on an audit of a client's financial statements? A. The CPA is only liable to those third parties who are in privity of contract with the CPA. B. The CPA is only liable to the client. C. The CPA is liable to anyone in a class of third parties who the CPA knows will rely on the opinion. Or D, the CPA is liable to all possible foreseeable users of the CPA's opinion. Well, remember, this is a question of negligence, and let's take the two easiest ones first. The client is liable only to the client. The CPA is only liable to the client. No, that's not true because as I mentioned before, there is always potential third-party liability. How about D? The CPA is liable to all possible foreseeable users of the CPA's opinion. No, not true again. That would be the universe, all possible foreseeable. It's too expansive. We need to narrow that down. So it's greater than B, smaller than D. How about A? The CPA is only liable to those third parties who are in privity of contract with the CPA. And that's not correct. The general rule is a little bit broader than that. The general rule, that might be a minority position, but that's not the one we're looking for. We're looking for the general rule, and the general rule is stated in C. The CPA is liable to anyone in a class of third parties who the CPA knows, and I should add a parenthesis, or reasonably should know, will rely on the opinion. So for question 22, the answer is C. Question 23, which of the following facts must be proven for a plaintiff to prevail in a common law negligent misrepresentation action? A, the defendant made the misrepresentation with a reckless disregard of the truth. B, the plaintiff justifiably relied on the misrepresentations. C, the misrepresentation was in writing or D, the misrepresentation concerned opinion. Let's take the easy two first. 
The misrepresentation was in writing is not required. It could be an oral misrepresentation. C is wrong. The misrepresentation concerned opinion. No, you could make a mistake in opinion. That is not an element in a negligent misrepresentation. So C and D are out. A, the defendant made the misrepresentation with a reckless disregard for the truth. Reckless disregard would be part of constructive fraud. So that is not an element in the common law negligent misrepresentation action. The answer is simply B, the plaintiff relied on the misrepresentation. Reliance is the only factor here. Answer B is the correct answer. The next question asks, if a CPA recklessly departs from the standards of due care when conducting an audit, the CPA will be liable to third parties who are unknown to the CPA based upon A, negligence, B, gross negligence, C, strict liability, or D, criminal deceit. Well, as we've been through this program, you should know that it's not criminal deceit. We're going to be in the category of negligence or gross negligence. And C is not correct because strict liability is a tort concept. So it's not criminal deceit. It's not strict liability. We're talking about recklessly disregarding from the standards of due care. That goes beyond negligence. A is wrong. And rises to the level of gross negligence. The answer is B. Which of the following best defense, which of the following is the best defense a CPA firm can assert in a suit for common law fraud based on its unqualified opinion on materially false financial statements? A, contributory negligence on the part of the client. B, a disclaimer contained in the engagement letter. C, lack of privity. Or D, lack of scienter. All right, now here we're talking about a common law fraud case whether it be actual or constructive fraud. And in this case, it appears that the question is going to the question of actual fraud, not constructive fraud. If you run back through the mnemonics on Ms. Ridd, you'll recognize that the correct answer is D, a lack of scienter, a lack of intent on the part of the CPA firm. Contributory negligence is not going to be a good defense in this case, nor Will a disclaimer in the engagement letter work at all since it is an unqualified opinion on financial statements? And the lack of privity is not an issue here. It is the lack of scienter for the valid defense. Select answer D. Now let's turn to two questions that are based on the following fact pattern. While conducting an audit, Larson Associates, CPAs, failed to detect material misstatements included the client's financial statements. Larson's unqualified opinion was included with the financial statements in a registration statement and prospectus for a public offering of securities, which were to be made by the client. Larson knew that its opinion and the financial statements would be used for this purpose. I'm going to pause here and tell you we're looking at this section uh, 11 of the 1933 Securities Act. In a suit by a purchaser against Larson for common law negligence, Larson's best defense would be A, the audit was conducted in accordance with generally accepted auditing standards. B, the client was aware of the misstatements. C, the purchaser was not in privity of contract with Larson. And D, the identity of the purchaser was not known to Larson at the time of the audit. Remember now, this question number 26 talks about common law negligence. So we can knock out answers C and D. There is not a requirement for privity in a negligence suit. Neither is there a requirement for Larson's to have known of the potential purchaser client aware of the misstatement has no bearing on this negligence issue. The only defense that Larson needs to raise is that the audit was conducted in accordance with GAAS. Select answer A. 
The second question off this fact pattern, question 27, reads, in a suit by a purchaser against Larson for common law fraud, Larson's best defense would be, A, Larson did, did not have actual or constructive knowledge of the misstatements. B, Larson's clients knew or should have known of the misstatements. C, Larson did not have actual knowledge that the purchaser was an intended beneficiary of the audit. D, Larson was not in privity of contract with its clients. Just as in the previous question, we do not have to have knowledge or privity in this common law fraud case. So knock out C and D. Whether Larson's client knew or should have known of the misstatements is not a defense for Larson against the common law fraud assertion. As a consequence, again, we are going to select A, and the answer would then read, Larson did not have actual or constructive knowledge of the misstatement. So th there again, go back and review your fraud mnemonics for actual and constructive fraud. As we move over to question number 28, we're talking about Beckler and Associates. It is a CPA firm that audited and gave an unqualified opinion on the financial statements of Queen. The financial statements contained misstatements that resulted in a material overstatement of Queen's net worth. Queen provided the audited financial statements to Mac Bank in connection with a loan made by Mac Bank to Queen Co. Beckler knew that the financial statements would be provided to Mac. Queen defaulted on the loan. Mac sued Beckler to recover its losses associated with the Queen default. Which of the following must Mac prove in order to recover? One, Beckler CPAs was negligent in conducting the audit. Two, Mac the lender relied on the financial statements. This one should be fairly easy for you. Beckler was negligent in conducting the audit, and Mac must show that. In addition, Mac must show that they relied on the financial statements. So you're looking for both one and two. The answer here is C. All right, let's pick up with question number 29 now. Under the liability provisions of Section 11 of the Securities Act of 1933, a CPA may be liable to any purchaser of a security for certifying materially misstated financial statements that are included in the securities registration statement. Under Section 11, which of the following must be proven by a purchaser of the security? Does the purchaser have to show reliance on the financial statements? Does the purchaser have to show fraud by the CPA? This is a Section 11, Act of 33 litigation. And the answer is you do not need to show reliance, neither do you have to show fraud. The material misrepresentations are all that's required. You need two no answers. The only correct selection here for question number 29 is D, no and no. Question number 30. Again, we're talking about the Securities Act of 1933, Section 11. Under the liability provisions of that act, an auditor may help to establish a defense of due diligence if, one, the auditor performed an additional review of the audited financial statements to ensure that the statements were accurate as of the effective date of a registration statement. Two, the auditor complied with generally accepted auditing standards. And to establish this defense, both one and two should apply. You may have per performed the original audit a period of time prior to the, what is going to be the effective date of the registration statement. So that subsequent review will help show that you've performed your due diligence. You want a yes answer to number one, and of course you need compliance with GAAS. Two correct answers, that's going to be found in answer C, both one and two, 
select C. Under the liability provisions of Section 11 of the Securities Act of 33, which of the following must a plaintiff prove to hold a CPA liable? One, the misstatements contained in the financial statements prepared by, uh, certified by the CPA were material. The plaintiff must have relied on the CPA's unqualified opinion. Remember, we're back to the 33 Act. And in this case, they have to be material misstatements. So one is required, but there is no requirement for the plaintiff to have relied or show reliance on the opinion. Only answer one is to be selected. That means that you want to pick A in this particular case. 32. Which of the following circumstances is a defense to an accountant's liability under the 33 Act for misstatements and omissions of material facts contained in a registration statement? So what you're looking for, which of the circumstances, is a defense. A, the absence of scienter on the part of the accountant. B, the absence of privity between the purchaser and the accountant. C, due diligence on the part of the accountant. Or D, non-reliance by purchasers on the misstatements. And by now, with the questions we've been through and the materials that you've reviewed, you should clearly have picked answer C. There's no requirement for scienter under the 33 Act. There's no requirement for privity under the 33 Act. And the non-reliance by purchasers is not a factor here. Only the due diligence will give rise to the defense by the accountant. Answer C. And let's take a look at one more question on Section 11. Which of the following standards may a CPA use as a defense? Generally accepted accounting principles, generally accepted fraud detection standards. Well, you know exactly what generally accepted accounting principles are, and yes, those standards you're going to want to use as a defense. A yes for column one. I have no idea what generally accepted fraud detection standards are. Uh, there are standards out there which will help forensic auditors detect fraud, but there's no G8. FDS. So you expect a no for the second column. A combination of yes and no will give rise to the correct answer, which is B. Now, question 34 goes to Spinner Corporation. Spinner CPA, excuse me, Spinner CPA. It's audited Lasco Corporation and Lasco's financial statements for the past several years. Prior to the current year engagement, a disagreement arose that caused Lasco to change auditing firms. Lasco has demanded that Spinner provide Lasco with Spinner's working papers so that Lasco may show them to prospective auditors to help them prepare their bids for Lasco's audit engagement. Spinner refused, and Lasco commenced litigation. Under the ethical standards of the profession, will Spinner be successful in refusing to turn over the working papers? Answer A, yes, because Spinner is the owner of the working papers. B, yes, because Lasco is required to direct prospective auditors to contact Spinner to make management to make arrangements to view the working papers in Spinner's office. C, no, because Lasco has a legitimate business reason for demanding that Spinner surrender the working papers. Or D, no, because it was Lasco's financial statements that were audited. Boy, this is a no-brainer. Can you imagine if every time a client changed auditors, they could demand the audit work papers so their new auditor could prepare their bid? The answer clearly is yes, Spinner will prevail, knock out C and D. And yes, they will prevail because Spinner owns the working papers. Just because the successor auditor calls and says they'd like to view them is absolutely no reason. These are Spinner's working papers, they're private, they're confidential, they will win, select A every time. 
Question 35. Which of the following acts by a CPA is a violation of professional standards regarding the client confidentiality of information? A. Releasing copies of tax returns to a local bank with the approval of the client's mail clerk. B. Allowing a review of professional practice without client authorization. C. Responding to an enforceable subpoena. D. Faxing a tax return to a loan officer at the request of the client. Which of the following acts is a violation of professional standards? Now this kind of goes to a little part of my lecture earlier in this program. Clearly A violates a professional standard. This is a confidentiality issue to the mail clerk at the bank? Of course not. So A is the correct answer here. Now we know that the work papers information can be released to a professional practice uh, without authorization. That's for a peer review type of situation. So B is okay and enforcer subpoena is okay. D, faxing a tax return to a loan officer to request of the client will not violate professional standards of the AICPA. They will violate Circular 230 of the Treasury Department, however. Select A. Page CPA has T Corporation and W Corporation as audit clients. T Corporation is a significant supplier of raw materials to W Corp. Page also prepares individual returns for Time, the owner of T Corp, and West, the owner of W Corp. When preparing West tax return, Page finds information that raises going concern issues with respect to W. May Page disclose this information to Time, who happens to be the owner uh, or one of the principals of T Corp? Answer A, yes, because Page has a fiduciary relationship with Time. B, yes, because there's no accountant-client privilege between Page and West. C, no, because the information is confidential and may not be disclosed without West's consent. D, no, because the information should only be disclosed in Page's audit report on W Corp's financial statements. Let's dispense with A and B. These items may not be disclosed. A yes answer is clearly wrong. I don't care what the relationship is. This is a confidential situation, no disclosure. So now let's look at C and D. The reason for no disclosure is because the information is confidential and may not be disclosed without West consent. That's the correct answer, C. No, because the information should only be disclosed in Page's audit report. That's not a correct answer. It may be disclosed because of the going concern uh, question, but the Page may not disclose this information to T without West consent, and I suspect the West probably will not consent. Select C. Question 37. Which of the following statements is correct with respect to ownership, possession, or access to a CPA firm's audit work papers? A. Working papers may never be obtained by third parties unless the client consents. B. Working papers are not transferable to a purchaser of a CPA practice unless the client consents. C. Working papers are subject to the Privileged Communications Rule, which in most jurisdictions prevents any third party access to the working papers. D. Working papers are the client's exclusive property. Now, in looking at this set of question, this question and set of answers, you should have automatically selected B. Working papers are not transferable to a purchaser of a CPA practice unless the client consents. As I've mentioned previously, those work papers may be accessed by the AICPA for a peer review quality control uh, review. They may be turned over to a court or to a an agency pursuant to a subpoena. So let's take a look at A, C, and D, the incorrect answers. 
Working papers may never be obtained by third parties unless the client consents. That's not true. As I just mentioned, you may be forced to turn them over by a court. How about C? Working papers are subject to privileged communication rule, which in most jurisdictions prevents any third party access to the working papers. Well, they are confidential documents, but as I mentioned earlier in the program, they are owned by the CPA, but it's a custodial arrangement, and under appropriate circumstances, third parties may get access to those working papers. And of course, D is incorrect. Working papers are the client's exclusive property. They are the CPA's property, and they, again, are in a custodial arrangement where they can be reached. Question 38. To which of the following parties may a CPA partnership provide its working papers without either the client's consent or a lawful subpoena? Your choices include the IRS and the Financial Accounting Standards Board. Well, the IRS can only get those documents through a subpoena or with the client's approval, so you should have a no answer. And FASB, I don't even know why they would want your working papers, but again, it would have to be under a subpoena or at the client's consent. That should also be a no. The only correct answer is D. Number 39. Which of the following statements is correct regarding a CPA's working papers? The working papers must be A. Transferred to another accountant purchasing the CPA's practice even if the client has not given permission. B. Transferred permanently to the client if demanded. C. Turned over to any government agency that requests them. Or D. Turned over pursuant to a valid federal court subpoena. After you just finished question number 38, I believe you should have circled 9 almost immediately when you looked at this particular, you should have circled D when you looked at this question number 39. D is the correct answer. Now, transfer to another accountant purchasing the practice. Well, you can do that, but only with client consent. A is wrong. Transfer permanently to the client. Absolutely not. The work papers belong to the CPA. The client has a right to demand any of their own documents back, but not to demand the CPA's work papers. C, turned over to any government agency that requests them? Of course not. They may be turned over to an agency pursuant to a subpoena, and there may be agencies other than the IRS or the SEC, for instance, the Department of Labor or EPA, who may for some reason want to see those work papers, but it has to be done pursuant to a subpoena or with the permission of the client. Question number 40. At a confidential meeting, an audit client informs the CPA about the client's illegal insider trading actions. A year later, the CPA was subpoenaed to appear in federal court to testify in a criminal trial against the client. The CPA was asked to testify to the meeting between the CPA and the client. After receiving immunity, the CPA should do which of the following? A. Take the Fifth Amendment and not discuss the meeting. B. Cite the privileged communications aspect of being a CPA. C. Discuss the entire conversation, including the illegal acts. Or D. Discuss only the items that have a direct connection to those items the CPA worked on for the client in the past. We haven't really explored this issue very much, so let's get into some detail. The answer A, and well, let me preface this by saying, what does it mean when the CPA was given immunity? That means the, the prosecution said the CPA will testify and will not be indicted or charged with a crime that relates to the testimony that they're about to give to the court. So in the case of A, the Fifth Amendment applies to an individual or to an organization, but basically an individual. The Supreme Court has not really extended this to, to non-individual uh, parties. It says they are protected in a criminal case 
In this case, you do have a CPA, you do have an individual, but the privilege is not going to attach because the CPA has immunity. He is in no danger of being indicted for a criminal act relating to this testimony, so A is an incorrect answer. There is no uh, uh, CPA client privilege like there is an attorney-client privilege. Answer B is incorrect. Citing the privilege communications aspect of being a CPA is fine. It has no bearing on a common law privilege. It has no bearing in a criminal case. Answer B is incorrect. Well, what about testifying but talking only about those items which the CPA worked on directly? Answer D is incorrect because once given immunity and told to testify about this conversation, the CPA is obligated to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. They have to cite the entire conversation, including the illegal acts, which means D is wrong and the answer C is the correct answer to this particular problem. Question number 41. Which of the following statements concerning an accountant's disclosure of confidential client data is generally correct? A. Disclosure may be made to any state agency without subpoena. B. Disclosure may be made to any party upon consent of the client. C. Disclosure may be made to comply with an IRS audit request. Or D. Disclosure may be made to comply with generally accepted accounting principles. Let's take the easy answer first, and that's the correct answer, B. You know that any time the client consents, you may make disclosure to any party. So the client has the opportunity to waive the confidentiality. Answer B is correct. Answer A. Disclosure can be made to a state agency only in response to a uh, court-enforced subpoena if there's no client consent. A is wrong. Disclosure may be made to comply with an IRS audit request. No. Again, they're going to have to go the subpoena route unless the client says you may turn something over to them. An audit request from the IRS does not trigger a turnover of documents. And finally, generally accepted accounting principles, although we work with them every day, it has absolutely zero bearing on disclosure of confidential client information. As part of this program, let's explore for a few minutes the tax legislative process and tax planning. The federal tax law is the Internal Revenue Code. It was first enacted in 1913 with a number of separate tax acts between 1913 and the fundamental codification in 1939. The Internal Revenue Code was then completely revised in 1954 and there was a comprehensive rewrite in 1986. I can tell you that it would be very nice if the law stayed stagnant for 30 years or so as for example 1954 to 86, or 86 to 2011 or 12. Unfortunately, Congress passes tax laws every year, usually not one or two, but somewhere in the neighborhood of five to eight individual tax enactments every year. So the code is constantly changing. It is also supplemented by IRS regulations, other administrative guidance from the IRS and from the Treasury Department, and of course, finally, we have litigation in the federal courts, whether they be at the tax court level, the district court level, and on up through the appeals process to usually one or two Supreme Court decisions affecting federal tax law every year. Well, how is tax law made? The legislative process begins at the House Ways and Means Committee. That committee must initiate all revenue matters under the U.S. Constitution, Article I. So we begin with legislation in the Ways and Means Committee. After the committee reports a measure, of course it then goes to the House of Representatives floor. If it's passed there, the legislation moves over to the other side of the Capitol building, Capitol building and is considered by the Senate Finance Committee. Senate Finance Committee generally will make changes to the House-passed legislation. 
After it has done its work, it passes the legislation onto the floor of the Senate, which will usually pass the legislation. Now let's take the most common situation, and there is a House passed version and a slightly different Senate passed version. The only way legislation will be signed by the President is if it is passed in exactly the same form by both houses of Congress. So a conference committee with members from the House and the Senate will work out a compromise piece of legislation. From the conference committee, the legislation will return to both the House and Senate. Assuming they both pass that conference report, it moves on to the President for his or her signature. One other component of the tax legislative process, which you should be aware of, is the Joint Committee on Taxation. This is a group composed of several representatives from the House and Senate that sit on the committee, but they are supported by a staff of tax experts. This group, the Joint Committee on Taxation, is usually the author of the various committee reports on tax legislation and writes the Blue Book, which explains the congressional intent behind the enactments. In the tax legislative process, you should be aware of several things. One is the effective date of legislation. Many times, the provisions enacted by Congress say, effective on or after a date certain. Sometimes it's the end of the year. Sometimes it's the day on which the committee actually took action, particularly if they are trying to close up a loophole or stop an abusive uh, arrangement. So it could be a stated date, or it could say the date of enactment. That means the date the president signs the final conference report. Many pieces of legislation have what are called sunsets in them. So a provision will be effective, and let's just take as an example the uh, rates that reduced the capital gain rate, uh, the rate on qualified dividends to the capital gain rate. It said effective after such and such a date and expires or sunsets on December 31st, 2010. Well, with that expiration, of course, when you reach that date, the rate would then pop back up to what it was before the legislation occur occurred. Congress then, therefore, will sometimes extend a sunset date. And you hear a lot of talk about tax extenders. That is simply passing legislation which moves the sunset date of a provision. Years ago, Congress passed the Congressional Budget Act, which required revenue estimates and a budget process to apply to tax legislation, sort of a pay-as-you-go system. That's fallen by the wayside in the last few years, but with the current deficit issues, the issue of budget process, pay-go, and revenue offsets is coming back into debates. If you are following the tax developments, you're going to want to watch and see how the revenue estimates and the budget process plays out in the context of tax legislation. Now, you have a very complex internal revenue code at the federal level. Many state tax systems piggyback on the internal revenue code. In other words, when you prepare your federal return, you will take that basis as the way that you begin to prepare your state return. And often the states may have a few modifications, perhaps a different personal exemption, different tax rates than the federal system, but the basic structure of the Internal Revenue Code drives the state taxing system. That's called piggybacking. In recent years, as there have been more and more tax reductions put into the federal code, some states, because of budget pressures, have begun to back away from the piggybacking, and they have done what they call decoupling from the Internal Revenue Code. By decoupling, it means that particular provision, and a common example is bonus depreciation under Code Section 168K. That bonus depreciation, while it applies at the federal level, does not apply to that state return. Most of the state return is prepared under the piggyback rules, but there may be one or two decoupled provisions.
Now that you've got a good handle on the tax legislative process, let's talk about a couple of things in the tax planning arena. Tax planning is a continuous process. And as a tax advisor, you need to think a number of points through. Take a look at current law versus prospective changes. Do we anticipate tax rates going up or tax rates going down? Do we expect this provision to be extended or will it expire? Those current law prospective changes is a fundamental aspect of tax planning. So too are time value of money concepts. So the economic impact of delayed tax payments or accelerated tax income, the time value of money is crucial to tax planning. The basic strategy of tax planning has historically been defer income and accelerate expenses. I say that's the basic historic strategy. Economic changes may, may upset that approach. And in addition, if the taxpayer is subject to the alternative minimum tax, that basic strategy is flipped. In other words, you want to accelerate income and defer expenses. So in every case of looking at a client, you need to understand tax planning on a regular tax basis and tax planning if the taxpayer may be subject to the alternative minimum tax regime. You can't do good tax planning by only focusing on federal taxes. You must also consider state tax implications, and they can be a not nearly as major a factor as the federal taxes, but they can be the crucial difference in your tax planning strategies. And let's look at a couple of those strategies. One are elections. Do we want to expense something or do we want to capitalize it? Do we want to claim accelerated depreciation or straight line? Do we want to claim bonus depreciation or do we want to forego that and stretch out our depreciation period? Do we want to use net operating losses? Yes, we do. But the question is when? Do we want to carry them back? Do we want to have carry forwards? What about capital losses? They have carry backs and carry forwards, as do tax credits. Working with the interplay of these various carryovers is a crucial element of tax planning. You do tax planning with estimated taxes. You're trying to minimize the taxes that are being paid, of course, but you also want to maximize the tax benefits of when those estimated taxes are paid, taking advantage of time value of money. Tax planning may involve passive income and passive losses. The passive loss rules of the code will, may suspend the losses. There are times when you can generate passive income. You want to try and marry up passive income and passive losses. Or if you have rental losses in the passive loss regime, watch how they play out with the taxpayer's adjusted gross income. Changing tax rates and phase-out ranges can significantly affect tax planning, particularly if the taxpayer has fluctuating income. So watch out for these. Finally, switching entities, whether a taxpayer changes from one tax form. Do they go from a C-corp? Do they elect S status? Should we think about taking an LLC and incorporating it at some point in time? So entity morphing is another aspect of tax planning. We can't ignore the impact of audit adjustments on both our federal and state tax returns. And I have to caution you, no matter how good they sound, avoid tax shelters. This is the quickest way to draw the attention of revenue officers and usually turns out very badly for the client. And if it turns out badly for the client, it also seems to have an impact on the CPA. My final advice in tax planning, consider the tax implications in decision making, but never, ever let the tax tail wag the financial dog. In other words, make an economic decision, not a tax decision. In this hot spot, I've broken the material into four broad categories. 
Let's review those briefly, and then I have a word or two about professionalism. The first area we talked about was tax ethics, and we discussed the seven AICPA statements of responsibility in tax practice. We then looked at Circular 230, which has been issued by the Department of the Treasury. As you review those materials, focus particularly on a couple of items. One, positions taken on tax returns, and that will be found in Statement 1 of the AICPA, Section 6694 and 6662 of the Internal Revenue Code, and 10.34 of Circular 230. The rules there all focus on a substantial authority basis for taking a non-disclosed position, a reasonable basis with disclosure position, and a more likely than not position for tax shelters. Those, that's one area that you will see quite a bit of. We've also talked about confidentiality and due diligence in these standards. So make sure you review those. When you move over to the second section where we talked about an accountant's responsibility to clients, we talked about negligence, we talked about actual and constructive fraud. Just refresh yourself on the mnemonics for Mr. and Ms. Ridd in the fraud arena, and privity and reliance are two of the two key concepts that you may see tested with respect to those matters. The third section, we talked about the accountant's responsibility to third parties. And again, we talked about both common law and we talked about federal legislation. Most of the work we did was with respect to Section 11 of the Securities Act of 1933, and we mentioned Section 10b-5 of the 34 Act. Here again, you need to review the matters with respect to reliance, with respect to privity, with respect to scienter, and misrepresentations. Finally, I took you through a brief discussion of the federal legislative process and concepts of tax planning. There's nothing terribly earth-shaking in either of that material. One is government process that you learned way back in junior high school. The second is common sense, which says consider all the facts and circumstances, keep in mind economic events as well as tax rules, and never, never assume that tax is the driver of good economic decisions. Take it into account, but don't let it drive the decisions. Now, you have studied material here on tax ethics and legal duties. You will pass the exam. You will get your certificate and move out to practice. All of this knowledge is perfect for you, but make sure that you always remember to live your professional life with those high standards. What I have reviewed for you in this material are basic rules. Your professional ethics, your professional code of conduct will stand you, your professional life, and the profession that we all admire so much in great stead into the future. I welcome you to it.
Welcome to CPA Ready, comprehensive review materials for the computer-based CPA exam that lets you customize your own review program to meet your individual learning style and ensure your success. Thank you for selecting this hotspot video, which contains a targeted, intensive review of the specified topic area. We hope you find this video to be an effective tool in your CPA exam preparation. BISC Education. This CPA review program will focus on fiduciary relationships, and we're going to discuss these relationships in two contexts, one, estates and trust, and secondly, agency relationships. Now, many of us sometimes will wonder, where do we get the term fiduciary? What exactly does it mean? The origin is an old Latin term, fiduciarius, which means confidence or trust. When we select a fiduciary or in a fiduciary relationship, it is one of trust. It is a very important concept that we're going to be talking about throughout this program. But remember, the focal point is trust in the person who holds that fiduciary title. Let's begin with the definition of an estate and a trust. An estate is a legal entity that comes into existence upon the death of an individual. The estate succeeds to the to the title of the property that was owned by the individual at the time of death. So indeed it is a separate entity, separate and apart from the decedent. A trust, on the other hand, is a fiduciary relationship with respect to property in which one person holds legal title to the property for the benefit of another person. It involves two forms of ownership, one legal, the other equitable, in the same property at the same time. So in effect, there is a split of title when you are dealing with a trust arrangement. Now let's step back to the estates. There are two types of estates, and you will hear these described as a person dying either testate or intestate. As I tell many of my financial planning students, there's no question that there will be an estate upon your death, and property will pass to your heirs. The question is whether you want to dictate how that property will pass or you want to have the state dictate how the property will pass to the heirs. So testate, that means that the individual has died with a will. An executor who is named in the will will distribute the property in accordance with the terms of the will. So for example, I have written a will. Upon my death, it says, all of the property that I own at the time of my death will go into this estate. My wife, if she survives me, will be the executor of the will. Her responsibilities will be to pay my debts and then distribute the property as I've set forth in the will. There are certain bequests to charitable organizations with the balance then being left to her as the recipient of my bounty. In contrast, should I not have written the will, I will have died intestate meaning without a will. Then an administrator appointed by the court will be, be distributing the property in my estate. The administrator is, of course, first and foremost responsible for paying my debts, but then the property is distributed pursuant to state law. Each state has their own rules of dissent and distribution, which say if an individual has died without a will, here is where we want the property to go. That may or may not be in accord with how the decedent would have preferred the property to pass. For instance, in my case, I would want everything to go to my wife, and then, should she not survive me, to my children. However, state law may very well say a portion goes to the wife and a portion to the children. This is a matter for the individual to determine, but it is important to understand whether we have an intestate situation without a will or a testate situation with a will. 
Now, I mentioned that the property will be distributed by the terms of the will. And there are two phrases that need to be understood as you're working through the distribution rules. The first is per capita, again going back to the Latin, and it means by the head, or per stirpes, S-T-I-R-P-E-S, -E per stirpes, by representation. Let's give an example here. Suppose I have three children. If I distribute property to them per capita, each one would get one-third. That's fine. And if none of the, my children have children, per capita works very well. But let's assume I have both children and grandchildren. Each of my three children, the two of my three children, rather, have two children each. And the third child has one son. So in effect, I have three, three children and five grandchildren. If all three of my children have deceased at the time I die, how would my property be distributed? If I said per capita, each of the five would get one-fifth. If I say per stirpes, then we look back to my children and pass it through them on to their children. So in my scenario of five grandchildren and three children, a per stirpes allocation would work this way. My first daughter would get one-third. Although she's deceased, that third would pass half to each of her two children. Each one would get one-sixth. My, son, my first son, who also had two children, although he is deceased, one-third would pass through there, and each of his children would get half of one-third. My second son, who only had one child, the one-third passing to him would pass through directly one-third to his child. So instead of one-fifth to each of the grandchildren, four of the grandchildren would get one-sixth of my estate, one grandchild would get one-third. In any event, property is passing to the children. The question for the decedent is, how would they like the allocation to be made? Per capita or per stirpes? Those are some of the essential elements of the estate. Let's turn over to essential elements in a trust. There are a number of terms and individuals and events which must be defined so that we understand trust. First is the grantor or settlor. This is the person who creates the trust. And in my particular case, I have created a trust for the grandchildren, actually three trusts for three grandchildren. I am the, am the grantor or the settlor. I created the trust then I put property into the trust for the benefit of those grandchildren. This is known as the corpus or the race, C-O-R-P-U-S or R-E-S. It's the property of the trust. Now, what the trust must obtain is legal title to that property. So, assuming I want to fund a trust with shares of stock. I've owned the stock. I want to place it in the trust. I have to have title of that stock transferred from me to the trustee of the trust who will hold legal title to that property for the benefit of my grandchildren. So we've talked about the grantor or settlor and the corpus or race, which is the body of the trust. Next I mentioned there is a trustee. This is the person who holds legal title to the trust corpus. Frequently, the trustee is a bank or a trust company, but the settlor could also be the trustee. He could name himself to manage the trust. It could be another person that the grantor has great confidence in. In the case of my grandchildren's trust, although I was the grantor, my wife is the trustee. Frequently, when you have a trust, it is also important to name a successor or an alternate trustee should something happen to the original trustee. Now, when we talked about fiduciary duty, the trustee has that fiduciary duty. That is the person who is obligated to manage the trust for the benefit of the beneficiaries. Generally, the trustee's duty, his primary duty, is to preserve the corpus, protecting the property that was transferred into the trust. 
and generally producing income is the secondary role of the trustee. Since the trustee has fiduciary duty, if there is negligence, fraud, commingling of funds, or any breach of fiduciary duty, an action can be brought by the beneficiaries or even the grantor against the trustee for this breach of fiduciary duty. I mentioned beneficiaries. These are the individuals who have equitable title to the property that is in the trust. So while the trust owns the assets, the race, and the trustee has legal title to the property, the beneficiaries have equitable title to that trust property. And there are really two types of beneficiaries of a trust. The first is the income beneficiary, and that's the individual who receives the current income that's generated by the trust. Let's go back to my example of the, grand, the trust for the benefit of my grandchildren. Each of those shares of stock is generating current dividends. Those dividends are the income of the trust and would be distributed to the income beneficiary. However, that income beneficiary is not entitled to the corpus or the basic stock. The race or the corpus of the trust is for the benefit of the remainder man. And this is the individual who obtains title to the trust property when the trust has concluded or on the termination of the trust. Let's take my grandchildren's trust scenario again. I've written the trust such that the grandchildren get the income during the period of their, li their life up to age 30. At age 30, the trust terminates and that grandchild gets the stock that is in the trust. In this case, the grandchild is both the income beneficiary and the remainder man. He will receive the dividends during the life of the trust and then upon the termination of the trust at age 30 receives the stock. However, it is not necessary that the income beneficiary and the remainder man be the same. And a very common example here is in a trust for the benefit of a surviving spouse. In an estate arrangement, a trust may be created upon, let's just say, the death of the husband, and the trust says, pay the income from this trust to my wife for her life. Upon her death, the trust terminates, and the remainder, the corpus of the trust, passes to my children or grandchildren. That's a very common way where the income beneficiary and the remainder man are not the same. As we talk about these types, we have a series of definitions of types of trust. So let's focus on those for just a moment. There is an inter vivos trust, inter v-i-v-o-s, meaning between or among the lives. This is created during the grantor's life. An inter vivos trust would be, I created the inter vivos trust for my grandchildren because I did it while I was alive. In contrast, there is a testamentary trust, and this is created by will, and it comes into effect only upon the grantor's death. In effect, when I die, the will says, create this trust, and that is a testamentary trust. A trust may be either revocable or irrevocable. Now, a revocable trust is exactly what it says. It means it may be revoked by the grantor. So I could set up a trust during my life and at some point say, I don't want this trust any longer. I am revoking it. I have a power as the grantor to revoke the trust. Alternatively, an irrevocable trust or irrevocable trust, the grantor may never revoke that. So once established, it is indeed there permanently until termination by the terms of the trust agreement. A testamentary trust is always irrevocable. And why? because it came into existence at the grantor's death through his will, therefore the grantor has no power to revoke that testamentary trust. Of all these trusts, whether they be inter vivos or testamentary, revocable or irrevocable, they may fall into a couple of other categories. So as you can see, there are a lot of definitions, permutations, and combinations of these definitions of trust. We may have a simple trust, and a simple trust says all income must be distributed 
currently to the income beneficiary. So any dividends that come in during the year must be paid out to the income beneficiary. Of course, the corpus remains in the trust for the remainder man upon the, upon the termination of the trust. In contrast with a simple trust, there is a complex trust. Now, the, the complex trust says it's optional whether or not current income is distributed to the income beneficiaries. So remember, a simple trust, all income must be distributed. A complex trust says current income may be distributed, but it may be accumulated in the future uh, for that income beneficiary. And now I'm going to step you back to my grandchildren's trust again. I made it simple to begin with, simple in terms of my description to you, but when I created that trust, it was created as a complex trust. And here's the reason. I set those trusts up upon the birth of the grandchildren. I saw no reason to distribute to a one-year-old current dividends. So the rule was the complex trust accumulates the current income until the grandchild reaches the age of 21 25. However, there is a provision in the trust that says current income or even some corpus may be distributed if necessary for the child's education. What I was trying to do was set up a trust that provided funds for either high school private education or college education. So we set up a complex trust, made it irrevocable. My wife is the trustee, I is the grantor. That complex trust said do not distribute the income currently accumulated until the child reaches ages 25 or 21, 25, and then at 30. But we can dip into that if needed for education expenses. These are all terms set forth in the trust agreement. Another type of trust is a grantor trust. And you'll hear some of these discussed in terms of estate planning. A grantor trust is one where I, as the grantor, set up a trust transfer property into it and in and the income beneficiary and the remainder man of the trust. The property is in trust, but it's treated as though I am owning the trust outright. Frequently, a grantor trust will be used in this context of an estate plan to get around, uh, inher not inheritance taxes, but the, the necessity for going through uh, the estate administration process. You set up, I as the husband, for instance, would transfer property into the grantor trust. I would have the income for life, and upon my death, the trust becomes irrevocable and the remainder transfers over to my spouse. So the grantor trust, I am the grantor, I am the trustee, I am the income beneficiary, but my spouse is the remainder man. By doing this, I don't have to go through probate with the assets that are in trust, but I am treated as the owner of the trust during the lifetime of the trust or during my life. Since it's a grantor trust, it remains revocable until my death, at which point it becomes irrevocable. The last type of trust I want to briefly mention is something called a generation skipping trust. And in my scenario that I set up earlier on in this discussion, I said I set up a trust for the benefit of my grandchildren. That is a generation skipping trust. I am the grandfather. Nothing in that trust goes to my child. It goes straight on to my grandchild. It skips a generation. Uh, it's simply a term that you need to be aware of. There are tax considerations with respect to generation skipping trust, but that's not part of our discussion today on fiduciary responsibilities. As we look at these trusts, we know that there is going to be income and expenses in every trust. And in many cases, we will have both an income beneficiary and a remainder man. So as good CPAs or CPA candidates, we're going to be talking about allocations. What happens to the income and the expenses? There is a Uniform Principal and Income Allocation Act. And in general, the income beneficiary is charged with current expenses and credited with current income. So in my scenario of stock being transferred into a trust, the 
dividends earned on that uh, stock or interest earned on bonds in the trust would be allocated, credited to the income beneficiary. And administration fees, the ongoing fees, will be charged against the income beneficiary. In contrast, the remainder man who is entitled to the corpus or the race of the trust is charged with extraordinary expenses and credited with changes in corpus. So let's assume there are stock dividends. There are extraordinary expenses dealing with uh, special allocations on uh, special assessments on some real estate that may be put in the trust. Those will be credited and charged to the remainder man as appropriate. Extraordinary expenses and changes to the underlying corpus of the trust. Annuities are credited to both remainder man and the income beneficiaries depending upon the terms of the trust and trustees fees are generally allocated and charged to both the remainder man and to the income beneficiary. We've created the trust, we've run the trust for a number of years, now how does the trust end? First and most commonly the trust ends at the end of a specified term or if its purpose is fulfilled. And in my example that I gave you of the Grandchildren's Trust, at age 30, the trust terminates and they are the remainder man, the grandchild, is entitled to the corpus in the trust. So that is the specified term that I set up in the trust instrument. It's also possible that the trust will end on what is called a merger. And that's when the trustee becomes the sole beneficiary of the trust. It is possible that I could set up a trust for the benefit of my wife. She is the trustee and the sole beneficiary of that trust. Well, she wasn't initially. Let's say it was set up. Uh, let me back and add one more factor here. Let's suppose the trust was set up for the benefit of my child, with my wife as the trustee, and should something happen to my child, she becomes the successor beneficiary. Tragically, my son is killed, and at that point, no longer a beneficiary of the trust, my wife, who was the successor beneficiary and the trustee, now takes the trust, there is a merger, and the trust terminates. Finally, a trust will terminate if it becomes either illegal or impossible to carry out the purpose of the trust. An illegal act or something impossible to perform, for instance, the property that is the trust corpus is destroyed, which may happen uh, in the case of a building particularly that might be in trust. That is the conclusion of the trust. It wraps up, it terminates. We've talked about a number of terms in here, uh, from inter vivos to testamentary. We've talked about uh, dying testate and instate, te testate and intestate. We've talked about estates and trust. We've talked about beneficiaries, fiduciaries, and trustees. A lot of terms, a lot of mixing and matching. And probably the best way to understand the issues of fiduciaries and estates and trust is to do some problems. Let's turn to problem one and work problems one through 15 now on estates, trust, and fiduciary responsibilities. Turning to problem one, question reads, a will provided that an estate was to be distributed per stirpes to the deceased heirs. The only possible heirs are two daughters who each have three children and two children of a predeceased son. What fraction of the estate will each child of the predeceased son receive? So if we notice here we had three children, we have a grand total of eight grandchildren. But the question is focused on the two children of the predeceased son. Possible answers are A, 0, B, 1 eighth, C, 1 sixth, or D, 1 fourth. Let's look at how we might get to each of those answers. The only way that the answer A would apply is if it was assumed because the son had died, nothing went to his heirs, his two children. That's not the way the will reads. It says, per stirpes to the deceased heirs, and indeed those grandchildren of the deceased son are heirs. So zero is an incorrect answer. How about B, one-eighth? Well, there are three children of each of the two daughters, so that's six 
grandchildren, two children of the predeceased son, that would be eight. If you said it's one-eighth to each of the grandchildren, that would be per capita, which would be incorrect because the will specified per stirpes, plus it would be incorrect because the two daughters are still alive and they would be the heirs, not their grandchildren. So let's skip down to D, one-fourth. The way you could get this would be to the two daughters, which would constitute two distributions, and to each of the two surviving, to the two grandchildren from the deceased son. Well, unfortunately, we're not distributing it that, that is the way it will be distributed, but that's not the fraction of the estate each child will receive. Indeed, one-third of the estate is going to go to one daughter, one-third is going to go to the second daughter, and one-third is going to go to the two sons of the deceased son. So answer D is incorrect. But let's come back to C. Now we're focused on the percentage to be received by each of the surviving grandchildren. The one-third went to the first daughter, one-third went to the second daughter. One-third would have passed through to the son, who unfortunately has predeceased his father. So now we're going to look at how much of that one-third is shared by each of his two children, one-sixth. The correct answer is letter C. This is a pure, simple example of the per stirpes calculation. Problem number two asks us, a personal representative of an estate would breach fiduciary duty if the personal representative, A, combined personal funds with funds of the estate so that both could purchase treasury bills. B, represented the, the estate in a lawsuit brought against it by a disgruntled relative of the decedent. C, distributed property in satisfaction of the decedent's debts. D, engaged a non-CPA to prepare the records for the estate's final accounting. Now remember, this is the personal representative of the estate breaching a fiduciary duty. Well, first, a, it may entirely be possible that a better return could be obtained if we did a bulk purchase of treasury bills using the uh, personal representative's funds and those of the estate. However, commingling of those assets would be a breach of fiduciary duty. Clearly, A is a breach and is probably the correct answer for this. But let's take a look at the other three possible answers. The representative, the personal representative, represented the estate in a lawsuit against it by a disgruntled relative, that is absolutely a responsibility of the personal representative. So this is something expected of and would certainly not be a breach of duty. If he failed to do this, it would be a breach of duty. B is an incorrect answer. C, suppose the personal representative distributed property in satisfaction of the decedent's debt. This is an obligation of the fiduciary and it must be done. Failure to do so would be a breach, so if the personal representative made the distribution that is appropriate, C is an incorrect answer. And finally, engaged a non-CPA to prepare the records for the estate's final accounting. It might be better to have a CPA prepare those records. It's not necessary. It is not a breach of fiduciary duty to do so. The estate representative simply must have a good estate final accounting presented to the court and a non-CPA is capable of preparing such records. D is an incorrect answer. Only A is the correct answer to problem number two. Number three. Now we're looking at tables. So if we remember our review process, Let's answer what is correct for column A, what is correct for column B, and then find one of the four choices that fulfills our answering criteria. So which of the following parties is necessary to create an express trust? Must there be a remainder man? No, there doesn't have to be. The corpus can revert to the grantor. The income beneficiary can also be the remainder man, so there's not a necessity to set out a remainder man. That answer is no. Must there be a successor trustee? Although it's highly recommended, there is no requirement for a successor trustee. That answer is also no. So the only selection possible is D, D as in David, which will give us a no for remainder man, a no for a successor trustee. Let's 
Turning to number four, if not, express, if not expressly granted, which of the following implied powers would a trustee have? One, the power to sell trust property. Two, the power to borrow from the trust. Three, the power to pay trust expenses. And then A, B, C, and D are combinations of those three different implied powers. A trustee has an implied power to sell trust property. It's in the trust, but they are tasked with maintaining the corpus to generate income, and it may be necessary to sell trust property to reinvest those proceeds in something else. So yes, there is an implied power to sell trust property. One is an implied power. Power to borrow from the trust. This is generally not true. The trustee has fiduciary powers, but generally not to borrow from the trust. So the answer here should be this is not an implied power of the trustee. Power number three, power to pay trust expenses. And this is absolutely implied. The trustee is responsible for managing the trust, maintaining the trust, paying all appropriate trust expenses. So one and three are correct powers. Number two is not. So the only answer that will give us one and three is answer B. B as in boy for number four. Problem number five. Arno plans to establish a spendthrift trust naming Ford and Sims as life income beneficiaries and Tripp as residuary beneficiary. Bing is to be named trustee. Arno plans to fund the trust with an office building. So we're putting in as the corpus of the trust an office building. For the trust to be enforceable, Arno must A. Execute a written trust instrument. B. Provide for Bing's trustees' fees. C. Designate a successor trustee. Or D. Deed the property to Bing as trustee. Well, I told you before, uh, when we were discussing fiduciary powers in the trust arrangement, that the property had to be legally transferred to the trustee. So Bing must be the trustee owning legal title to the property. Answer D is clearly correct. Answer B, let's go back up to B. Does the trustee have to provide for Bing's trustee fees? No, he does not. Bing may agree to serve without being compensated. Uh, particularly if there's a family friend or a relative, Bing may decide to administer this trust without being paid for it. It's not necessary to be in the trust agreement. Must a successor trustee be designated, which is answer C. Again, the answer is no. It is a good idea to have a successor trustee, but it's not required. And now the answer A. The AICPA, in providing guidance on this problem, says that A is not necessary. Those of us at, the, at BISC believe very strongly, our advisory board has also con concurred, that A is probably also a correct answer. Because we're talking real estate, and if you recall in your study of contract law, there is a statute of frauds. Statute of frauds requires a written instrument when dealing with real estate. And so we believe that answer A may be an appropriate answer for this, but the formally correct answer given by the AICPA is answer D. Let's move on to problem number six. Which of the following expenditures resulting from a trust ownership of commercial real estate should be allocated to the trust principal? Now, if you remember when we were talking about this, we said income and ordinary expenses go to the income beneficiaries, extraordinary expenses, and adjustments to corpus go to the remainder man. We're looking at A, building management fees, B, insurance premiums, C, sidewalk assessments, or D, depreciation. Now these are the which expenditures should be allocated to the corpus or the principal of the trust. Building management fees are an ongoing annual expense. A should be allocated to the income, so that's an incorrect answer. Insurance premiums. These are again an annual cost of maintaining the building, insuring it. These should also be allocated to the income beneficiary and not to the remainder. Answer B is incorrect. C, sidewalk assessments. 
These are generally special assessments to do sidewalk either improvements, replacements, or if there were no sidewalks to, to put them down. They are added to the trust principal because they are increase in the corpus, they're a capital improvement. An extraordinary uh, levy on the trust, capital improvement, these should be added to trust principal. The correct answer is C. Now you're going to say, what about depreciation? Depreciation is a reduction in the value of the building. Well, it's an annual cost spreading the original acquisition cost over the life of the asset. It is an annual recurring cost. It is part of the annual expenses that should be allocated to current income. Depreciation expense is an incorrect answer here. D should not be selected. Only C is the correct answer to problem number six. All right, problem number seven focuses on Mr. Gardner, a U.S. citizen and the sole income beneficiary of a simple trust. He is entitled to receive current distributions of trust income. During the year, the trust reported income from corporate bonds of $5,000, fiduciary fees allocable to income $750, and net long-term capital gain allocable to corpus. The question is, what amount of trust income is included in Gardner's gross income? Is it the $7,000, which is the combination of both the income interest and the capital gains? And that would be incorrect because the capital gains are added to corpus. A is wrong. $5,000. Well, the $5,000 is income, and that will be allocated to Mr. Gardner. But B is not the correct answer. The correct answer is C, $4,250, because while Gardner picks up the $5,000 of income, he must also report a charge of $750 for the allocable fiduciary fees. C is the correct answer. And D is clearly incorrect, because as the income beneficiary and being allocated $4,250, he must report it as gross income for the year. The only correct possible answer is C, $5,000 minus $750 or, or $4,250 of gross income. Problem number eight. On January 1st, year three, Dix transferred certain assets into trust. These assets consisted of Lux corporate bonds with a face amount of $500,000 and an interest rate of 12%. The trust instrument named Dix as trustee and his children as a life beneficiary. His grandchild is a remainder man. On these bonds, interest is payable semi-annually on May 1 and November 1. Dix had purchased the bonds at face amount, which was $500,000. As of January 1, year 3, the bonds, and this is at the point he transferred them in to the trust, had a fair market value of $600,000. The trust accounting period is a calendar year. Furthermore, the trust instrument is silent as to whether Dix may revoke the trust. Here's our question. Assuming that the trust is valid, how should the amount of interest received in year three be allocated between principal and income if the trust instrument is otherwise silent? Now, this is one of those examples where there are a lot of red herring comments in here. Whether the trust is revocable or irrevocable is not really a major issue in here. We are focused really on only one question, allocation of $60,000 between principal, and income. Now, you might say, well, gee, we picked up $60,000 of income, which is 12% of $500,000. That's the amount of interest paid on the bonds. That's clearly current income and should be allocated to the income beneficiaries. That would be answer A. No, none goes to principal. $60,000 goes to income. We could get $72,000 by saying it's 12% of the $600,000 fair market value of the bonds. That would be answer B if we allocate all $72,000 to income and zero to principal. 
Let's stop there for just a second because as good accountants, you know that we are not computing bond interest based on the fair market value of the securities. It's based on their face amount. So we can quickly strike answer B, which has $72,000 in it, and answer D, which allocates $72,000 between principal and income as $12,000 and $60,000. So let's take out B and D immediately. And let's focus only on A, which was zero and 60, or C, where 10,000 is allocated to principal and 50,000 allocated to current income. $60,000 is the interest received by the trust. However, part of that two months of the interest income for November and December was accrued prior to the bonds being transferred into trust on January 1st. Therefore, of the $60,000 received during the year, only 10 twelfths belongs properly to the current income beneficiaries, and $10,000 of that should be added to principal because that was the amount accrued prior to the transfer of the securities into the trust. Answer C is the only one that gets us 10000 to principal, 50000 to income. This is a very deceptive problem, but you need to think through both your accounting principles, your understanding of bond interest calculations, and then put that in context of the structure of the transfer into trust. Question number nine. Maybe we should get a simpler question this time. Absent specific directions, which of the following parties will ordinarily receive the assets of the terminated trust? A, the income beneficiaries, B, the remainder man, C, the grantor, or D, the trustee? This should be a gimme for you. First, the trustee is not going to get the assets because what is the trustee? A fiduciary put in place to manage the assets of the trust while they are in trust. So no, they do not go to the trustee. Answer D is wrong. The grantor, that was the person who created the trust and transferred the assets into the trust. Absent specific directions, no, the grantor is not getting the assets when it terminates. Answer C is wrong. Answer A, the income beneficiaries. Under the trust arrangements, they receive the income of the trust during the term of the trust. They're not getting the corpus when the trust terminates. A is incorrect. And by default, which you knew as soon as you read the question, the remainder man gets the remainder. The remainder man receives the corpus, the race of the trust, upon its termination. Answer B, boy, is the correct answer for problem number nine. Moving over to question number 10, generally an estate is liable for which debts owed by the decedent at the time of death? So I'm taking you out of the trust scenario now, we're back into estates. Generally an estate is liable for all of the decedent's debts, answer A. Only debts secured by the decedent's property, answer B. Only debts covered by the statute of frauds, answer C. Or D, none of the decedent's debts. Well, there are many people who are beneficiaries of estates who'd love the answer D to be correct, but that's not right. When a decedent dies, he has obligations. He or she has obligations to various parties. Last medical bills, funeral costs, uh, they could be deeds, uh, mortgages on property, there could be accounting uh, fees owed, there could be credit card debt. All debts of the decedent must be paid from the decedent's estate. Answer A is the correct one. Answer D, none of the decedent's debts, clearly incorrect. Only debts secured by the decedent's property, not true, because you may have a decedent with any number of debts that are not secured, credit card debt, medical bills being two prime examples. So B is clearly incorrect. And debts covered by the statute of frauds, no, the statute of frauds requires writings for certain contracts, and clearly C is just off the wall, so you scratch that one out immediately. Answer 10, problem 10's answer should be A, all of the decedent's debts. Let's move 
on to our last five problems, beginning with problem number 11. On the death of a grantor, which of the following testamentary trust would fail? Now remember, a testamentary trust is set up by will upon the decedent's death. A, a trust created to promote public welfare. B, a trust created to provide for a spouse's health care. C, a trust created to benefit a charity. Or D, a trust created to benefit a childless person's grandchildren. Well, there's no problem at all with creating a trust to promote public welfare. A is acceptable. A trust created to provide for a spouse's health care? Absolutely. This is frequently done. It's very common uh, upon the death of a, a decedent to leave a trust for a spouse's health care. B is perfectly appropriate. C, a trust created to benefit a charity. Many individuals set up trust uh, with charitable beneficiaries at their death. C is appropriate. That leaves us with D, and let's see why D is incorrect. A trust created to benefit a childless person's grandchildren. Well, first, it's highly unlikely a childless person is going to have a grandchild, but leaving that aside, there's a larger problem. This is something called the rule against perpetuities, and you may have heard it. It is one of the things that they try and scare all law students with when we talk about estates and trust. The rule against perpetuities says that you cannot pass property to a person who is more th in a generation that is more than 21 years plus a life in being. There is no child here to give uh, that life in being of vitality. Clearly we can have, we cannot have a trust created to benefit a childless person's grandchild. It's one, it seems to be physically impossible, but two, it's also a violation of the rule against perpetuities. A little gratuitous problem for you. Problem number 12. A distinguishing feature between the making of an inter vivos gift and the creation of a trust is that A. A gift may be made orally, whereas a trust must be a signed writing. B. Generally, a gift is irrevocable, whereas a trust may be revoked in certain cases. C. In order to create a valid trust, the creator must receive some form of consideration. D. The beneficiary of a trust must be notified of the trust creation. Well, let's look at A first. A gift may be made orally, whereas a trust must be assigned writing. No, you can make an oral trust. You, uh, it's entirely possible. Most trusts are in writing, uh, must be assigned writing, but you can have an oral trust. Uh, you can also make a gift uh, with a written uh, document. So answer A is incorrect. Answer B, generally a gift is irrevocable, whereas a trust may be revoked in certain cases. Yes, generally a gift is irrevocable. I suppose it's possible for you to say, I'm giving this to you, and turn around a week later saying, I want it back, uh, but that's highly unusual. A trust always can be revoked uh, until it goes to the irrevocable uh, status upon the death of the grantor or if the trust agreement says it's irre uh, irrevocable. But as a general rule, a trust may be revoked. So answer B appears to be the correct answer. Answer C, in order to create a valid trust, the creator must receive some form of consideration. Absolutely not. There is no need for consideration in the creation of a trust. This is generally a gratuitous event. Uh, it's done out of uh, love and affection in many, many cases, so there is no need for consideration. C is clearly wrong. And D, the beneficiary of a trust must be notified of the trust creation? Not at all. You could create a trust and not tell the beneficiary of the trust creation. As a matter of fact, uh, as I was telling you in my example, when I set up the uh, grandchildren's trust, although I told their father about the creation of the trust, the child was about six hours old when the trust came into being, and certainly there was no notification at that time. The answer D is incorrect. The only correct answer is B. Generally, a gift is irrevocable, whereas a trust may be revoked in certain cases. Moving on to problem number 13. In a written trust containing no specific powers, 
the trustee will have all of the following implied powers except, now notice it's implied powers except, the right to sell property, answer A, the power to pay management expenses, answer B, answer C, the power to accumulate income, and answer D, employ a CPA to prepare trust tax returns. Well, a trustee has responsibility to manage the trust, pay the expenses, make the necessary accountings and filings for the trust to be in good standing. By managing that trust, it also means that the trustee has implied powers to sell, invest, and reinvest the trust assets. Answer A is an implied power of a trustee. Since they must manage the trust, the trustee has implied powers to pay management expenses. Answer B. Answer D. In that management responsibility and preparing necessary accountings and reportings, the trustee does have the implicit power to employ a CPA to prepare the tax returns. Answer D. So the, all those A, B, and D answers are implied powers of the trustee. However, the trustee does not have the power to accumulate income. Answer C. That power must be given as part of a complex trust in the trust agreement. All right, so answer C is the correct answer. Let's move over to problem number 14 now. We're coming to a conclusion here. We're a couple more problems to go, so hang in there. Cord's will created a trust to take effect on Cord's death. The will named Cord's spouse as both the trustee and the executor of the estate. So this surviving spouse is going to both administer the estate and be the trustee of the trust. The will provided that all of Cord's securities were to be transferred to the trust and named Cord's child as the beneficiary of the trust. Under these circumstances, has Cord created an inter vivos trust? Answer A. Cord has created a testamentary trust? Answer B. Possibly C. The trust is invalid because it will not become effective until Cord's death? Or answer D. Cord's spouse may not serve as both the trustee and personal representative because of the inherent conflict of interest. All right, what has Cord created here? He created a trust upon his death. That is a testamentary trust. That is answer B, and that is the correct answer. Remember that an inter vivos trust is created during the life of the grantor. That would be answer A, and because this was created by Cord upon his death through his will, answer A is incorrect. Is the answer C even possibly correct? The trust is invalid because it will not become effective until Cord's death? No. We said in answer B, the correct answer, that it's a testamentary trust. It comes into effect at Cord's death. Therefore, it's valid at that time. Answer C, clearly incorrect. Answer D is a more interesting question. Is Cord's spouse in an inherent conflict of interest because she is both the trustee and the personal representative? And the answer is no, there's not a conflict of interest here. As the executor of the estate, she must wind up, pay the debts, distribute the assets. The assets are to be distributed to the trust. And at that point, the estate ends. Her responsibility as executor are over. The trusts are in trust for which she is trustee. There is no inherent conflict between the trustee of those assets and having been the executor who transferred the assets. Answer D is incorrect. Problem number 14, only answer B, Cord created a testamentary trust which became valid at his death. That is the correct answer to problem 14. Last one, you're ending the problem set with this question. Which of the following would ordinarily be distributed to an income trust beneficiary or the income beneficiary, the one who receives annual income? Could it be one royalties? Two, stock received in a stock split. Three, cash dividends. Or four, settlement of claims for damages to trust property. Now remember we talked about the income beneficiary gets the ordinary recurring annual income and is charged with the ordinary annual expenses. Extraordinary expenses, unusual capital transactions are part of the corpus, the race, and are allocated to the remainder man. So are royalties annual income? Yes, they are. How about stock received in a stock split? 
No, here we're looking about splitting the corpus and getting ad additional stock to the remainder man. It is part of the corpus. Stock is the basis of the trust. So answer two would not be appropriate. Three, cash dividends, certainly annual income. That would go to the income trust beneficiary. And four, settlement of claims for damages. That's an extraordinary transaction. It was damages to the trust property or the trust corpus. So that should be allocated to the remainder man. We're looking for an answer that has one and three as it being allocated to the trust beneficiary. The only possible answer is B as in boy. Let's turn now to fiduciary relationships in the context of an agency. An agency is a consensual relationship whereby one person, the agent, agrees to act on behalf of and under the control of another person, who is usually called the principal. An agent has the authority to represent that principal in contractual matters so as to affect the legal relationship between the principal and third parties. You can think of it in one sense as the agent being the intermediary between his or her principal and the parties that wish to deal with that principle. Let's focus on a couple of quick definitions here to set the stage. An agent is anyone authorized to act on behalf of another. The principal is the person on whose behalf that agent acts. An example of agents, very often corporate officers, they are agents of the board of directors. They are appointed by the corporate board to run the company. They are agents of the board. Well, how about the board of directors? They too are agents. They are agents of the shareholders who are the owners of the corporations. So now here we see a context where the board of directors is the agent of the shareholders and the principal of the corporate officers who are their agents. We frequently think about agency only in the context of something like a sales agent or somebody specifically named. But the concept is much, much broader than that. I just mentioned the leadership of a corporation, but do you realize that as an employee, you are also an agent? You are an agent of your employer. You are charged with carrying out certain functions and duties of your employer in dealing with third parties, perhaps customers or clients. Sometimes this employer-employee relationship is called, unfortunately, a master-servant relationship. Hopefully, whatever your work environment, it tends to be more of the employer-employee rather than a master-servant. But that is an old term that has been used in the employment context. In contrast to the employee, there is the independent contractor. An independent contractor is not an agent of the employer or the principal. An independent contractor is not subject to the same degree of control, and they do not fall under this agency definition. Often there is a common law 20-factor test, which is used to distinguish employees from independent contractors. And that classification is somewhat beyond the scope of our discussion now, uh, but you will see it recur in a number of other contexts, including uh, taxation and contract law. Forms of the agreement. Now, there is no consideration required to establish an agency relationship. You don't even have to have a written agreement, with two exceptions. There must be a written agency agreement if the agency will last more than one year, or the agent is authorized to sell real estate. And these two exceptions seem to hark back a little bit to the statute of frauds that we talked about uh, in our contract analysis. But except in those two cases, a written agreement is not required. My personal opinion is that in most situations, a written agreement is very, very helpful just to spell out the rights and obligations of all the parties, but it's not required. Now, there is the question of what authority does the agent have in dealing with third parties on behalf of their principal? 
There are three different concepts of authority here. Express authority is where the principal tells the agent that he or she is authorized to do certain acts. A classic example of this is the real estate agent. If I have, for instance, a rental property and I have an agent that is going to be my rental agent, I will sign an agreement that says, Barbara, you are authorized to advertise my property for rent, review the application of the prospective tenants, recommend, after reviewing this material, recommend a tenant to me, prepare the lease, get it executed, collect the deposits, uh, collect the rents, and uh, forward those on to me. I'm giving express written authority to the agent to handle my rental property. There's also the implied authority. And here the agent acts reasonably in a manner that is necessary and proper to carry out express authority. So it's not the express words, it is what is implied over and beyond the express to carry out what has already been delegated. And for instance, in my implied authority of the real estate agent I was talking about, there might be such implied authority as requesting references from a prospective tenant. Since I had asked the agent to vet these individuals, the prospective tenants, this implies that she may ask for bank records, perhaps uh, call their prior landlord to see what their history of payment was, uh, perhaps even to ask for information from an employer. So all of these are implied acts that build upon the express authority I gave to my real estate agent. Let's turn to the third and perhaps uh, more complex one, which is something called apparent authority. In this case, the principal, by words or conduct, leads a third party to believe that the person may act on the principal's behalf. This is sometimes called agency by estoppel. And maybe I could illustrate this best with a situation from a few years ago that I was involved in. I was an employee working for a company that was purchasing something called Safe Harbor Benefits. It was a tax law program. And so the company that I worked for was buying benefits from companies around the country. The Congress began to question what they had done in setting up these safe harbor leasing transactions and decided to close the program down. They set a prospective date, midnight on a date about a week after the Congress had acted, as the last day on which you could do one of these deals. So our company had been negotiating with a number of uh, sellers over the country. One individual had a package that we were very interested in and we worked out what we thought was a final deal. The individual was going to fly into Washington on the day, the last possible day for doing the deals. And the flight coming from the west arrived at Dulles Airport at about 11.20 in the evening. We had to have the transaction done by midnight. Well, the company had given me the authority to go to the airport and execute the purchase transaction. I had expressed authority to conclude this sale. And this included the implied authority to do everything necessary to settle up the current contract that we had finished negotiating about 8.30 by phone. I carried with me a couple of checks to make payment. The checks were, we didn't know exactly the amount of the goods that were being sold to us that was still being worked out as the plane was flying east. So I had two blank checks for, I had authority to sign up to $20 million on the check, only one check, not $40 million, uh, and return the uh, other check back to the company the next day. So in this sense, I had the express authority to close the deal. I had the implied authority to do everything it took to close the deal that we had negotiated on the phone. Uh, the amount was still to be determined, but the terms of the contract were very well set. However, there was apparent authority for me to make modifications, if necessary, to do the deal. And by that I mean the seller understood we were buying. The company understood we were purchasing the benefits from these sellers. We thought we had a contract all worked out, all of the details locked down, 
signed off by the top executives of our company and by the seller. However, if something transpired in the last hour of that flight into Dulles Airport that necessitated a change, then I had the apparent authority to modify, in consultation with our, with our outside lawyers who were there, to modify the contract in order to get the deal done. That would have been the apparent authority that extended to me from my employer. The reason being, the principal, my employer, by words or conduct, led the third party, the seller, to believe that the person, me the agent, could act on the principal's behalf. Here I was going beyond what was either expressed or implied in the contract that had been discussed over the phone for hours. Now let's move on to duties of both the fiduciary and the principal. And let's begin with the fiduciary's duty. The agent owes a duty of loyalty to the principal. However, the principal does not owe a duty of loyalty to the agent. This is a one-way street. The agent must be loyal to his principal. The principal, of course, may use other agents and does not have an exclusive loyalty to that agent. The agent owes a duty of care to the principal. In contrast, the principal owes a duty of compensation to the agent. So on these three fiduciary duties and obligations, the agent owes a duty of loyalty to the principal, but the principal not back to the agent. The agent owes a duty of care to the principal, and the principal owes a duty of compensation to the agent. The agent may be fired by the principal and sued for any profits that may have been made by that agent in any dealings which are a breach of the fiduciary duty the agent owes to the principal. The principal's liability extends this way. The principal is liable for all authorized acts of the agent. So the principal is responsible for the authorized acts of the agent. However, that principal is never liable for the unauthorized acts of the principal unless and let me stress this again. The general rule is the principal is not liable for unauthorized acts of the agent. However, the, if the agent commits an unauthorized act and the principal ratifies that act, in other words, says it's okay with me, then the principal will be liable for the act. There are several considerations in the ratification process. First of all, an undisclosed principal cannot ratify an act of an, an unauthorized act of an agent. The principal must be known to the third party. So that's rule number one. Rule number two, the principal must have knowledge of all the material facts in order to make a ratification valid. And three, the principal must expressly or impliedly ratify the act of the agent. And let me give you a, an example of this ratification for an unauthorized act. I don't recommend this to you as uh, budding CPAs. But early in my career, I was with a major accounting firm. I was in the tax department. And the rules of the firm were tax returns, even extensions, could only be signed by partners or by senior managers who were delegated that authority. Nevertheless, on an April 15th, early in my career, I was the last one in the office about 10 o'clock in the evening. We always left one person there until midnight to answer any questions the clients might have had at the very last minute. So I was delegated that duty. By the way, that duty of delegation was to sit there and answer questions, not sign tax returns. But that evening, one of our clients, an existing client, came in and needed an extension for a new entity he created, which we were not aware of. It was a surprise. We couldn't do the tax return. We didn't have the information. He was still pulling things together, but he wanted to get an extension in the mail. I pulled out an extension form, filled it in, and signed. We submitted it that day to meet the deadline. The next morning, I told the partner that the circumstances of what had transpired after being told I shouldn't uh, sign tax returns when I'm not authorized, I said, I understand that. I'm duly chastised, but what was my choice? 
The partner said, you did the right thing. I now know all the facts. I have the knowledge of the material facts. I expressly ratify your act of sending this in. And then they called the client to say, yes, it was done. This was approved and the partners knew about it. They would then move forward to file the return on a timely basis. So ratification did occur. There was a disclosed principle. I told the principal all the material facts and the principal not only expressly ratified, but expressly informed the client of that ratification. An agent's liability. We talked about the principal's liability just a moment ago. Now let's look at the agent's liability. The agent is liable for un all unauthorized acts because remember I said the authorized acts are shifted from the agent over to the principal, but the principal is not liable for unauthorized acts. The agent is liable for unauthorized acts. Now, as in every case we talk about on this program, there's an exception. The agent is not liable for authorized acts unless he is acting for an undisclosed principal. So if the third party does not know who the principal the agent is working for, that agent is liable for the authorized act. Let's talk about what an undisclosed principle is. And I think you can probably guess. The agent executes an agreement in his or her name while acting for a secret principle. And the most common situation that's involved here is in assembling real estate packages. Uh, I can give you the example up in the Washington metropolitan area where you may want to do a redevelopment. There are six houses in a block. They're old. They're not uh, particularly attractive. A builder wants to come in, redevelop that block. In order to do so, he needs to acquire all six properties, wants to raise the six properties, put in a whole new, let's just say, townhouse development uh, of 45 townhouses in place of six single-family homes that were built in the 1940s. Well, if the homeowners know that the Norman uh, Real Estate Corporation is trying to buy those homes, it's going to be difficult to assemble them at a reasonable price. So the Norman Real Estate Agency hires the Parks Agency to purchase those homes secretly. And in all candor, the Norman Real Estate Agency will probably hire three different agents, each one tasked with trying to get to the properties. The idea is to assemble all of these for the undisclosed uh, principal at the lowest possible cost so then the deal can come together. That is the undisclosed principal, the agents acting for them. If there is a breach of the contract, both the agent and the principal are liable. The agent, because that's who the third party thought they were dealing with, the principal, because that is who authorized the transaction. The third party dealing with an undisclosed principle cannot cancel the deal just because there's an undisclosed principle. If these home sellers suddenly said, oh my God, it was Norman's Real Estate Development Corporation. If we'd known that, we never would have sold. Well, I'm sorry, they can't cancel the contract just because they didn't know that I was the person assembling the tract of land. So the third party cannot cancel. But once the third party finds out about the undisclosed principle, they can sue both the agent and the principal for any breach of contract. Let's shift over now to a concept that came out of the English common law again, and we're going to pick up another Latin phrase, the doctrine of respondeat superior. In other words, the principal is going to be liable for the acts of the agent. The principal is vicariously liable for torts. Remember, these are not criminal acts. These are civilian damage uh, acts. They're not contracts again. They're torts. The principal is liable for the torts of its agent if the agent is acting with the, within the scope of actual or apparent authority. So if an agent acts within its authority and commits a tort, the principal will be liable for that under the doctrine of respondeat superior. Negligent agents are also liable in their own right. 
an employee who is injured within the scope of employment, even if they're negligent, can collect workers' compensation for that injury. This is one of the regulatory regimes that was set up to try and uh, make employees whole if they are injured within the scope of their employment. And generally, a principal is not liable for an agent's crime unless the principal has participated in that crime. So if, for instance, uh, let's take a, an agent, let's talk about this doctrine and the concept of an agent who is driving a delivery van for the principal. The agent is speeding, runs a red light, and injures a pedestrian who is crossing a crosswalk legally. Is the principal liable for the tort damage caused by the agent? The answer there is yes, the agent is acting within the scope of his authority. He is driving uh, during the commission of this tort action. But suppose the individual is now, the agent, is now arrested by, by the police and charged with the crime of driving at 110 miles an hour, reckless endangerment, fleeing from a police pursuit. The principal is not going to be liable for the agent's criminal actions, but may be liable for the tort action because it appears in this particular case that the, act, the agent was acting within the scope of his authority on delivery, just doing so recklessly and endangering others. Agencies, as I said at the beginning, can be created without compensation, can be created orally, can be created in writing, although I personally favor a writing for virtually all agencies. How can the agency be terminated? Agencies generally are terminable at will. In other words, we simply say, Dear Mr. Agent, I no longer am interested in having you as my agent. You are terminated. However, the principal may be liable for breach of contract. The agent may have had a contract for, let's say, six months. If the contract is terminated prior to that time, there is a breach of contract and there may be a liability. Now, in my example, I said the principal fires the agent. Can the agent fire the principal? Of course. The agency may be terminated by either party at will. And again, either party may be liable for breach of contract. The agent may be unhappy with the principal. The principal may be unhappy with the agent. Either can end it. However, don't you love my however sprinkled throughout this? However is an exception. If there is an agency coupled with an interest, the principal cannot terminate the agency. Now, what is an agency coupled with an interest? That is when a principal will transfer property to an agent in addition to establishing the agency relationship. And a common example might be, the principal says, Dear agent, if you will represent me in this transaction, I will transfer 30% of this real estate property to you. So I'm giving you an interest in the property. I want you to market and sell it. You're going to get uh, whatever sales price it is. Uh, you're going to get your 30% interest, uh, and I get the rest. This is not a percentage sales interest. It is a transfer of a property interest. And be very clear, there is a difference. You can compensate an agent with a percentage. Dear agent, sell this property for me, and you get a 30% of the proceeds. That is not an agency with an interest. The agency with an interest is when the property interest itself, title to it, is transferred to the agent. That type of agency arrangement cannot be terminated. Death or insanity of either party terminates an agency. Bankruptcy of a principal terminates the agency, but bankruptcy of the agent does not terminate the agency. So in the bankruptcy, the principal's bankruptcy does, the agent's does not. On death or insanity, it's either the principal or the agent will terminate the agency. Once an agency is over, then the principal has a problem. The principal must give notice. 
because until customers know that the agency is over, then what happens? That agent still has apparent authority to operate for the principal. He has been operating that way. People who dealt with the agent on behalf of the principal assume he still has that authority. So the principal must give notice to old customers, and that notice must be actual notice. He must tell them that he has terminated the agent or the agent himself has terminated the relationship. The principal must also give constructive notice to new customers. This may be by publication, uh, flyers, some type of way of saying, if you come and deal with my agent, he no longer has authority to operate for me. So it's actual notice to old customers, constructive notice to new customers. You have had a review now of agency. And let's talk about a couple of those concepts before we look at the problem. What kind of agents are we, do we have? We have agents that have express authority, agents that have implied authority, agents that have apparent authority. We have disclosed principles, and we have undisclosed principles. In the agency arrangements, who's liable? The principal is generally liable for all authorized acts of the agent. The principal is not liable for unauthorized acts of the agent unless that principal ratifies the acts of the agent. The agent is not liable for authorized acts. The agent is liable for negligence. The agent is also liable for dealings with third parties on behalf of undisclosed principals. With those thoughts in mind, do you think you can answer problem 16 through 30? I'm sure you can, and in just a moment we'll be back to review the answers. Let's begin with problem 16, which states, a principal and agent relationship requires A, a written agreement, B, a power of attorney, C, a meeting of the minds and consent to act, or D, specified consideration. Well, as you will recall from our earlier conversation, no specified consideration is required to create an agency relationship. You can immediately eliminate D as a possible answer. In addition, we said that a principal agency relationship can be created either orally or in writing. So a written agreement is not required and answer A is wrong. Now a power of attorney is indeed a principal agency relationship. And you will frequently see that people execute durable powers of attorney or revocable powers of attorney. But creating a power of attorney is not necessary for a principal agency relationship. It is simply one form of such a relationship. Answer B is incorrect. What is required to establish such a relationship is a meeting of the minds between the principal and the agent and a consent for the, of the agent to act on behalf of the principal. Answer C is the correct answer for problem number 16. In 17, we're asked which of the following statements represents a principal's duty to an agent who works on a commission basis. Statement number one, the principal is required to maintain pertinent records, account to the agent, and pay the agent according to the terms of their agreement. And statement two reads, the principal is required to reimburse the agent for all authorized expenses incurred unless the agreement calls for the agent to pay expenses out of the commission. Well, as we were reviewing the principal's obligations to the agent, we said that the principal does have an obligation to compensate the agent for his efforts. That would include maintaining records, making payment, and reimbursing authorized expenses. 
Statement number one talks about maintaining those records and paying the agent according to the terms. That's clearly an appropriate answer. And statement two deals with the reimbursement for authorized expenses. That also is a correct statement. So we're looking for answer C. Both one and two represent a principal's duty to an agent who works on a commission basis. Problem 17, answer C. In problem 18, we move over to a gentleman named Blue, who's a used car dealer. And Blue appointed Gage as his agent to sell his cars. Gage is authorized by Blue to appoint sub-agents to assist in the sales. Vond was appointed as a sub-agent. And now the question is, to whom does Vond owe a fiduciary duty? A, to Gage only, B, to Blue only, C, to both Blue and Gage, D, to neither Blue nor Gage. Well, you should have clearly read this problem and immediately known that answer D was inappropriate. Of course, Vaughn owes a fiduciary duty, so D is an incorrect answer. But to whom does Vaughn owe that fiduciary duty? First, he owes it to the person who appointed him, to Vaughn's principal, and that is Gage. So Vaughn does owe an obligation to Gage as his principal. But because Gage had been appointed by Blue, there is a chain here, and Vaughn owes a fiduciary duty also to Blue through the chain of appointments. So the correct answer is C. Vaughn owes his fiduciary duty to both Blue and Gage, in one case as an agent, in the other as a sub-agent. Now contrast with this with the situation that Blue did not authorize Gage to appoint sub-agents, but Gage turns on his own and appoints Vond as his agent. So now we don't have a sub-agency relationship, we have purely two agency relationships, one from Blue to Gage, one from Gage to Vond. In this case, Vond only owes his fiduciary obligations to his principal, Gage. He does not reach back to Blue in his responsibilities because he is not a sub-agent of Blue, he is only a direct agent of Gage. As the question number 18 was written, the answer is both Gage and Blue, answer C. Moving over to problem number 19, North Inc. hired Sutter as a purchasing agent. North gave Sutter written authorization to purchase without limit electronic appliances. Later, Sutter was told not to purchase more than 300 of each appliance. So in effect, North is putting a restriction on Sutter. Sutter contracted with Orr Corporation to purchase 500 tape recorders, clearly an amount in excess of the 300. Orr had previously been shown Sutter's written authorization. Which of the following statements is correct? A. Sutter will be liable to Orr because Sutter's actual authority was exceeded. Sutter will not be liable to reimburse North if North is liable to Orr. North will be liable to Orr because of Sutter's actual and apparent authority. And D, North will not be liable to Orr because Sutter's actual authority was exceeded. This may be one of the more complex questions we're going through here, so let's take it step by step. First A, Sutter will be liable to Orr because Sutter's actual authority was exceeded. Well, Sutter is not liable to Orr because although the actual authority was exceeded, Sutter appears to have, has apparent authority to continue to operate for North. So answer A is wrong. Sutter will not be liable to reimburse North if North is liable to Orr. Well, North did operate for a disclosed principal, and as we recall, a disclosed principal is liable for the acts of the agent. The agent is not. This B answer is not correct here, although North is going to be liable to Orr. C. North will be liable to Orr because of Sutter's actual and apparent authority. 
Now, this is the correct answer, and here's why. North authorization for Sutter to operate as his agent was shown to Orr. Orr believed that Sutter had authority, and it's apparent authority, to operate for North. There was the express authority that he was going to act, and that meant that he could continue to do the transactions that Orr believed he could do. North's limitation on Sutter did not get conveyed to Orr. So Orr is still assuming that Sutter has actual and apparent authority to act in any way for North. This is the correct answer. And finally, in answer D, proposed answer D, North will not be liable to Orr because Sutter's actual authority was exceeded. Yes, it's true that Orr, uh, that Sutter exceeded his actual authority, but he had apparent authority in dealing with, uh, with Orr, and as a consequence, North will be liable to Orr for this problem. So this is an issue of really North having to get his message out to Orr that Sutter could only deal up to 300 items of purchase. Having not done so, then Sutter still had the apparent authority to deal with Orr and bind North. Complex question, a little bit of detailed analysis, but C is the correct answer to problem number 19. Problem 20. Trent was retained in writing to act as post agent for the sale of post memorabilia collection. Which of the following statements is correct? 1. To be an agent, Trent must be at least 21 years of age. Statement 2. Post would be liable to Trent if the collection was destroyed before Trent found a purchaser. Well, first, looking at the statement 1, there is no age limitation, no minimum age, no maximum age for an agent. The agent simply must be competent to conduct the business. So statement one is incorrect. Trent does not have to be at least 21 years of age. Statement number two talks about the property being destroyed. Well, Post is not liable, Post who is the principal, is not liable to his agent if the collection is destroyed before it's sold for the very simple reason that once the collection is destroyed, there is no task for Trent to carry out. He has not fulfilled his agency relationship because he has nothing to sell. So neither statement one nor statement two is correct. The answer to problem 20 is D, David. Problem number 21 reads, Noel gives Carr a written power of attorney. Which of the following statements is correct regarding this power of attorney? It must be signed by both Noel and Carr. It must be for a definitive period of time. It may contain, continue in existence after Noel's death. It may limit Carr's authority to a specific transaction. Well, normally a power of attorney is only signed by the principal who is delegating the authority to the agent. It does not have to be signed by both parties. So answer A is incorrect. It must be for a definite or definitive period of time is not true. You can have an open-ended power of attorney. I have a power of attorney delegating my wife to act in my behalf. There is no specific time period for that, uh, that power of attorney. It is indefinite. So answer B is incorrect. Answer C, the power of attorney may continue after Noel's death. No, this is incorrect because I am giving my agent the power to act on my behalf. If I am dead, there is no power that I can delegate to that agent. They cannot carry on after my death. Answer C is wrong. But answer D is correct because a power of attorney may limit Carr's authority to a specific transaction. Complete an example here would be, although I have given my wife an unlimited power of attorney, and in my particular case over all transactions, I might give my brother a power of attorney to sell my automobile, saying that I'm going to be out of the country for three months uh, or three years. I don't need the car. Here, Jim, you have specific authority to sell my automobile and put the proceeds in my checking account. So that's a limited power of attorney 
It is answer D. It is the correct answer for problem number 21. Problem number 22. Which of the following acts, if committed by an agent, will cause a principal, a principal to be liable to a third party? A. A negligent act committed by an independent contractor in performance of the contract, which results in injury to a third party. B. An intentional tort committed by an employee outside the scope of employment, which results in injury to a third party. C. An employee's failure to notify the employer of a dangerous condition that results in injury to a third party. And four, a negligent act committed by an employee outside the scope of employment that results in injury to a third party. Well, let's go back and look at these four again carefully because some variation on this question is likely to be on the examination that you will be taking. This is a classic scope of authority type of question. So, situation A. We know that this is an incorrect answer first and foremost because it is the act of an independent contractor. There is no fiduciary relationship. There is no principal agent. It is an independent contractor. Even though there is injury and the independent contractor was acting for or doing something for a principal, nevertheless, there is no liability. B, an intentional tort committed by an employee outside the scope of employment, which results in injury. Now, remember that when we talked about the doctrine of respondeat superior, we said that the employee had to be acting within or inside the scope of his employment. So here we have an intentional tort committed outside the scope of employment. Clearly, this is an incorrect answer. We look at C, an employee's failure to notify the employer. Well, now we're into the master-servant relationship, and that employee has an obligation to inform his employer of the dangerous condition, since it results in an injury to the third party, and the employee's failure gave rise to that, that is a breach of fiduciary duty uh, on, behalf, on the part of the employee, but under the doctrine of respondeat superior, which is a tortious act, here the, the principal will be liable, or the employer will be liable to that third party. Answer C is the correct answer. And answer D, a negligent act committed by an employee outside the scope of employment that results in injury. Again, once you see outside the scope of employment, you can rule this answer out. D is incorrect. The only correct answer is C for problem 22. Problem 23. Which of the following rights will a third party be entitled to, to after validly contracting with an agent representing and notice this word, an undisclosed principle. So these are rights for the third party dealing with an agent representing an undisclosed principle. Does the third party have a right to disclose disclosure of the principle? No. The principle may remain undisclosed. The principle stays out of the picture and the third party looks only to the agent. Answer A is wrong. Does the third party have the right to ratification of the contract by the principal? No. Again, the undisclosed principal stays out. The agent is liable on the contract, may be sued by the third party to enforce the contract. So B is also incorrect. Answer C. Does the third party have the right to demand that the agent perform the contract? This is absolutely correct because this is the essence of an agent acting for the undisclosed principle. The third party looks to the agent for the performance of the contract. And D, does the third party have a right to void the contract after disclosure of the principle? This again flies right in the face of our statements during the lecture earlier in this program. The third party is bound by their dealings with the agent and may not void the contract. That device of being the undisclosed principle is frequently one reason why that principle does not want to be known to the third party. Answer C.
We're back to the table format for problem number 24. And we are asked, when a valid contract is entered into by an agent on the principal's behalf in a non-disclosed principal situation, which of the following statements concerning the principal's liability is correct? Now, having just gone through problem number 23, you should have nailed this one close nailed this one absolutely closed. Here are the two statements. The principal may be held liable once disclosed. Well, yes, that's true. Normally, it's the agent that's being held liable because the principal does not wish to be disclosed. But once disclosed, the principal as well as the agent may both be held liable. So that answer is yes. The principal must ratify the contract to be held liable. Absolutely not. Once the agent has signed the contract with the third party, the principal is bound and is not required to ratify. The agent was acting within the scope of his authority and binds the principal. So we're looking for a yes for statement one, a no for statement two. The only correct answer is B as in boy for problem number 24. Problem number 25 is another table question. Which of the following is or are available to a principal when an agent fraudulently breaches a fiduciary duty. Can the principal terminate the agency? Yes. A principal can terminate an agency whenever he wishes to, uh, but clearly a breach of fiduciary duty, that would lead to a termination of the agency. So that answer should be yes. Does the principal have a right to a constructive trust? And again, the answer is yes, but let's explain what a constructive trust is. This is a trust created by a court to provide an equitable remedy for the principal. In effect, what it says is anything that the uh, agent derived as a benefit because of its breach of duty is being held in trust for the principal. That's a constructive trust. So the principal has a right to termination of the agency, has a right to a constructive trust. Two yes answers. The only possible answer to problem 25 is A. Turning to problem 26, we find that Bolt Corporation dismissed ACE as its general sales agent. It notified all of ACE's known customers by letter. Young Corporation, a retail outlet which was located outside of ACE's previously assigned sales territory, had never dealt with ACE. However, Young knew of ACE as a result of various business contacts. After his dismissal, ACE sold Young goods to be delivered by Bolt and received from Young a cash deposit for 20% of the purchase price. It was not unusual for an agent in ACE's previous position to receive such cash deposits. In an action by Young against Bolt of the sales contract, Young will A, lose because Ace lacked any implied authority to make the contract, B, lose because Ace lacked any express authority to make the contract, win because Bolt's notice was inadequate to terminate Ace's apparent authority, or win because, principal is an, because a principal is an insurer of an agent's acts. Well, let's look first at answer D. Nowhere in principal agency law is a principal an insurer of an agent's acts. Yes, the agent acts on behalf of the principal. The principal has certain duties and responsibilities with respect to the agent and the agent with respect to the principal. But there is no insurance arrangement, no insurance principal between that agent and the party for whom it is acting. So answer D should be eliminated. Now let's go look and decide whether Young should win or should lose against Bolt. And the question hangs on what authority Ace had. What happened when Bolt terminated Ace's relationship is they gave actual notice to Ace's employee, former uh, customers, but they did not attempt to give constructive notice to others who might have come across Ace as an agent. As a consequence, ACE still has apparent authority to act on Bolt's behalf, and this will mean that Young is going to prevail. That's answer C. 
Young will win because of Bolt's notice was inadequate to terminate Ace's apparent authority. Knowing that C is the correct answer because Ace had apparent authority means we can now rule out both answers A and B, which say that Young will lose. A says it'll, that Young will lose because Ace lacked implied authority, B because Ace lacked express authority. Though it doesn't matter. Ace had apparent authority. That means that Young will win. Answer C is correct for this problem. Now when we turn to 20, problem 27, we see that, see that Young Corp hired Wilson as a sales representative. It hired him for six months at a salary of $5,000 per month plus 6% of sales. Now, which of the following statements do you believe to be correct? A. Young does not have the power to dismiss Wilson during the six-month period without cause. B. Wilson is obligated to act solely in Young's interest in matters concerning Young's business. C. The agreement between Young and Wilson is not enforceable unless it's in writing and signed by Wilson. Or D. The agreement between Young and Wilson formed an agency coupled with an interest. All right, we step back to A and take a look where it says Young does not have the power to dismiss Wilson. Nonsense. We said earlier on in the program that an agency relationship can be terminated by either party at any time. Now, the terminating party may have a breach of contract issue, but basically an agency relationship is terminable at will. So Young could have fired Wilson at any time. Answer A is incorrect. Answer B. Wilson is obligated to act solely in Young's interest in matters concerning Young's business. Yes, this is one of those fiduciary duties and it's a centerpiece of the agent's responsibility to the principal. An agent must act solely in its principal's best interest in matters dealing with that principal's business activities. Answer B is the correct answer. We look at answer C and D, which we know are wrong because we've already selected B as the correct one. But let's explore why. In answer C, it says the agreement between Young and Wilson is not enforceable unless it's in writing and signed by Wilson. We've said that an agency relationship can be either oral or written. There are two exceptions which do require a writing for an agency relationship. They both derive from the statute of frauds. One is if the agency relationship extends over a period of more than one year or it involves the sale of real estate. Since neither was involved in the relationship between Young and Wilson, this is an inappropriate answer. The statute of frauds is not applicable. Finally, D talks about the agreement established an agency coupled with an interest. And no, it did not. What Young and Wilson had was an agency relationship in which Wilson was going to be compensated on a percentage of a percentage arrangement. But if you remember when we talked about an agency coupled with an interest, we said property had to be transferred to the agent. There is no transfer of property here. We have not created an agency coupled with an interest. Answer D is incorrect. Now let's move on to one of the tougher problems in this set. It deals with Pine, who's an employee of Global Messenger. He was hired to deliver highly secret corporate documents for Global, Global's clients throughout the world. Unbeknownst to Global, Pine carried a concealed pistol. While Pine was making a delivery, he suspected an attempt was being made to steal the package, drew his gun, and shot Kent, who happened to be an innocent passerby. Kent survived the shooting uh, and has sued Global to recover damages. Now the question you're asked is, Kent will not recover damages from Global if. So remember, our answer has to be one in which Kent will not recover from Global. If A, Global discovered that Pine carried a weapon and did nothing about it. B, Global instructed its messengers not to carry weapons. C. Pine was correct and an attempt was being made to steal the package. 
or D, Pine's weapon was unlicensed and illegal. Now here we're talking about the doctrine of respondeat superior. We have Pine who is an employee of Global. Pine is carrying packages actually within the scope of his employment. He is doing the task that his employer, Global, asked him to do. He did carry a weapon which he had been instructed not to carry. However, it's still part and parcel of the way he is conducting business on behalf of his employer. However, if that weapon was unlicensed and illegal, he's committing a criminal act. If you recall our discussion about respondeat superior, we said that a principal is never liable for a criminal act of its agent unless the principal is complicit or participates in the crime with the agent. Here, Global apparently did not do so, but Pine was engaged in an illegal and criminal act, carrying an unlicensed firearm. D would, be the, would appear to be the correct answer. That if he's carrying an unlicensed and illegal weapon, Global will not be liable. A, B, and C all go to the actions of the employee who is acting within the scope of his authority. He is carrying out the mission of delivering confidential information for its employers, his employer's clients. He may have violated the instructions about carrying weapons, but Global will be liable. So under A, B, and C, Global will be liable to Kent. Take a look at C, for instance. It doesn't make any difference whether Pine was correct or incorrect about Kent's being in the neighborhood, whether he tried to steal the package or not. Global will be liable. Whether or not Global instructed its messengers not to carry weapons, since what Pine was doing was in furtherance of Global's business, Global is still going to be held liable. And if Global discovered and did nothing about it, well, again, Global will be liable. So for this problem, only the illegal act of Pine will exonerate Global from liability to Kent. Question number 29. I gave you a similar fact pattern when we were discussing undisclosed principles earlier in the program. Here, Easy Corp is a real estate developer regularly engages brokers to act on its behalf in acquiring parcels of land. The brokers are authorized to enter into contracts, but are instructed to do so in their own names without disclosing Easy's identity or his relationship to the transaction. Now suppose a broker enters into a contract with a seller on Easy's behalf. We have four statements we need to select one of the four. A. The broker will have the same actual authority as if Easy's identity had been disclosed. B. Easy will be bound by the contract because of the broker's apparent authority. C. Easy will not be liable for any negligent acts committed by the broker while acting on Easy's behalf. Or D. The broker will not be personally bound by the contract because the broker has expressed authority to act. All right, in A, this undisclosed principle sits in the same position as a disclosed principle. The broker has the same actual authority whether or not Easy's identity is or is not disclosed. So answer A is correct. The broker has the same actual authority. Answer B, Easy will be bound by the contract because of the broker's apparent authority. Easy will be bound by the contract because of the broker's express authority. Easy hired the broker, told him to do this. There is apparent authority, but the bigger question goes to express authority. B is not the correct answer. C, Easy will not be liable for any negligent acts committed by the broker. No, we've already said that when a broker is acting on the principal's behalf, the principal will be liable for the negligent acts of that broker when acting on his behalf. And D, the broker will not be personally bound. Of course the principal is bound. The agent is bound first and foremost to the third party, but the principal is also bound when we are in an undisclosed principal situation. So both parties are bound. The third party can sue the undisclosed principal when that identity becomes known, uh, but can hold both of them liable for it. Answer B, C, and D are incorrect. Answer A is the correct answer. 
Problem 30 is the last one in this problem set and reads, generally an agency relationship is terminated by operation of law in all of the following situations except A, the principal's death, B, the principal's incapacity, C, the agent's renunciation of the agency, or D, the agent's failure to acquire a necessary business license. Now you may be a little bit stunned by this question because you're going to say, hold it, all four of these terminate an agency relationship. And on that point you are absolutely correct. Death, incapacity, renunciation, and failure to acquire the licenses all terminate the agency relationship. But three of them, it is by operation of law. And that is A, death, B, incapacity, and D, the agent's failure to acquire a necessary license. Those operate by law. It, the termination set forth in C of the agent's renunciation is not an operation of law. It is an action of the parties to the agency agreement and is the only correct answer to problem number 30. That concludes our review of the agency problems. You are now an expert in agency law. We've just finished reviewing fiduciary relationships in the context of estates, gifts, and agency with principals and agents. If you notice during the entire program, I didn't give you a single mnemonic to memorize. But we did talk about a number of terms, and perhaps it's best to review some of those definitions and set them in context as you make your final preparations to pass the CPA exam. In the estate arena, we need to remember that a individual may die either with a will or without a will. Dying with a will having been executed is to die testate, and an executor is appointed. Dying without a will is leaving an in intestate estate, and an administrator is appointed to take care of the estate. The biggest definitional piece for you to worry about in looking at estate problems is how distributions are made. They may either be made per capita, or per stirpes. And going back to our Latin phraseology, per capita means per head. We're looking at each individual person and counting up the number of people to receive the distribution. Per stirpes is through another person. So in our example, if we were distributing two grandchildren because a child has died, we will use a per stirpes allocation to count the number of individuals there. Do be careful because there will always be a problem on the exam which will focus on the difference between per capita and per stirpes. In the trust environment, we need to be aware of the parties involved in a trust. There is the grantor or settlor who creates the trust. There is the trust corpus or race, the item that it resides in the trust that is being administered by a trustee and the trust assets are managed for the benefit of either a current income beneficiary or the remainder man. The current income beneficiary, as the name implies, gets current income and is charged with current expenses. The remainder man will receive the corpus or the property in the trust when the trust terminates. During the life of the trust, that corpus receives any extraordinary income and is charged with any extraordinary expenses. You should review how the distributions are made between current and remainder parties in a trust environment. Also remember the trust may be either inter vivos, made while the settlor is living, or testamentary, which means they come up and arise on the death of the individual. They are created through the will. A trust may be revocable or irrevocable, and virtually all trust may be revoked, except, of course, a testamentary trust cannot be revoked since the settlor has died. That's how the trust was created. Let's slip over into agency law now for a moment. We have a principal. This is the one who, for whom the agent acts, is the responsible party. And that principal appoints an agent to act on his or her behalf. 
the agent owes a duty of care, a duty of loyalty to the principal. The principal owes compensation to the agent. However, the principal does not owe a duty of loyalty. An agency relationship can arise orally or in writing with two exceptions. An agency relationship must be in writing if it extends over more than one year or if it involves real estate. Generally, an agency relationship can be terminated at any time by either party. The exception to this is an agency coupled with an interest. That may not be terminated because in this case, the principal has transferred title to some property of some property to the agent and the agent is acting in his behalf but still has title to the property. So that agency relationship may not be terminated. There are three types of powers that an agent may have and it's important to review each of these in preparation for the exam. There is express authority where the agent is told by its principal exactly these are the steps, the actions that I wish you to undertake. There is implied authority which flows from the principal to the agent and are the necessary actions to carry out the authority previously delegated to that agent by the principal. Finally, there is apparent authority where by actions, words, or deeds, the principal has implied, uh, has given apparent authority to that agent to act on his behalf. And in this case, a de facto arrangement, an, an agency by estoppel may be created. In order to terminate the agency relationship, as I said, it can be done at any time, but the principal needs to give notice. The principal should give notice of the termination of that agency agreement to each and every customer, each and every person who dealt with the agent. This should be actual notice, and the principal should also give constructive notice to those parties with whom the agent may have come in contact, although not customers, or who may conceivably become aware of the old agency relationship which has been terminated. They need to have constructive interest, a constructive notice, excuse me. But all said and done, if you review these terms, keep in mind allocations and definitions, you will do very well in your fiduciary relationships. These portion, this portion of the exam should be fairly simple for you. Read the care, questions quite carefully, and as you do so, you will probably pick out one or two key words. Look for independent contractor or agent. Look for employer, principal. Look for testamentary or inter vivos. Those key words should help you in analyzing the four potential answers. And in reading the answers, two will probably be pretty obvious that they are incorrect. Two may be a little bit more difficult, but the focus should be on the key words in the questions and then see how those key words are played back out in your two remaining answers. That done, you'll score well in this part of the exam, and we look forward to your success.